Honorable Speaker, I embrace the opportunity this morning to pray with the House at its sitting. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father in heaven, you who have ordained time and space, and in your providence and love for humanity, you have ordered this day and called us to be a part of it. We honor your name, not just in words, but we honor you as we ascribe glory and praise and dominion and recognize that you are Lord of all. You are the one who have created all things. And you are the one who will bring into completion all things. May we then in our exercise of our own lives and in the duties to which you have called this house and all the honorable members, we pray that your name will be honored in honesty, in the conversation that will take place that seeks to improve the welfare of the people of the Virgin Islands, that no guile will be part of that conversation, that no half choose will be part of that conversation. We pray, Lord, that all who will deliberate on the issues on the other paper for the day will do so with one goal in mind, for the improvement of the lives of the people to whom they are all accountable. And that, Lord, ultimately, honor and glory will be brought to your name through the lives of the people who will say thank you for what you have done. We pray for all 13 members this morning, but particularly for the leader of government business, the Premier, and the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. We pray for the Attorney General who will give advice and know that today's deliberation and conversation will be about the people, their lives, and their future. You who make things possible, we present to you all that we shall do in this place. And may not only your name be praised, but may your people find life and be lifted up from where they are through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. This honorable house is now convened to sitting. I call upon the clerk. Honorable members, is it your wish that the minutes of the meeting held on Tuesday, 18th January, 2022, be so confirmed as circulated? With no dissenting voice, the minutes of the meeting held on Tuesday, 18th January, 2022, as circulated, is hereby confirmed. I call upon the clerk. Item number three, announcements by the speaker. Thank you. I'm happy to greet you once again and welcome all tune in to the second sitting of the fourth session of the Fourth House of Assembly. March 12th, 2022 will mark three years of the Fourth House of Assembly, 
two days from today. I take this opportunity as we reach the three-year mark to offer my thanks to all honorable members from both sides of the aisles for your continued support. The Deputy Speaker, Honorable Neville A. Smith, for being alongside me in this journey, as well as the Leader of Government's Business in the House, Honorable Andrew A. Foy. I also extend gratitude to the clerk and staff of the House of Assembly and my secretary, Mrs. Smith Bramble, for keeping me focused. I continue to be thankful for the hard work and commitment of the staff of the House of Assembly. Last but not least, over the three years, I thank my family and the public who have offered your prayers, your wise counsel, and most often, your frank opinions. We will continue our work in the final year to build and strengthen the legislative institution. Finally, I want to remind the public that the gallery here at the Save the Seat Center is open to all, and the public is welcome to come in in person to listen to the citizens of the House of Assembly. We know that you will be dressed appropriately in keeping with the House of Assembly's dress code, along with following our COVID-19 protocols. With that, I call upon the CLAC. Sorry, I recognize the Honorable Premier and Leader of Government's Business. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to request an amendment to the order of paper, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to make the following amendment that uh, number five on the order of the, pay, order of the day becomes number four. That number six Mr. Speaker becomes now number five. And Mr. Speaker, that number eight now becomes number seven. Six, sorry. Thank you. Number eight now becomes number six. Number seven remains as 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 is. Number four becomes number eight. And number nine and 10 remains. Mr. Speaker, let me go back through it one more time in the hearing of this honorable house. I propose amendment to the standing order, Mr. Speaker, please I'll allow everyone to follow. Number five now becomes number four. Amendment to the order paper. In the order, of the order paper for the order of the day. So number five becomes number four. Number six becomes number five. Number eight becomes number six. Number seven remains the same. And number eight, number four, sorry, becomes number eight. And numbers nine and 10 remains the same. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Is there a second for the motion for amendment? Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. Honorable members, the question before this House is to amend the order of the day, making five becomes four, six become five, Eight becomes six, seven remains, four becomes eight, and nine and ten remains. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The order of the day is hereby amended. I now call upon the clerk. Item number four, presentation of paper. I call upon the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance to lay his documents on the table. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to lay on the table of this Honorable House Statutory Instrument 2022, number 12, a proclamation by the Governor under Section 83, Subsection 1 of the Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007, UKSI 2007, number 1678, 
appointing the time and place at which the second sitting of the fourth session of the fourth house of assembly of the Virgin Islands shall be held. Number two, British Virgin Islands Electricity Cooperation Annual Report 2018. Number three, British Virgin Islands Electricity Cooperation Financial Statements 2018. Thank you. I call upon the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture to lay his documents on the table. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to lay the following doc documents on the table. The Department of Youth Affairs and Sports Annual Report 2019, Public Library Service of the Virgin Islands Annual Report 2019, Department of Culture Annual Report 2019, Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture Annual Report 2019, and the Department of Youth Affairs and Sports Annual Report 2020. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you. I call upon the clerk. Item number five, notices of motions given orally. I call upon the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance to give notice. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give notice that at a later stage in the proceedings, I would seek leave to move the motions standing in my name under item new six, one, Roman numerals one through five, Roman numerals seven through seven, eight, and 11 on the order of the day. Thank you. I invite the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture to give notice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to give notice that at a later stage in the proceedings, I will seek leave to move the motion listening in my name under item 81, uh, Roman numeral 9, under order of the day. Thank you. Thank you. I call upon the Honorable Minister for Transportation, Works, and Utilities to give notice. So, Speaker, I rise to give notice that at a later, later stage in the proceedings, I would seek leave to move the motion standing in my name under item 61. 10 on the order of the day. Thank you. I call upon the Honorable Minister for Health and Social Development to give notice. Speaker, I am pleased to rise to give notice that a later stage in the proceedings, I would seek leave to move the motion standing in my name under items, I think it's 8, 1, Sorry, five one, sorry, eight one, Roman number five, and Roman number nine on the order of the day. Thank you. I call upon the honorable member for the third district to give notice. Mr. So speaker, I give notice that at a later stage in the proceedings. I would seek leave to ask the question standing in my name on the item 7, 1, 2, 3, on the order of the day. Thank you. I now call upon the clerk. Item number 6, public business, 1, government business. I call upon the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance to move a motion. Okay. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, where section 67 three, subsection 3EE three e of the Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007, UK SI 2007, number 1678, provides a subject to a subsection, provides that subject to subsection 7, uh, an elected member of the House of Assembly shall vacate his or her seat if the member becomes a party to a contract with the government of the Virgin Islands 
for on an account of the public service, or if any firm in which the member is or becomes a partner or a company of which the member is or becomes a director or manager becomes a party to, con to a contract with the government of the Virgin Islands, where section 67, subsection 7 provides that if the circumstances it appears just to do so, the House of Assembly may exempt an elected member from vacating his or her seat under subsection 3, subsection E, subsection 3 E, if the member before becoming a party to a contract or before or soon as practicable, after becoming interested in a contract with the government of the Virgin Islands by virtue of being a partner in a firm or director or manager in a company which has a contract with the government discloses to the House of Assembly the nature of the contract and his or her interest in the firm or company involved in the contract. Whereas the Honorable Neville Smith is an elected member of the House of Assembly, whereas the Honorable Neville Smith is a director of Caribbean Security Limited, whose registered office address is located at Caramore Chambers Road, Town, Tortola, British Virgin Islands, and which company provides security services and related systems installation, whereas the company is desirous of entering into a contract with the government of the Virgin Islands for upgrades to the Attorney General's Chambers security system, including the access control system and installation of a PA system for the total of $33,149.12. The formal contract is in the process of being drafted. Whereas by virtue of being a director of Caribbean Security Limited, the Honorable Member has an interest in the contract with the company, as aforesaid, and this resolution discloses to the House of Assembly the interest of the Honorable Member in the said contract by virtue of being a director of the company. Whereas the resolution is a request by the Honorable Member of the House of Assembly to exempt the Honorable Member from vacating the, the House of Assembly, and whereas the Honorable Andre Foy, the Premier Minister of Finance, has by a motion moved the House of Assembly but to exempt the Honorable Neville Smith from vacating his seat as an elected member of the House of Assembly. Now therefore be it resolved that the House of Assembly of the Virgin Islands exempts the Honorable Smith from vacating his seat as an elected member of the House of Assembly. Mr. Speaker, before I take my seat, I'll just say that this is already existing agreement, the contract between the company of which the member is a part of, an existing contract for quite a while, and there's some upgrades needs to be done to the system. And given that the upgrades need to be done to the system, of course, the person, the company in which the system will, um, would have been uh, put in by would be the one that you most likely would go to for different reasons to do the upgrade to the system, which they're the ones that they're the distributor for. So, Mr. Speaker, it's not a matter of to do brand new works in terms of putting on a new system, but it is one in which we want to make sure, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the upgrades are done by the person who already has the system in, and there's some upgrades that are needed by the requisite government entity. And Mr. Speaker, the, this, the member recognizes the dynamics around this and uh, do not want to proceed unless um, he makes sure he clears it with the House. But it has to be done, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we know that in every parliament, the House um, regulates itself within good governance and transparency and accountability. I have noticed of late there are persons who want to regulate the House of Assembly, but that's the job of the House of Assembly. And to do it in a manner that does not violate transparency, that does not violate or compromise transparency, good governance, or the integrity of, of the territorial world, and especially the House while doing the people's business. So, Mr. Speaker, I think clarity needed to be placed to this before we move any further, and I so move. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion and I reserve my right to speak in the debate. Thank you. The floor is now open for debate. I recognize the representative for the third district and senior member of the House, the Honorable Julian Fraser. I just rise to indicate that the record should show that the member has accused himself on this proceeding and I'm wondering Mr. Speaker whether or not the Attorney General shouldn't do the same given that this is a contract between the Attorney General's Chambers and uh, to do the work in the Attorney General's Chambers and it's being carried out by a member Is that a question you're posing, Honorable Fraser, on the, in regards to the Attorney General? 
um, I'll be guided by the wishes of the Attorney General if she deems it wise to vacate, then I will be so guided. I, I don't have a position on that matter. Okay. I've been advised that the Attorney General wishes to um, leave the room, seeing that it's a contract involving Hogwood office. So we have accepted that. The floor remains open for debate before I ask the sponsor of the motion to wrap up. And before the Premier wraps up, just for the record, let the record reflect that both the, the Deputy Speaker, Honorable Smith, and the Attorney General, Honorable Smith, have vacated the room. I call upon the Honorable Premier to wrap up the motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, at the end of what you just said, was something that I think needs to make sure that I just clear up. And not that you said it with any mindset, but of, of being negative, but you said both Honorable Smith and Attorney General Smith went outside. So I want to make sure that persons know that it is not a cook up thing among the Smiths. This system has been in long before either Smith came to this um, Honorable House. It is now an upgrade. So because I know this little country, sometimes people piece things together that really and truly cannot be pieced together or should not be pieced together. So I needed to clear out that this is a system that's been in for quite some time now and, and it's now due an upgrade. So before the members company could touch the upgrade, whether it's a penny, a dollar or anything, being that the member is part of the company, he did the right thing, which is to come to the House of Assembly and seek the House, um, not only permission, but also notification that this is the case. And I think that's more than admirable to do, to make sure that we cross all T's and dot all I's, because we know that those among us who feel that this country can do nothing within the boundaries of good governance. And we know that we have done so for so many years, maybe not to the liking of some, yes, maybe to the point of where we still need to continue to improve, but show me a country that doesn't. But we make sure that as much as we can, that we continue to approve along these, improve along these lines. So, Mr. Speaker, with that, I so thank you, and I so move the motion. Thank you. Honorable members, the motion before this Honorable House is to exempt the Honorable Neville A. Smith from rotating his seat as he seeks to do business with government. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The motion is passed. I call again on the Honorable Premier and Leader of Government's business for a second motion. Yes. The members can come back now. I'm sorry? The members can come back now. Okay. But I'll go ahead. We will ask the Sergeant at Arm to summon the Attorney General and the Deputy Speaker back to the well of the House. Yeah. We do have enough to continue, so I'll I'm sorry? I'll continue? Yes, certainly, Premier, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, thank you so much, sir. Whereas Section 67, Subsection 3E, of the Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007, UKSI 2007, number 1678, provides that subject to subsection seven, an elected member of the House of Assembly shall vacate his or her seat if the member becomes a party to a contract with the government of the Virgin Islands for or on account of the public service, or if any firm in which the member is or becomes a partner or a company of which the member is or becomes a director or manager becomes a party to a, a contract with the government of the Virgin Islands. Whereas section 67, subsection 7, provides that if in the circumstances it appears just to do so, the House of Assembly may exempt an elected member from vacating his or her seat under subsection 3E if the member before or as soon as practicable, after becoming interested in a contract with the government of the Virgin Islands by virtue of being a director or manager in a company which has a contract with the government, 
discloses to the House of Assembly the nature of the contract and his or her interest in the company involved in the contract. Whereas the Honorable Mark Vanapool, MHA, is an elected member of the House of Assembly. Whereas the Honorable Mark Vanderpool is a director in the company known as Shoreside East Development Limited, whose, registri regist whose, whose registered office is situated in Belmont Chambers, PO Box 3443, Road Town to Artola. Whereas on 3rd November 2021, the company purchased a building located at Block 2838C, Parcel 100, Lower Estate, Road Town Registration Section from Mad Dog Limited and a part of the said building, namely the third floor, was being leased by the government of the Virgin Islands for a period of two years, commencing 11 May 2020, from Mad Dog Limited, whereas the remainder of the said lease is intended to be transferred to the company, whereas the company is in the process of negotiating with the government of the Virgin Islands to lease additional space in the said building, whereas this resolution discloses to the House of Assembly the transfer of the said property, the existing lease, and the interest of the honorable member in the transfer by virtue of being director of the company. Whereas this resolution is requested by the honorable, house, honorable member to the House of Assembly to exempt the honorable member from vacating the House of Assembly. And whereas the honorable Andre Foyd, Mayor, Minister of Finance, has by motion moved by the House of, of Assembly to exempt the honorable Mark Vanderpool, MHA, from vacating his seat as an elected member of the House of Assembly. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the House of Assembly of the Virgin Islands exempts the Honorable Mark Vanderpool, MHA, from vacating his seat as an elected member of the House of Assembly. I would just like to say, Mr. Speaker, that this, again, is one of those unique uh, situations where the me elected member actually uh, purchased a building quite a, um, a while ago and that building already uh, had tenants in it, which was the government of the Virgin Islands. And with the government of the Virgin Islands already in the building, the member now wants to make sure that, that he seeks government's permission to, to and, and the House's permission, sorry, and also to inform the House that this is the case. And plus government is looking to extend the lease and also to look about other areas to lease within the building in which the member is part owner, not owner, but part owner in a company um, of and having that that's already exists in lease and, and uh, want to extend the lease and also look at other areas, Mr. Speaker, the member also, this member also has done the, the correct thing according to the law to stay within the, the, the uh, alignment of, of good governance and make sure that he comes not only to inform the House of Assembly about his intent to do go, uh, business with the government of the Virgin Islands, but also to make sure that he gets the requisite approval so that we can make sure that we stay in full alignment with the laws of this territory. So here we have seen that both Honorable Vanapool and Honorable Smith have done the admirable thing to make sure that they stay within the gamut of the law and there are situations that warrant um, the House to take a look and also the House to decide if the approval will be granted if the House sees that it is within the guidelines and the laws and regulations as set out by the laws of this Honorable House and the territory. So with that, Mr. Speaker, that backdrop, I think, would be sufficient enough to, to help to further uh, explain um, the, the whole gamut of what this motion is about. So I do so move. Is there a second for the motion? Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion, and I reserve my right to speak in the debate. Thank you. Honorable members, the floor is now open for debate on the motion on the ex exception exemption of the Honorable Mark H. Fantipole. With no one wishing to debate, I want also the record to reflect that the member in question, Honorable Fantipole, is not in the well of the House at the time this motion is being debated. I call upon the Honorable Premier and Leader of Government's Business to wrap up the debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank the members for, for their input. And Mr. Speaker, I too um, welcome whenever we do things according to the law. That's the only way to move. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable members, the 
motion before this house is to exempt the Honorable Mark H. Vanderpool from vacating his seat as he seeks to do business with government. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The motion is hereby passed. I call again on the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance to move a third motion. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there's a slight amendment to this motion, and I'll make it when I'm reading. Uh, Mr. Speaker, whereas by resolution 2 of 2020 made pursuant to standing order 78 and 79, it was resolved by the House of Assembly of the Virgin Islands that the following shall be members of a special select committee appointed to manage the Virgin Islands Youth Parliament. Honorable Julian Willock, Chairman, Honorable Neville A. Smith, Honorable Kai M. Reimer, Honorable Sherry B. De Castro, Honorable Julian Fraser, Honorable Melvin M. Turnbull, Honorable Marlon A. Penn, and Honorable Shireen D. Flax Charles. Mr. Speaker, the next, um, whereas before that I'll start, I'd like to delete that, Mr. Speaker. And we have two new areas that we will now place, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have now we'll start with, uh, so that section of whereas is expedient in terms of how it is written, that one paragraph will be deleted. And you replace it with, whereas it's expedient to remove the Honorable Julian Willock as a member and chairman of the said select committee appointed to manage the Virgin Islands Street Parliament. And whereas it's expedient to appoint the Honorable Sherry B. D. Castro as the chairman of the said select committee appointed to manage the Virgin Islands Street Parliament. Mr. Speaker, and whereas it's expedient to replace Honorable Shereen D. Flex Charles with the Honorable Albert Maduro Keynes as a member of the said special select committee appointed to manage the Virgin Islands Youth Parliament. Now therefore be it resolved by the House of Assembly of the Virgin Islands that the Honorable Shari B. De Castro be appointed as chairman and the Honorable Albert Maduro Keynes be appointed as a member of the said special committee appointed to manage the Youth Parliament. Mr. Speaker, I so move now I have my comments at the end. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion and reserve my right to speak. Thank you. The floor is now open for debate. I recognize the representative for the third district and senior member of the House, the Honorable Julian Fraser. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the amendment, I think I picked up something that wasn't there before, and that is that the former chairman will no longer be a member of the committee. Am I correct? Mr. Chairman, I'm going to be brief. I want to acknowledge two things. One is the success of the parliament in the short time that they've been with us in this Fourth House of Assembly. They've had two events which I, I think is inarguably their greatest achievement ever since becoming uh, Parliament of Virgin Islands, the Parliament of Virgin Islands. And the other thing that I would like to mention, Mr. Speaker, is that I want to recognize your leadership as chairman for the committee. I know it wasn't an easy task. It was challenging. And if you ask me, I would think that it's a kind of job that only a person like you could do. Because it's going to bring scars to whomever is in that position, scars, and they got to be able to prepare, they gotta prepare themselves to, to endure those scars. Ms. Uh, 
Castro, colonial minister, who is now going to be undertaking that role. It is so fitting that given her age, that she should rise to that occasion and be an example for those young people who are in the parliament. There are those who believe that this, this uh, youth parliament should not be associated with politics and that its formation should not give any expectation to the public or those members of being politicians. I think that we have a responsibility at the House of Assembly to mold the future. And in doing so, you have to mold the younger generation. You have to mold them in order to prepare them for this, this task. A task that many people take for granted, many people have no respect for. And I think that's so the total ignorance. Not that they're mean spirited, I think it's all ignorance. Once anyone, and, and, and the, younger, the younger members in this house right now, the new, new members, I am sure for the three years that they've, they've been here, they have developed an appreciation for the work that this House of Assembly does that they never had. And if you can give those individuals who are in the youth parliament a, an inkling what this is all about. They'll have so many more legs up on everyone else. And it will be in the best public's interest if any of them so desire to venture into this field, to give them a second look. I'm sorry to see that Miss uh, Honorable Junior Minister Sherin Bax-Charles is no longer going to be a member of this I'm sure that she will avail herself to giving advice to the committee and to the, the members of the youth parliament in order that she herself will grow in the role that she, has, she now has as a, as a parliamentarian. So, Mr. Speaker, we only have a few months left for this parliament's life, and I'm sure that the incoming chairperson who would have known in advance that she would become the chairperson would have probably no less had some some uh, uh, program or initiative for the next few months of this parliament. I wish her luck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I recognize the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities and member for the 5th District, the Honorable Kai M. Reimer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will be brief. I just need to make mention of the, the service of the outgoing chair and Honorable Flax Charles for their service on this youth parliament. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we were able to have a couple achievement with this committee. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to the more involvement. I look forward to another debate. I thought it was a quite interesting debate. And I know, Mr. Speaker, it's a, a bit unfortunate that um, those resignations were, were accepted uh, for this committee. But, you know, you'll still be a part of it somewhere behind the scenes and I'm sure that the, the chairman wouldn't have a problem, the new chair lady wouldn't have a problem with that because I know we all want to see this committee thrive and get to their full potential. So Mr. Speaker, I just need to acknowledge uh, your chairmanship, the work you, you've done, your commitment, as well as, as Honorable Flax Charles. Uh, and we definitely look forward to this committee move into high heights. So Mr. Speaker, again, I just say uh, thank you. I congratulate Honorable Charabi DiCastro. I know she's quite energetic. 
innovative and you know we hope to see uh, great things continued with this committee and coming forward thank you mr speaker thank you i recognize the junior minister for trade and economic development the honorable Shireen D. Flax Charles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to extend congratulations to the Honorable Shari De Castro um, on becoming the chair of this Youth Parliament Committee. It is good to see a woman at the helm. And while I may not be a part of the committee anymore at this particular point in time, I am still here to support the youth parliament a million percent, not even a hundred percent. I am here to support them in any way that I can. I, I want my focus now to be more on our youth entrepreneurship strategy to ensure that our young people have all of the benefits of being in our business community. And, and so my focus needs to be there um, right at this particular point in time as we, as we move forward towards the Trade Commission and passing of the Business Licensing Act in this session. So my focus has to be more from a trade perspective and an entrepreneurship perspective focusing on youth. Again, I want to thank everyone for the time that I've had in that position, and it was very enlightening, and I love the way that the young people conducted themselves in the sessions that we have had with them. Once again, I want to congratulate my colleague, the Honorable Shari De Castro, for accepting the challenge, and we will be here to help you every step of the way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the territorial member. I recognize the Junior Minister for Tourism and Territorial Member, the Honorable Sherry B. De Castro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just would like to say that I'm humbled for the opportunity to serve as the new chair of the subcommittee uh, for the Virgin Islands Youth Parliament. I want to thank you for your service as well as Honorable Flex Charles to the committee um, for the time that it has been appointed. We truly have done some marvelous things and have set up a strong foundation for us to continue on forward in charting the course for the Virgin Islands Youth Parliament. We look forward to some announcement that will be forthcoming in relation to the activities that uh, will be planned. And I look forward to continuing the legacy of a strong body that speaks to our young people engaging in the parliamentary process, understanding it, and even potentially becoming a part of it if they so desire. But I believe that the Youth Parliament is a driving force in our community that not only enlightens our young people in terms of the parliamentary process and procedures, but also gives them a vehicle to participate in our parliamentary process. And so I look forward to seeing that engagement as we continue forward with this mandate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the territorial member for her contributions. Is there any other member wishing to speak before I call on the move of the, I recognize the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture, and member for the 7th District, Dr. The Honorable Natalio D. Wheatley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. Firstly, I want to thank you for your service as our board chairman. I also want to thank Honorable Shereen Black's Charles, and just to say, of course, um, the Youth Parliament is a very important <coughs> institution. Um, and I, I've asked in the past for us as legislators to raise our game, uh, raise the level of the institution. And even myself, I'm critical of myself in some instances where I believe I haven't maintained the standards necessary for the House of Assembly. And I think it's something that we always should strive to do. The House of Assembly is a is almost sacred institution. And um, the Premier spoke about how 
um, the, the House of Assembly is, is being dealt with sometimes. And I think we all have a duty to protect it as an institution and to promote it as an institution. And I also want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, because I know you uphold the sanctity of the House of Assembly. It's something that you fight hard for. And I appreciate that. And the youth parliament is a vehicle to teach our young people about parliamentary practice and to teach persons how um, the governance of the affairs of the people are conducted. And it's something that uh, we must do through the youth parliament and through other ways of ensuring that people understand democracy. But democracy that we fought hard for is not something that we should take for granted. And in fact, you've had persons who've had their democracy taken away from them even in recent memory. So yes, it is an opportunity to advance yourself as a young person and to develop yourself and to put something on your resume. But it's also an opportunity for us as a society to continue to send the message that our parliamentary democracy is something to be protected uh, and something to be cherished. I want to congratulate Honorable Shari De Castro on her chairmanship. Um, as much as I congratulate you, outgoing chair, and think that you did a, a, a good job in delivering that debate and the other uh, educational activities that the youth parliament uh, were availed of. I really like Honorable Shari De Castro as a chairperson, and she is someone who is talented, intelligent, articulate. Um, she has so many wonderful uh, qualities, and I, I always wince when any person have anything negative to say about any young person who is so stellar and awesome, because across the world, Persons would be happy to have somebody like Honorable Shari De Castro in their society. And we have her hair, and we must cherish her. I think sometimes, as Northern Islanders, we don't celebrate each other enough. We have a young person here who was elected at the age of 28 years old, the youngest uh, female parliamentarian in our history, and can't be. Um, much far off as the youngest parliamentarian in the Virgin Islands history, period. And well deserved because of what she brings to bear. And she has a very bright future in politics. And I'm looking for, and I would say the future is bright, uh, Mr. Chair, with persons like Honorable Shari De Castro at the helm. The future is very bright. And I believe that she deserves to have more responsibility for the attributes uh, which she possesses. And so I know within my ministry, I'm seeking to um, make use of her wonderful qualities as much as possible. Uh, we have a STEAM conference coming up and I ask her to take the lead on it. And there's some other things I would like for her to do to assist us in the Ministry of Education. But I want to, again, congratulate her, and I want to uh, push her forward towards greater success. I know she'll do a wonderful job of corralling these young people and pushing them to their greater, greater potential. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the 7th District for his contributions. I recognize the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration, and member for the 9th District, the Honorable Vincent O. Whitley. Show. Just a few days ago, we celebrated International Women's Day, and I did point out that women, for the most part, are take, taking leading roles in all endeavors in business and science. And we have quite a few here in the House of Assembly, and it is very pleasing to see that we've chosen a young person to lead this youth parliament. You, too, Mr. Speaker, I must commend you for bringing it back. Dormant 
for quite a few years and came back and came back with quite a bit of steam. Mr. Speaker, each of us were given the opportunity to choose persons to serve on this youth council. And I am so pleased with the picks that I made that there are two young ladies from the 9th district. Ever since they joined the youth parliament, I make it my business to have lunch with them at least once a quarter and to see what the youth, council, what the youth parliament has done in terms of their maturity and in terms of their focus in life is very pleasing. I know under Honorable Castro's leadership, you can only expect more of this, more excellent leadership, more innovative leadership. I have every confidence that she will take it to the next level. You must come in all those persons who put themselves forward or accept the invitation to be part of the youth parliament. It is a good introduction into the life of politics and how things happen in the political arena. To speak of being a former teacher, I always take every opportunity I get to educate particularly young persons about the House of Assembly. And there's a picture I have of the full House of Assembly. And I use that picture and I go through every single thing about the House of Assembly and the role and function, functions of the House of Assembly. So it's very good to see that this particular body will be led by a young person. And hopefully she would also take that same approach to bring in the functions of the House and the parliament, the parliament to our schools. Mr. Speaker, if you're going to make anything sustainable in terms of a practice in this culture, we must bring it down to the youth. That's for any chance I get to explain anything about the House or politics or anything. I always give the children, the schools, first preference. So I want to cash from what admonish you as part of your remit leading this body, that the schools be a part of your visitation and your education process. Again, I wish you well, and I know you will do well in this new chapter in this new parliament. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the ninth district for his contribution. I recognize the deputy speaker and territorial member, the Honorable Neville A. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too would like to thank you for serving the time that you serve in the leadership. And I also like to congratulate the honorable member. Um, some of the words I like to leave with her is that um, you are young, and they are young. So when you go in there, let's try to have y'all listen to each other, listen to their ideas, because you have a group of people who are very, very much intelligent, who's like a sponge. So we have to be careful what we teach to those young people, because a lot of them are very intelligent, like I said, and we have to learn to listen to what they are saying, not try to tell them what to do. We have to make sure that we cross that bridge and we, we connect instead of disconnect, so that they can learn the house the same rules and all the regulations, and very much work very much closely with the clerk and the House of Assembly, the Attorney General as well, so they can learn a lot of the, the laws, the rules of how this house is being run. Because a lot of times you listen to people on the street and they don't understand what goes on in the House of Assembly. They only could assume. So I think it would be good to see that you could get the education out there that people understand what this house is going to stand for. Once again, congratulations. Thank you. I thank the Deputy Speaker for his presentation. I recognize the Honorable Minister for Health and Social Development and Territorial Member, the Honorable Corbin Malone. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I will be, as traditional, very, very short. I'd uh, like to congratulate Honorable Sherry Castro. Um, you know, I shared my views many times on this, and despite that, there's been one in which the youngsters have expressed their thanks for the guidance that they have been given. So as we move into a new chapter, Mr. Speaker, we trust that we can get uh, even more activities, and uh, it could be in a manner in which you know we can 
come here and um, well, at my age, I guess we can, you know, there's a bright future that lies immediately ahead. And I think that they will be guided in a particular direction of which we'll all be pleased, like you have done on numerous occasions. So, Mr. Speaker, let's move with haste towards getting this youth parliament, as you have tried to do, get it back up and rolling. And now that it is on the track again, let's move it forward with, with haste. Thank you. I thank the territorial member for his contribution. With no other member wishing to speak, I invite the move of the motion, the Honorable Premier, to wrap up. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I too rise to thank you for your service as the chair um, of the committee. Your service is one in which we can definitely say thanks to that we remember it's a lot of hard work as a worker, labor of love. And uh, we know that um, the Junior Minister of Trade rightfully is going to be focusing on the the one junior minister section of the Premier's office, which is be the trade and investment and how to help our young people as we're pushing the Ministry of Finance and others to get some funding to back up in that area. So a so push will be there and the other junior minister now who will be chairing pushing on the tourism end a little more because we we know these we're trying to make these junior ministers seats work because when they were put in they really didn't come with a playbook and governments after governments have grappled with them but i think that we're going to get this once well oiled um in in a few days and weeks so i want to thank her for her work on it and I want to welcome the new chair, a uh, female, young, intelligent, hardworking, and in the week when we celebrate International Women's Day, to have a woman place over the youth parliament to manage it, direct it, and help nurture our youth being a youth herself is indeed noble and in much ways historic given the age of the honorable member it shows this government's confidence as we have shown in making sure that women and young people take their rightful place in society i'm always quoted as saying though that i am one of those who always believed that women had their rightful place in society because of how I grew up. It's sad to say there are some men who don't feel that women should ever lead or women should ever be to the top or, or, or should limit women. That's a sad mentality for anyone to ever be in. I look at people as, hu as human beings and you judge them based on the merit of the intent and the content of their character and their desire to, to serve and to stay within the principles of God that is guiding us and do what they were placed on earth to do and fulfill their purpose. And I believe whether it's a woman, child, youth, or man, once you do that, there's no force on earth that can stop you from fulfilling that purpose. Whether it is to lead, whether it is to assist, whether it's to become a mayor, whether you be female or otherwise, that is my philosophy in life that I put towards anyone. But I do recognize some of the challenges that women face and our youth. But let's not forget some of the challenges too that our young men are facing. And we have a society that we have to continue to work on all facets treat everyone equal, treat everyone fairly. 
So today is a great day to have the Honorable Sharidi Castro, a female, one of the youngest elected members, now be the chair of the youth parliament. You know, there's certain language that only a youth can understand from a youth. You know, one day I, I said a phrase that we used to say when I was younger, and my daughter reminded me, Daddy, that's out of style now. They don't use that phrase anymore. As a matter of fact, she asked me what it meant. I had to explain. But then when I looked one day without even saying a word, I came to a meeting and I heard Honorable Sherry De Castro use the phrase and I smiled and she don't know what until now. And it was the same way that my daughter was saying, I said, bye, you know, certain ages understand certain ages better. And with having a youth that's matured and elected, leading the youth parliament, I know that the voices of our youth will be heard even more to take us to an even more higher level with the youth parliament, to take us in angles that we probably never even envisaged, to be able to move the limitations from over the youth parliament where we might have think that there existed limitations to make sure that rather than having a destination, that it could be a continuous journey of excellence. And I know that once we have that kind of youth behind of it, and one thing I know about Iron River, Sherry De Castro, is that she is short and, and seems small, but she's taller and she doesn't stop. She continues to go until she fulfills her goal. And I know that she'll champion the cause of the young people to another level, and it's no offense to all, all the outgoing chair, but it's, it's only so much persons can do a voyage with the young people to reach them. It always takes persons in anything that knows about it more or around the age range to reach it. It's like asking an engineer to hold a conversation in a legal conference of lawyers. It isn't that the engineer is not intelligent, but he is not within his nomenclature culture to have conversations of that magnitude. The lawyers will lose him in legal language. And if he is wise, he will lose them in talk and all kind of other measurements. But because he's in the minority, he definitely will not blend in. As a matter of fact, it won't be long before they read him out. And if you have somebody who is uh, probably uh, not a profession, they go to speak to educators and they don't have anything to do with education, they may say certain things that, that is out of line with educators. But if they're in tune with what the educators are going through, then they would avoid that and be able to speak about them about the situation with them and help them. There's always things you can say, Jermaine, to any situation, you know, uh, that you'll hear wherever you go. You know, sometimes people go to church and if you don't have a song man of God preaching, they have one of those wishy-washy ones that tell you that I know you're going through a lot. That's everybody. Nice specific. I, I know that you might have a pain. That's everybody who's living who own a bill. That's not specific. But when you get persons that know, that know, that they know, that they know the industry, they'll be able to go in depth. And they'll be able to speak to things that you can relate to. And right now we need to make sure that our young people's voices are heard much more. And while I'm at my feet, I want to commend the, minister, the deputy speaker. When we're speaking about young people who has come up with his think tank among young people, and he's setting it up and going in every facet of the territory with his think tank for all young people. And I also know that he was speaking to me just this morning, all elated about his talent show that he wants to make sure that BVI has talent with the youngsters. I don't remember the age, I think it's 35 and under. And he's doing a talent show in every single island in terms of Anigata, Bojangada, Jocelyn Dykes, and of course, uh, Tartola that he wants to do and then have an overall talent show coming culminating and the, the the best of the best of the talents in the 
in the Virgin Islands. And I told him, definitely, I know he will have all of our support here in government with that. And every day that he calls me, although it will be on other topics, he will fill in on that with his excitement on it, so that not only that we listen to the young people, but implement more of what they're doing. I commend Honorable Neville Smith for this initiative, and he has my full support with it when these talent shows are and the other areas that he is doing. I want to commend him because it's going to blend in to help uh, to get the, the, our young people to, to make sure that they understand that we cherish them, that we realize that their voice is not just to fill the spaces of air, that we recognize that their, their ideas are needed and that we recognize that they're not the men and women of tomorrow, they're the men and women of today. Because the past comes so quickly. Already, when we started this session, it is in the past. And the past comes within the wink of an eye. So the present determines what will be the future. And when you reach the future, then you'll recognize very quickly it becomes the past. So we have to continue to move forward. I want to welcome Honorable Alba Maduro Keynes to the committee. Another woman, woman, sorry, that is coming in. And I want to thank her for filling the role for the past week of the Minister of Education and Culture youth affairs and sports and attending the cabinet as a woman, woman and I was pleasantly pleased that while we were in cabinet and we were there discussing and something didn't happen right and she demanded to be told and, and um, we seemed like we were dancing around and she reminded the person who was ignoring her that do not do that to me because I'm a woman in cabinet and I said, huh, and we were able to, they were able to catch themselves and understand themselves very good, that person. So I want to, to tell her thank you for, for how she conducted herself as Minister of Education for the past week while the deputy was out on official travel. And I want to say that, that we have to continue to develop our young people and continue to let each of them know that you are being born on purpose, for purpose, and to fulfill purpose. And I'm looking for great things from this youth parliament and not because the other elected members are not members of the committee. It does not void, put a void from us lending our voice, our expertise, and also our constructive criticism, and yet our praises for when things go correctly. Because we live in a community where persons are always quick to point out what's wrong, rather than letting you to know that you have some improvements, but here is where you're also going correct. Once we bring balance and our young people get to understand that that is our mantra, as those who are guiding them and ushering them into the new realm of taking this Virgin Islands to a new level, then they will have more respect for us, for themselves, and understand that in life, once you have balance, you'll be able to accomplish anything with your belief in God. So I give this my full, full, approval and i ask the new chair lady as she goes into this post to do what i have called on this territory to do much of when all the criticism that is unfounded and all the pressures come stab your distraction and feed your focus because once you stab your distraction it will die from hunger once you feed your fun focus it will continue to be nourished and continue to get you to the destination, or at least one leg of the destination that you have clearly outlined. And once you take that piece of advice and stay true to God and true to your purpose, I know that within a couple months, we will hear greater things from our youth parliament led by Honorable Sherry De Castro. So Mr. Speaker, it has my full support, and I so move. Thank you. The honorable members, the motion before this house is to um, appoint the Honorable Sherry B. De Castro to be the new chair of the Virgin Islands Youth Parliament, along with adding the Honorable Alvaro Maduro Keynes 
and removing from the committee Honorable Flex Charles and myself. Those in favor? Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The motion is now passed. Moving right along, I now again invite the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance to introduce the Mutual Legal Assistant Tax Matters Amendment Act 2022. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to move a motion for the introduction and first reading of the bill entitled the Mutual Legal Assistance Tax Matters Amendment Act 2022. I move that leave be granted to introduce the following bill standing in my name shortly entitled Mutual Legal Assistance Tax Matters Amendment Act 2022. Uh, the, I move that leave be granted to introduce the following bill standing in my name being the Mutual Legal Assistance Tax Matters Amendment Act 2022. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded that leave to introduce the bill shortly entitled Mutual Legal Assistant Tax Matters Amendment Act 2022 be granted. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. I call upon the leader of government's business. Speaker, I introduce the bill standing in my name shortly entitled Mutual Legal Assistance Tax Matters Amendment Act 2022 and will explain its provisions at the second reading. Mr. Speaker, sir, I move that the bill shortly entitled Mutual Legal Assistance Tax Matters Amendment Act 2022 be now read a first time. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Mutual Legal Assistance Tax Matters Amendment Act 2022 be now read for a first time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. I call upon the clerk to read the bill for a first time. This act may be cited as the Mutual Legal Assistance Tax Matters Amendment Act 2022. Thank you. I call again upon the Premier and Minister of Finance to move a motion to introduce the Stamp Amendment Act 2022. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to move a motion for the introduction of first reading of the bill entitled Stamps Amendment Act 2022. I move that leave be granted to introduce the following bill, Senate in my name shortly entitled Stamps Amendment Act 2022. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that leave to introduce the bill shortly entitled Stamps Amendment Act 2022 be granted. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. I call again upon the Honorable Premier and Leader of Government's business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I introduce the bill stand in my name shortly entitled the Stamp Amendments Act 2022 and will explain its provision at the second reading. Mr. Speaker, sir, I move that the bill shortly entitled Tax, I'm sorry, Stamps Amendment Act 2022 be now read a first time. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Stamps Amendment Act 2022 be now read for a first time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. I call upon the clerk to read the bill for a first time. This act may be cited as the Stamps Amendment Act 2022. Thank you. I call upon the Premier to move a motion for the suspension of Standing Orders 52-2. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move a, uh, that a suspension for the suspension of Standing Orders 52 subsection 2 to allow for the second reading of the bill 
entitled Stems Amendment Act 2022. Mr. Speaker, I move that the standing orders number 52 subsection 2 be suspended to allow for the bill shortly entitled Stamps Amendment Act 2022 to be read a second time. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that the standing orders seem to be a lot of chatter in the house. Sorry. It has been moved and seconded that standing order number 522 be suspended to allow the bill entitled Stamps Amendment Act 2022 to be read a second time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. The motion is passed. I call again upon the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance in regards to the Stamps Amendment Act 2022. I'm sorry, members. Members seem to be distracted. What is the issue? Okay. I call on the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance to move the second and third reading of the bill entitled Stamps Amendment Act 2022. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that the bill shortly entitled Stamp Amendments Act 2022 be read a second time. Mr. Speaker, if you may have made some notes, so if uh, while I'm on my feet, I'll explain some of the objects and reasons. And if you may allow me to refer to my notes, Mr. Speaker. Sure. Mr. Speaker, thank you for this opportunity to present the Stamp Amendment Act 2022 for second reading in this honorable house. Honorable members would recall that in mid-2020, as part of your government's COVID-19 economic stimulus efforts, as Premier and Minister of Finance, announced the waiving of stamp duty for all Virgin Islanders and belongers purchasing land and real property. Your government recognized the need to ease some of the financial burdens of residents who would be in a position to purchase property during the pandemic in a manner that encourages the property to remain in local hands. So with the approval of this Honorable House and subsequent assent, from May 7, 2020 to May 31st, 2021, Virgin Islanders and Belangers were able to access a special exemption from paying 100% of the stamp duty on the sale or transfer of property that they purchased during that period. However, if a Virgin Islander or Belanger purchased property under this initiative and then sold the said property or transferred it to a non-Belanger within seven years, the stamp duty fees would not, would, would need it, sorry, not, not, but they would need it to be paid. Let me make that clear, they would need it to be paid. We saw a very keen interest among Virgin Islanders and belongers to own property under this initiative, especially, especially by our young people. And may I say that for young people, this is an ideal time to put your money into owning a home rather than paying it in rent, because young people are at the stage of moving into independence from their parents and now starting on the road to building themselves. And if they can get their help to establish themselves from already, it eases some of their burdens and allows them to focus on achieving other things. We, of course, extended the special exemptions until December 2021 to allow those persons who are unable to access the facility to have a chance at property ownership. Your government's decision to offer special exemptions for the waiver of stamp duty and the sale of transfer of property to belongers has proven to be an effective initiative. For the period May 2020 to December 2021, there was a total of 513 sales, sale transfers. I repeat, a total of 513 sale transfers and the total stamp duty dollars exempted on the sales total 5,543,000 481 dollars. I repeat that the total stamp duty dollars exempted on sales total $5,543,481. That is thousands of dollars that each of those belongers were able to save, and which is money they could have applied to developing their property, seeing to the needs of their family, or put into some other useful purpose, especially given the hardship caused by COVID-19. The worst pandemic to hit the world in over 100 years, 
And Mr. Speaker, there's no way we can look at the tenure of this administration without looking at what we had to endure, especially the past two years with COVID-19, since the 11th of March 2020, especially. This, Mr. Speaker, money that they were saved, this is money that would have also been able to circulate in the economy and help to stimulate the economy during COVID-19 because that money would have gone into their property and the other areas of development by our people. Mr. Speaker, your government is mindful of the fluid state of the economy caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And now, Mr. Speaker, because of the war by, that is, has been waged by U Ukraine, which we join, Mr. Speaker, in making sure the freedom of, of the people of Ukraine is upheld. So, Mr. Speaker, we are mindful of the state of the economy caused by these uh, different areas and many others before. And there remains great uncertainty as to when some normalcy would return to the global, regional, and local economies. We also have to be mindful at this time how, as I said before, the conflict between Ukraine and Russia is having a ripple effect on the rest of the world economy. And the kind of hardship this can bring upon our people, many of whom do not own their own home or who could benefit from owning a piece of commercial property. Therefore, it is incumbent for your government to create opportunities and greater participation in land ownership and consequently its development. Thus, any stamp duty payable by a belonger on the instrument of sale or transport to a first-time property owner, only to first-time property owners that are belongers, would be eligible for consideration under this amendment. And it's very important for us to make sure that we have this because it shows that we have a, a mind for our people, especially our young people, in many areas, including land. As I said, such a decision to provide for greater tax expenditure, that is refraining temporarily from taking money, tax proceeds out of the economy, but instead allowing it to further circulate in the economy, could act as an economic stimulus. Therefore, it is likely that concession made in the long term will spur economic development as the new property owners are anticipated to develop the properties for commercial or residential purposes, resulting in additional revenue to government through various fees and taxes. Mr. Speaker, this initiative by your government is for the empowerment of our people and to also help us to further empower our people. Your government has firmly resolved that, that all Virgin Islanders should be able to own property. When our people own their own property, they will not be paying rent, but they will be either saving that money or investing it in themselves and their children and the generations to come. When our people own property, they can do things with it to earn an income. They can set up a business, they can farm on it, they can become landlords, they can use the property to get a loan from the bank. They can use it as collateral to get student loans to educate their children. They can give their children a head start in life through inheritance when the time comes. Those who know the true history of these islands know that the land is the soul of our, the country. They know the history of our forefathers and our foreparents had to buy these lands after the collapse and abolition of slavery. And that is why these lands are so precious to Virgin Islanders. Mr. Speaker, to add some perspective, we must recall the history of the Virgin Islands people. Our foreparents, the ancestors of indigenous Virgin Islanders, were stolen from their homes and homeland in Africa, brought to the West Indies during the period of the Atlantic slave trade and forced to work on the colonial plantations as slaves. Whatever possessions and property they may have owned in Africa, they lost that when they were kidnapped. On these islands during the slavery era, they were living here, but they did not own the property. In fact, they were, they were property, not regarded as members of the human race. But this was so for hundreds of years across several generations. At a certain point in the time in the slavery era, you would recall, slaves were able to buy their freedom if they could afford it. And then they could try to purchase the freedom of their spouses and children if they could make up the money. And if they could do it before the spouse or the children were shipped off to some other colony, 
in some other distant, distant part of the Caribbean, as was often done to thwart the efforts of those former slaves and their families. During this period, those persons could not focus on buying property. They focus, their focus was on buying the, the freedom of their loved ones, first as a matter of life and death. When the abolition of slavery in the British Empire in 1833, the labor supply to the plantations was disrupted and the plantations became unprofitable for the plantation owners. Understand that if you are running a large farm and your labor force is made up of slaves, then your wage bill, then your wage bill is zero dollars or zero pounds. Sorry. Pounds. But if you now have to pay for labor, then that is going to put a dent in your profit margin. Mr. Speaker, I move to say that, that um, let me stand corrected if, if I said the wrong thing, um, as my members are saying, telling me that it came across, as I said, we waged a war in Ukraine. That's not so at all. I apologize. And that's the beauty of leading. You have to know if you said something wrong, but it was not intentional. It was clear that it's supposed to be that we wage, we wage the war against the war that is waged on the Ukraine. And we do not wage any war on Ukraine or wage by Ukraine. So we're against what is happening in the Ukraine and we're with them. And I needed to clear that up and make that abundantly clear that that was an error. It's an error and uh, we must make sure that we are clear with that because history must be recorded properly. So I do stand corrected and I do apologize. But Mr. Speaker, all we seeking for what happened to us in the past was our apology too. And that is what happened after the emancipation and after the four year period of forced and apprenticeship that followed the abolition of slavery. So the economic model of the plantation collapsed after emancipation, the plantation owners former slave owners could not carry on with their business model and they fell into debt. And in the same way, a financial institution would try to recover some of the money from a defaulting loan. It's the same way the creditors tried to recover some of the money that was tied up in these estates. So the British Parliament introduced the West Indian Encumbered Estates Act in the mid to late 1800s. And the Virgin Islands was added to the list of possessions to which this applied in 1860, where no foreigner knew how to make money on these estates without the use of slave labor. There was little interest by Britons in buying these lands. But our foreparents understood the value and importance of property ownership, and they pooled whatever money they had and purchased from among the estates. You see, they understood that ownership of land was an investment in the future. It was a way to secure the generations because they could own a place to call home and they could ensure that their children would have a place to call home. That is why these lands in the Virgin Islands are sacred to our people. That is why the preamble of the Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007, it is recorded that even though Virgin Islanders may reside elsewhere because of historical, economic and other reasons, or people have and continue to have an ancestral connection and bond with those islands. Ownership of these islands by the people of the Virgin Islands was part of the dream of our ancestors. Economic, social, and political empowerment of our people was part of the dream of our ancestors. And that makes it part of the sacred duty of all governments to ensure that we do everything possible to ensure that our people become empowered. And especially as it relates to ownership of land in the Virgin Islands. That is why your government brought the initial amendment to the Stamp Duty Act to remove the stamp duty tax paid by all belongers when purchasing land, making it cheap, cheaper for people to own land and property. And then we extended it to December 2021. So now your government has brought this new amendment which we are seeking to put in place that will apply only to belongers who are first time land or property owners giving those persons the opportunity to own a property and get all the benefits I've just mentioned. Mr. Speaker, for those persons who will qualify, I urge you to, to get up and take full advantage of this initiative. 
And then this incentive, as a matter of fact, I can say, Mr. Speaker, that I know at least 10 persons who have told me that they want to buy property, but they are waiting on this amendment to be passed. Mr. Speaker, I also want to commend those financial institutions, such as the National Bank of the Virgin Islands, who led the way, and along with the Republic Bank, I know who are the two who I know for sure had programs that, that complemented this initiative. And Mr. Speaker, they allow for 100% financing of the persons with their first-time home ownership and other areas, Mr. Speaker, of belongers, so that they can own their first piece of land and also to build their first home. Which, mean, which meant, Mr. Speaker, that given that government created the, the, the investment climate, it was clear now, Mr. Speaker, that persons could have gone to these institutions, especially National Bank uh, incentive that was even more thorough, and get a piece of land, as we call it, Mr. Speaker, a home without having to put down a penny to purchase down payment in terms of the deposit or the stamp duty. Mr. Speaker, this is testament to what happens when government creates the economic environment and the private sector marries, marries into that family what can be done for the people of the Virgin Islands. So I must register my thanks to the National Bank and also Republic Bank for what they've done in that respect. And I'm calling all our banks that once this is passed, Mr. Speaker, that all our financial institutions move swiftly to allowing first-time home owners and landowners that are belongers to be able to get 100% financing. And also, Mr. Speaker, since they don't have to now pay stamp duty, it will give them a good thrust forward financially and in other ways, Mr. Speaker, so that they can get building and spend that money into their project or into other areas. So I'm calling on our financial institutions to follow suit and complement this initiative and not have our, fraud, our belongers who are first time land and, 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 and property and homeowners or, or, or even business owners, if there's property they're buying for the business, not to have them to put down a dime. I'm calling on each of you to have 100% financing of the project, 100% financing of any belonger for who's buying a home or property for the first time. I'm calling on the financial institutions to make sure that they give them 100% financing, no money down. In this climate, Mr. Speaker, we have to adjust. I'm calling on the institutions to further adjust for those who did it and those who did it. I'm asking you to even stretch a little further. We have to continue to be innovative to help our people. Because, Mr. Speaker, when you buy a piece of property in the Virgin Islands, it means and signals, one, you have confidence in, the, in your country, two, you're saying that you do not intend to leave, and three, you're saying that you are in this together for the long run. And, Mr. Speaker, all financial institutions should find their way to complement these initiatives. I urge my people of the Virgin Islands to take full advantage of this opportunity to save thousands of dollars as you own your own home for the first time, as you own your own land for the first time, and get on the path to empowerment. This is only one of many initiatives, Mr. Speaker, that this government has done and will be doing in spite of the challenges that we have faced in the last two years plus with COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, where we had to shift so much millions of dollars to keep our people safe. And Mr. Speaker, your government, Mr. Speaker, continues to work for the people of the Virgin Islands to help them to improve the quality of their lives and their prospects for the future. And Mr. Speaker, with that, I'm so proud and I thank my government, Mr. Speaker, for the support in this. And the reason, Mr. Speaker, we are doing this into the second and third reading one time is the urgency of this, Mr. Speaker, to help our people to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we can meet them halfway or meet them, whether it's quarter of the way, but meet them where they are and bring them up to the next level financially and otherwise. So Mr. Speaker, may God continue to bless and protect our Virgin Islands and his people and may he continue to guide us on the path to success and prosperity. As Mr. Speaker, 
Our lands are not just an entity to us. It is part of our legacy of our ancestors. Mr. Speaker, I thank you and I so move. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second a motion and I reserve my right to contribute to the debate. Thank you. The floor is now open for debate. I recognize the member of the third district. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I sat with interest, uh, sat and listened with interest to the history that was given by the move of the motion when it relates to Virgin Islanders. It's interesting, Mr. Speaker, that the bill is talking about amending the tax for belongers who are first time purchasers of property. And as he relates the history, he's talking about a Virgin Islander. And it, it, it brings to mind, Mr. Speaker, the importance of the, my advocacy for the establishment of, or should I say, the addition of a section in the Constitution to establish an indigenous Virgin Islander. Because everything he said about the land and the connection of its people to it relates to a Virgin Islander. Mr. Speaker, the whole idea of removing any taxes that are attached to the land being purchased, a stamp duty as it was called, the land being purchased for first time property owners. It sounds good, Mr. Speaker. It sounds good, but how thorough is it when I hear the Premier say that if the individual sell the land to a non-belonger, from my understanding, after seven years, the belonger who purchased it gets to hold on to that tax exemption. Seven years is a short term, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to property. You can purchase property and sit on it for years. Is it, you know, I wonder, I wonder if anyone is, being, is monitoring. Like we have gone, gone along and we amended the legislation to make sure that when a bank confiscates property, they can't sell it to a non-belonger. Unless that non-belonger had a non-belonger land holding license. In the past, you know that that, that was fair game. Anyone could purchase property that was, that was repossessed by a bank, whether they had a non-belonging land holding license or not. And I'm questioning whether or not the Premier has given thought to this idea of an individual who purchased the property can sell it after seven years gratis. Seven years is a very short time when, you talk, when you're talking about property especially land. Mr. Speaker, the, the, and I want to make it perfectly clear that I have absolutely no, no objections to the idea of belongers purchasing property and getting a stamp duty exemption. I have absolutely no. But it must be done with good intention, Mr. Speaker. It must be done with good intention and in the spirit of the law. Why it's being done, it's not a money grabbing situation. It's not a situation where people can make a quick buck. It's genuine. Just like we've done in many instances for first time home owners, 
the stamp duty on building material is, is exempt. Not stamp duty, the custom duty on building material is exempt for first time homeowners. That was done many, many years ago, Mr. Speaker, and I doubt too many people, many people remember that or know that it exists. But governments in the past have made provisions to enable more people to advance in the society. And this one is no different. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I also listened to the Premier as he made his presentation, and I know that I would hear it from other members as well. And there's a tendency among us to get caught up in the moment, and we forget what has intentionally been ignored. The mayor mentioned uh, the, the war in, in uh, Ukraine. But I want to remind him and everyone else who's listening, there are several, several wars being waged in Africa right now. No mention is being made. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to lend my support to this bill. I, it would be quite not me not to say that I fully support bill number one. Number two, because it is oft said that if you have a country 
without the residents, the belongers, the nationals, those who call it their home, owning a stake in the country, then it does not lend to stability. It does not lend itself to a country that would, with residents that would feel a part of. And in that situation, whatever challenges one may have, instead of staying and sticking it out, so to speak, one will use it as the opportunity to flee, move around, because there is nothing there of which you can call your home. I have mentioned, Mr. Speaker, that you know uh, we are creatures of our habitat, and it was just 48. 96 hours ago, I had mentioned that you can have floods and storms and landslides and fires in Western United States. And the folks are waiting until the last fire is out before they rebuild in the very same location. You can have earthquakes and volcanoes and hurricanes passing through the Caribbean. And folks are waiting until the wind come to a respectable uh, level before they start to repair the roofs and stay right there. Mr. Speaker, this is because they have a sense of pride and ownership. And if we reach to a stage where everyone have a place to call their home, a place that they actually own, then you would have a society which may well be free of crime, free of um, waste all over the place, free to open your doors again, Leave them open. So this, while it might seem small, is a very important measure towards ownership, towards sustainability in terms of um, being part of the, the, whole, the whole territorial pride. And it must be seen in that particular light. Yes, $5 million could have been put in the particular treasury, but when the homes are built, it will return. It will return. So I see it as an investment as opposed to a particular arena in where the acting financial secretary will say that's $5 million that I can't find. I, I, I have to find it from someplace else. Readjust your balances, readjust your books, okay? A little hard at times, but the fact is, is that the investment made today will be for a bigger, better Virgin Islands tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, I have a point that while we are living in the best of time, we also could be looked at in terms of the most challenging of times. The hurricanes of 2017 dealt devastating blows to the housing stock. I know it too well. There's a statement I'll make when the opportune time comes for the status of where we are on the road of recovery from the storms of 2017. Prices for building materials went up.
because at the end of the day, there was more demand than what inventory you had, and that always causes a, a, um, a movement of prices. Mr. Speaker, if that was not enough, then you had a global pandemic where supply was cut short because factories were closed. Demand remained to a certain level, but the stock, the building stock, simply um, it has disrupted uh, distribution, disrupted manufacturing, and disrupted a whole form of the materials necessary to build. So prices moved. And if that was not enough, now you have additional wars. As a member for the third say, wars in the east, west, north, and south. Not only one, but the latest one has brought on more strife than all of the others almost combined. You will see it not only in the price of building materials, but in the price of food utilities, all forms of strife would be occasioned as a result of these wars that are waging. Wars start in the East, prices move first in the West. So any relief that could be given to first time home owners is a welcomed relief for that group of those who dare to build. And no matter how brilliant you are when it comes to construction, you become challenged because you start out and the bank tell you you have X dollars and you reckon, well, well with this, I can buy a vehicle when I finish, buy a 90-inch TV when I'm done. I have not seen it happen before. So you have to be mindful. And then when you put on top of that, that you had estimated one price to get your house done as late as January of 2022, or even December 2021, and then prices are moving in the way that they will move tomorrow, the challenge is even greater. But if you wait, if you wait, it will be, it will be critical to see whether or not when the wars are over, when distribution networks are reopened in a normal fashion, when the when the global pandemic has been declared over, when the reconstruction from the storms is done, whether or not prices will come down the other way, or is this, as we have stated before, becomes a new regular for prices. These are challenging times, but the stamp duty, the exemption would help, would assist, and getting those who uh, want to build their first home to be able to consider this and use that, whether or not they hold and it appreciate in value, or whether or not they are able to get the banks and their family and friends to once again take the buckets and throw the concrete to the roof to cast only for a, uh, a bowl of soup and a plate of mutton those are the good old days. We have to return to those. Chicken soup, mutton soup, and, and a, um, you know, a plate of food. That was all you need. Come over, help me cast my roof. We have to go back to those days. And we can all help the first time homeowners to get their home. Not only the land, but to get their home. And uh, Mr. Speaker, 
I so move that this is a good initiative. Thank you. I thank the territorial member for his contribution. I recognize the junior minister for trade and economic development and territorial member, the Honorable Sherine D. Flax Charles. Mr. Speaker, I too rise in support of this um, amendment to the Stamps Act. Mr. Speaker, I remember, I think it's Honorable Vincent Wheatley always speaks about that fire truck when you hear that siren and you wonder what's going on. If you don't have anything, you simply continue doing what you're doing. I had that opportunity last night. I up to now I haven't figured out what happened on Virgin Garda, but we saw that fire truck blazing across the Lee Road. And I started making calls right away. I called my daughter at home. I called my sisters at Fisher's Cove. I called everybody that I called to see if they were okay. And so I fully understand what the minister and my colleague um, has said. And that is why I think it is important, Mr. Speaker, that we encourage our young people to purchase property. We have to first, though, encourage them to save. I know that we have gone through some very tough times in the last four years, but you know, sometimes you have to make a little sacrifice, Mr. Speaker, and so I want to encourage every young person within the sound of my voice, don't go out next weekend, take a little break from the party and, and save that 50 or $60. Put it towards um, your future. I, I, I prefer, Mr. Speaker, to see a young person paying on a piece of property than having to pay rent. When you, when you have your own, it is so much, so important. I also want to encourage our elders, Mr. Speaker, to, if you have lands available, reach out to your family members in the first instance. I know of many cases, Mr. Speaker, where um, lands are sold and you only hear about it after the fact. Sometimes persons will never say, well, let me find out if my daughter or son could really afford this piece of land. Because a lot of times we think that our own doesn't have the capacity or the capability to either be able to go to a bank or might have actually saved that money to be able to purchase that land. I know of many instances, Mr. Speaker, where Persons have had to buy back properties that were sold by family members. So I encourage all families get together, see who might be able to purchase, keep that legacy going. And I, I understand sometimes persons are able to, to sell at a higher price, but you, you never know if your family member might not be, might be able to afford that, that piece of property. And yes, we're, we're going through some very difficult times, but I want to applaud those persons who reach out to families and say, listen, I have a piece of property to sell. I need to sell it for whatever reason, but I want to sell it to a family member or to a local person. And there are people like that here in the BVI. There are lots of people like that. We also need to make sure we check every single real estate company, every single newspaper, see what's available out there. I know in certain areas, um, land is very, very expensive. I, I, I will refer to the island that I live on. And it is a very, very difficult situation to find property that is reasonably priced. But, Mr. Speaker, this is an opportunity through this amendment for persons to be able to purchase property and not have to worry about the stamp duty, which I think is 4%. Um, 
Mr. Minister. And, and so 4% might seem like a small number, but when you're purchasing property, Mr. Speaker, it, it, it can add up. It can add up if you're a property for, let's say, 272000 that's 10000 plus in stamp duty. That could help you to purchase the blocks and the steel and so forth to start your foundation. And, and we, we, Mr. Speaker, we have to go back to working together to help these young people as a community. I think the Stamped Amendment Act, this is so important. When persons are building, we all need to be there on the Saturday morning, even if it's to, to use a shovel or, or, or to help in some way like we used to do long ago. I know my mother would often, without even being asked, you know somebody was casting, you cook up a pot for the, the workmen, and now you have a lot of women working construction as well in the territory. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to, again, before I close, encourage young people across the territory, or persons who are eligible for this exemption, please try your very best to, to get a little piece of the pie. We are working to assist you by eliminating that particular expense. Do what you can, save what you can, so that we can maintain the ownership of property here in our beautiful Virgin Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the territorial member for her contribution. I recognize the Deputy Speaker and territorial member, the Honorable Neville A. Smith. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I rise to support this amendment to the STEM, STEM Amendment Act. But, Mr. Speaker, I think we need to go a little further than just giving um, the amendment to this act. Instead of looking into how we could help more along with people building their homes, Mr. Speaker. Because sometimes we, we, we help them with buying the land, but they still can't build on that land for a lot of reasons. So we now have to find a way that we could assist them in doing so. And one of the things I think that, especially when it comes to government land, once we, people acquire government land, that some sort of road infrastructure, along with water, power, is being put in place that these people could have access to those things as well. There's a way we could even charge for it within the land tax, so we could get it back bit by bit. You don't have to get it all. Because sometimes when a young person will build a house and they're the only person in that area, a chance farmer alone, they can't afford to pay for a chance farmer. So these are the things that we have to start looking at too, Mr. Speaker, so that we can actually help the young people to get their homes. Because a lot of times they'll take the money and they can buy their land, but they can't reach that land. They can't get power to that land. They can't get water to that land. And that in itself you now put them in a predicament where they have to sit down and wait, and wait. And then what might happen? They might end up losing that same piece of land because they couldn't get a bill on it. So we also have to find ways that we could enhance that, Mr. Speaker. Because if we're saying that we are giving them the land, we have to give them an opportunity to build on that land as well. So I do get up to support this, but I just want to say that because I think there's a lot more we can do and a lot more we will do. But it, as I can say, a little by little, a boy built a nest. And I think the government is moving in the right direction where we continue to find ways to help our people and especially keep the land to belong us and our young people. Because if you don't own the land, you don't own the island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Deputy Speaker for his contributions. Is there any other member wishing to speak before I call on the move of the motion? I recognize the Honorable Minister for Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration, and member for the 9th District, the Honorable Vincent O. Whitley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to speak on this most important bill here before us, 
Mr. Speaker, I do support the Stamps Amendment Act because we have had a lot of requests for this. Mr. Speaker, it shows that we are attentive to the needs of our people. As the Premier said earlier, we did offer a tax exemption on persons who were doing land exchanges last year, adding children or adding spouses and so forth. We had 513 families that participated in that initiative. Mr. Speaker, persons aren't always ready at the time things are happening. Sometimes they miss the boat, so to speak. So I'm really glad that the Premier heard the cries of the people and went and brought back this for the first time, homeowners. Mr. Speaker, it has been said many times that who owns the land owns the country. And ever since taking office, we have intentionally and deliberately walked towards more of our people owning more lands and properties here in the BVA. Mr. Speaker, that's where we spent the better part of last year in my, in my ministry working on a land distribution program. I guess I have a few little knacks before we get that program fully implemented. In that program, we'll do exactly what the Deputy Speaker asked for a while ago. Allows, that allows persons not only to have land, but have proper access and also utilities to that property. Mr. Speaker, we can no longer go 50-50 with our people owning land. We must go beyond the 50% mark. We must head towards 60 and 70% if they're ever going to own properties in this British Virgin Islands. The speaker, if you look at a newspaper, any one of them, where lands are being sold, it's not five and 10 pounds like in 1888. It's not $15,000 like a few years ago. Some of these properties can be millions of dollars. The speaker, if we don't come to the plate, and like the junior minister said, start making some sacrifices to save money, eat less, wear less, do less, so you can save more. Old people say, eat little and live long. Live long, long. Eat little and live long. That's the Mr. Speaker with making a sacrifice to get what you want, to get what you need. Something you can cherish, use to invest, and also leave as a legacy for your family and for other generations. Land ownership is a priority and has been a priority. And that's why we're doing the many things that we're doing. For those who don't want to go through the headache of buying land and building a house, we're going to build some housing for you. We already started, Mr. Speaker, with the Josel project, soon to be completed. And they must come in the contractor for, for finishing way under time. I think he was given like three and a half years. I think we're approaching two years now. Just about complete. Mr. Speaker, that's why I call going beyond 50%. Meeting them more than halfway. We have to do every single thing within our power to make sure all people get a chance to own a piece of this rock. Mr. Speaker, I commend the Premier again for making this possible. Mr. Speaker, we went to it last year. It's $5 million, $5.5 million were given as subsidy to help persons own home, own land or homes. Over $5.5 million. That's a tax that would have been collected had we collected those persons. So, Mr. Speaker, it is a stimulus, an injection into those families there. But there are those who will say that, oh, we're losing money, we're wasting money. No, this is money that's gone towards all people owning a piece of this rock, Mr. Speaker. It cannot be seen in any other light except as a stimulus for all people. Mr. Speaker, we cannot go 50%. We have to go beyond. Times have changed. It's a whole new era here now. Mr. Speaker, from the day I came to this house, I said the BVA remains a beautiful place, an attractive place to walk, live, visit, and invest. Incredibly attractive. Persons want to come here. They want to visit here. They want to live here. They want to walk here. Mr. Speaker, where are they going to live? When people come here and they see the beauty of this place, the, the first instinct, the most impulsive, is to want to buy something. I met a gentleman just Monday. 
told me when he came to the BVA, he came on a cruise ship. But when he got off, he went straight to the real estate agent. Just Monday. He came on a cruise ship. He was a no bus sightseeing, Mr. Speaker. He told me when I got off that ship at CB Fairfax, I found the closest uh, real estate agent to see what is for sale on this beautiful place. But if anyone had told me that, I would not believe it. But the man himself told me so, and he owns property here now. He came on a cruise ship. So the speaker, it tells you that the price of real estate, as a matter of fact, if you look at the studies produced, and I saw one a few years ago, the BVA is one of the few places in the world where the retail value, where the property retained value despite all the upheavals in this globe. From 2008 until now, one of the few places in the world where the property values didn't go down was the British Virgin Islands. It retained its value. Even though it had the, the global fallout in 2008, I think it was. BVI real estate, it didn't dip. Pandemic, it didn't dip. Hurricane, it didn't dip. Those properties maintained. So the BVI will continue for the foreseeable future. Be an attractive place where a person may want to come and buy homes. I was told a few months ago that within a year, all our real estate stock currently in the market will all be gone. What happens when all you have is gone? They're going to find more. They've been, they've been knocking at your door. And I like what the Honorable um, the Premier Minister said. If you have to sell that property for whatever reason, you want to send your child to school or a medical bill, call your cousin, call your brother. Don't let the real estate be your first call. Call your family. I don't think our four parents fought and sacrificed for this, this country. First, just give it away for a few dollars. That will last not too long. The intention is for us to retain this land for generations upon generations to come. Just because this morning before I came here, I attended a, a workshop. It was hosted by the North American Environment Resource Institute, and they had training our people in monitoring our coral reefs. And we identify problems, how to go about treating them. We still have a lot of attacks on our coral reefs. So the coral tissue loss disease is still here. That's because the reason why we are doing these kinds of things, we, we have to make sure that our environment, our environment remains pristine. Once you keep our environment pristine and clean, the value will always remain high. Now, the Judah Minister alluded to that, that situation I often spoke about. The first time I heard it, I heard it from the Premier. And he said, and he thinks it's quite right. He said, a bunch of guys playing down the nose there, drinking their beers and things, and a fire truck zoom cross. Not a man stopped playing down the nose or even look up. Because they know where that fire truck is going in days. With no concern. We have to reverse that. We have to change that around. Just because we have to walk through a situation, you want to fire a truck pass, every man jump up. Is it my house or is it my neighbor house? It must create concern. Therefore, they must, we must, Mr. Speaker, move past the 50% help no people to own their property. And when you own your place, you want to keep it clean and you want to take care of it. Because it's yours. Source of national pride. Is mine. I walk. I sacrifice. Just because this time duty is part of that process. It's part of that process of letting first time person wasn't trying to get their feet in the door. Make it easier for them. Okay, for some of us in here, not, not me included, it might not seem like much money. But somebody saving three thousand dollars could be a whole year of savings. Don't look at the amount of money and think, oh, that's small, it's insignificant. No. And in the aggregate, you get 100% saving $3,000. All of a sudden, it adds up. And Mr. Speaker, when more persons are owning property and when more persons are trying to build, the economy increases also. Because you got to buy your lumber, you got to buy your blocks, you got to buy this, and so forth. Or people must get back to land and home ownership. 
Yes, I remember the days where whenever you're going to build, it was a community affair. The most you had to, to buy was so many materials. Come back then, you got to give the truck, you keep some sand, you pass those days. But when you know you're going to build, all the neighbors there. Somebody to do a pot of goat water, somebody make some Kool Aid, somebody bring some rice. Something you have music playing. And it's a whole community affair. Taking the foundations, again, for the singing, the moonlight taking foundations way back when I'm going now. But we understood the importance of building, it was so important to build a home. Everybody came together. It was a community affair. A home was a community affair. And back in those days, too, before my time, before you go speaking to the young lady, you had to prove your manhood by building a house. So the key was mandatory. It wasn't just that you necessarily wanted to build a house. It was mandatory that you build a house and be a man to put your wife in. Like you couldn't care to your father's house. Stay in a hotel room like now, or apartment to rent. So you had much of a choice anyway. But it became a community affair. When a young man wanted to start his family, all his buddies and his family got together, they cook and they sing and they had a good time. Rubber bucket mixing cement by hand. I've, I've, I've seen it, Mr. Speaker. We came together to make sure we own and developed that piece of land. Of course, sometimes in the middle of building a house, things break up. And just so the house sometimes stops too. Most of the time, the house stopped right there. The bunch of half built houses because the relationship did last before the house finished. So you end up with a half built house and he moved on some and she moved on some things. Mr. Speaker, I don't think we'll really see those days again. It's good to sit down and be this about them. But I think, but I think those days, Mr. Speaker, are gone when we will see that. It might happen on an occasion. But I think for the most part, those days are gone when we will see the community coming together like that. If we go to see it, it would be good. But I think the days, for the most part, are gone. The community will come together like that on a large scale and make sure we again own the homes and own the land in this beautiful country. So, Speaker, again, as I wrap up my few minutes here, I want to commend the Premier for hearing the cries of the people and acting on it. Because the same way I got the cars, I know every single member in here got those cars also. Can you please bring back that initiative where I don't have to pay that? Because I wasn't ready. I didn't save enough. I wasn't here. All kind of reasons why they might have missed the first round. But here in the second round, and I could hear the applause from the person now. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, members, for hearing our cry and assisting us in owning a piece of this round. Mr. Speaker, with those few words there, I'll take my seat. Thank you. I thank the member for the 9th District for his contribution. With no one else wishing to speak, I recognize the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities, and member for the 5th District, the Honorable Kai M. Reimer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I too rise in support of the Stamp Amendment Act 2022. Mr. Speaker, yes, most members have already spoken of, of the benefits to this, this amendment and the, the benefit it would be to many of the persons that would be able to purchase land. And we know the importance of land in any territory. So, Speaker, we know that you can't make any more land. So, whatever land is available, we would hope that persons would you know, be able to access it. We know we are an ambitious people in this territory and owning land is a part of owning the territory. And Mr. Speaker, I applaud the, the Premier, this government, for providing yet another stimulus to those persons. We heard where, you know, persons are reaching out, stating that they have missed the opportunity, but they are desirous, they are on the verge of owning some land and you know, if they would have this opportunity to not have to pay this stamp duty, uh, that would benefit them as their intent is on building. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the member for the ninth touched on a, a point where a guy came off a cruise ship and was able to earn 
property. Mr. Speaker, I know that's a long process where that person would be able to own land or property within the territory. Mr. Speaker, I think this is a good forum where we can speak about the non-belongers landholders license. And, uh, you know, being in cabinet, I see on many occasions where persons are able to, we were able, we are able to issue those licenses and, and those licenses are where persons who are non-belongers are able to obtain a license to own property. So it's because there's nothing wrong with that because there's a, there's a place for everything. But I know what needs to be done and I, I would ask the same member in his ministry to, to make it more accessible for persons who are non-belongers who are actually selling or where land become, becomes available so that there's a, the platform is, is more readily accessible to persons. I know based on the law that persons only need to put it in the newspaper, I think for two editions or two weeks. And after that process is over, whoever is applying, they just need to, to present uh, to the ministry that they advertise the land sale for for two weeks, and you know, cabinet is then inclined to issue that license to those persons. Mr. Speaker, I know there there are many different avenues now, social media. Um, I know there was a discussion where there should be a database that should be accessible to anyone to go onto that database and, and see what land is available for persons that are desirous of, of purchasing land. And Mr. Speaker, I you know, would, would encourage for that database to come and stream quickly. Because sometimes, Mr. Speaker, we are, yes, we want to purchase land and, and when we we go and we check. And Mr. Speaker, I must say that some of the landowners, yes, they already have who they want to purchase these lands because I know there was an instance where it was being advertised for, for one price. When it came to cabinet, we noticed that the land was actually being sold for a, a minuscule cost. And when we reached out to the landowner, um, there was some deal reached with the, the person purchasing. So, you know, we ask that those persons be honest as well. Uh, once they advertise, because we see certain times where land is advertised, and a belonger might be saying, yes, I wonder if I can afford that. When you go and you inquire, the, the, the cost is much more. So, Mr. Speaker, once that data, database becomes available, then you will have a, a, an, a, a platform where you can go and now inquire and be able to decide if that land is something that you want. And, Mr. Speaker, you know, I encourage all persons so, to look in the newspaper because I think that is the only place now that you need to advertise. I know there are some online newspapers that also do that. But, you know, I, I encourage persons to go and, and look in those mediums so that you can see what land is available. Um, we know we have the, the realtors as well, but, you know, land is al always being sold um, and it's, it's placed in a newspaper. So I encourage persons to look there. And, Mr. Speaker, I, I, again, this government, we, we understand the hardship face after the hurricanes of 2017 and, and now COVID. And I think it was just a few weeks ago where we offered an amnesty and also property tax because we, we see where quite a few persons are unable to, uh, to, to pay their, their property tax as well. And interest has occurred on that. And you know, we, we thought it necessary to, to give an ease to that. 
So that, that, that also needs to be highlighted where this government, we understand the hardship and we continue to, to make life a bit easier for persons within our territory. So those who, are, who have not paid their property taxes as well, I think that is a sunset clause where they can uh, go forth and, and make payments there. But, so reach out, go and pay your property tax as well. And you know, for those persons desirous of owning land, I, I ask you to reach out. You have an opportunity now where you can avoid paying that 4%. Four, 4%. I mean, my song like a little bit right now, but you know, once you gather, gather up enough money, you may just have enough money. And when you hear about the tax, you know, that could be a deterrent. So this is yet another uh, stimulus uh, for, for those persons who want to become landowners. And, you know, I, I applaud the, the premier, the, the team at the Ministry of Finance for that also. And Mr. Speaker, you know, with that, I just want to stand in full support of this amendment, Stamp Amendment Act 2022. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for the 5th District for his contributions. I call on the Leader of the Opposition and Member for the 8th District, the Honourable Malon A. Penn. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity to make my brief contribution to the Stamp, Stamps Amendment Act 2022. Speaker, as members before me spoke, it's no secret that land ownership is a treasured thing by Virgin Islanders. I think we pride ourselves on ownership of our property. For the most part, Virgin Islanders own the majority of the property in the Virgin Islands. And it's something that we pride ourselves on and cherish as a speaker. Speaker, it's something that I encourage and something that I often support young Virgin Islanders to do in terms of their first major purchase, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as a Virgin Islander growing up, when I left high school, and the first major purchase that I did when all my parents were buying cars was a piece of land. Um, and it's the same land that I now have my home on, Mr. Speaker. And it's something that I tend to encourage my peers or persons younger than I am to invest in property. As my father always says, the only real estate um, in the sense that they make it again. You know, it's, it's not going to stay at the prices that they are right now because I remember when I did pur my purchase and the prices that I'm seeing now, it's mind boggling in terms of the cost of ownership of property and ownership of a home in the Virgin Islands today. So I think this amendment will give Virgin Islanders a little ease to be able to own a piece of property and to be able to put that investment into the building of a home. I think that is the most challenging aspect going forward. There are persons who have inherited homes, um, inherited property, but the challenge right now is ownership of a home. Um, the member, the large member mentioned about the level of inflation in terms of construction material. The level of inflation, it, makes, it speaks to the building of homes, um, the level of support that we had in the 70s, 80s, and even some aspects of the 90s doesn't exist anymore. If many of those persons opt to try to build those homes now, um, that they will be able to build for, for I heard some of the prices and I, and, and, and I shut up. Under $100,000, some of those major large homes were built in the 80s because of support by family and friends and support of the community is why we were able to, were able to afford some of those homes back in the day. And, and it's more difficult now for young Virgin Islanders to own a piece and own a home in the Virgin Islands. So we have to find 
creative ways of construction, creative ways and economic ways to support persons in building and owning a home. The land is important, but I think the next step is the ownership of a home. Because once persons purchase a piece of property for $90,000, there's little room for them to do anything else economically in terms of the home ownership or building a home. So I think we have to, the first time home owners land, there was a first time home owners initiative which gave some tax relief in terms of persons who are building to bring in materials. I often argue that that has to be somehow interwoven into the local economy. Uh, persons now could go outside of the Virgin Islands and purchase those materials. We have to find a way to ensure that that tax relief or that tax benefit somehow is still integrated within the local economy with our local suppliers and find ways to ensure that the money as much as, it, as, as possible stays within the local economy. And that is something that I think we really need to consider. How are we going to integrate it into uh, ensuring that those purchases happen on the local level and the tax relief is also passed on so that the benefit will be had by the local economy. Additionally, I know the member, the large member, Deputy Speaker spoke about infrastructural support. I believe and I support that initiative. I know that it is something that was done previously with the initiative over at Spooners, the Stevens Estate Initiative, the one in down in Sikaos Bay. Um, there was a there was a, a, a aspect of it where the government had a responsibility to ensure that the infrastructure, the roads, the water, the utilities were put in place for those persons who had the privilege of owning a piece of property in those subdivisions. I don't believe that that is something that we should change. Minister for Natural Resources and Labor is a program that we need to continue um, and find a way to finance that initiative to ensure that our, per, our people get maximum benefit in terms of the homeowner and home building process. So it's an initiative that I do support and I believe that that is something that we need to really look at in terms of ensuring that it continues and persons get that support. When this initiative was, I think it was in 2021 or 2020 when it first came forward, um, I raised a concern then, and I think the member for the third raised it also just recently, uh, in terms of the issue of speculation. I believe the intent is the right one and what we're trying to achieve, but we have to be mindful and we have to guard against um, speculative behavior. Um, the dynamics in the BVI are not the same dynamics in the 80s, in the 70s, or even early 90s. The Belonga now, uh, we have Belongas who could buy us 10 times over. We have billions, and the, the potential of speculation is really a real one. Uh, we have to look at their creative ways in which persons purchase property in the Virgin Islands, using financial vehicles and different kind of structures to purchase property. And we have to make sure that a true first-time homeowner or one who's, who's aspiring to be a first-time landowner truly benefits from this initiative and, not, and that is not misused for speculation for persons who have large financial resources to take advantage and sit on the property for seven years is a, is a timeline that I'm hearing and potentially then sell and gain the benefit uh, in terms of tax breaks where that money could have gone supporting the government within our society. So that is something that I would bring up in the committee stage with the Attorney General to see how these structures could be used and what that would mean in terms of persons using a structure versus um, using what, how are the methodologies that we could safeguard against to avoid speculative behavior in terms of utilizing these, um, this particular amendment. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, persons have reached out who in the intervening period between when the first time lapsed and this new amendment that is coming to force about can they get a, a rebate for purchases that they made 
during the intervening period. And it's something that we need to discuss in the committee stages, uh, what that would look like and what that would cost us. But I believe the cost in terms of that person having an opportunity particularly to invest in their home probably outweighs um, the cost overall um, in the long term. So it's something that I, I think we need to look at. But in principle, I support the intent, the methodology. My, my only concerns are those particular areas where there could be potential for speculation. And if there are any loopholes where that could happen, I think we have an, we have an obligation to ensure that those loopholes are closed. And where we could, as much as we can, integrate the first time home ownership bill that was done, I think it's 27, 2011, into the local environment, and we could have that conversation in the committee stated as well, of the possibility of ensuring as much as we can, especially with what is happening globally with inflation, to ensure as much as the money spent in the Virgin Islands stay in the Virgin Islands. It's has something that we have to continue to focus on and remain committed to. So with that said, Mr. Speaker, I await the committee stage for the discussions as we move forward with this bill. I thank the Honorable Leader of the Opposition and Member for the 8th District for his contribution. I now call upon the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture and Member for the 7th District, Dr. The Honorable Natalia D. Whitley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to speak on this very important amendment. Firstly, allow me to thank the Premier and Minister of Finance for bringing this amendment and, of course, my cabinet colleagues for supporting it in cabinet. I'm also thankful for the initiative that we had last year, uh, providing relief to belongers on the sale of land. Mr. Speaker, tax revenue is very important uh, to the functioning of government. Of course, we have to maintain our roads, we have to build schools, maintain our health infrastructure, we have to pay our workers. There's so many things that government needs money to do. But Mr. Speaker, you know what's even more important than tax revenue? Land ownership. Land ownership is even more important than the revenue that we collect. And, and I do acknowledge, that's why I started the way that I did. I do acknowledge that we need revenue. And we have to find ways of increasing revenue. But even more important than that is land ownership. And I congratulate the Premier for being able to recognize the significance of land ownership. And I'm sure there may have been other leaders who would have chosen not to do something like that, like this, simply because of not being able to see past the loss in revenue. Mr. Speaker Malcolm X, who I uh, truly appreciate, studied him in history. He said something very significant, and I want to relate it to you. He said, land is the basis of all economic security. And I'll just say, if you have economic security, that helps with your social security, if you're looking as a collective. He says, Malcolm X, land is the basis of all economic security. Land is essential to freedom, justice, and equality. 
land is essential to true independence. And Mr. Speaker, despite the fact that we are territory of the United Kingdom, I would say Virgin Islanders are very independent, have an independent mentality, an independent uh, way of going about their affairs. And that independence has been the basis, in my view, of our success. And a great deal of that independence, I argue, has to do with our relationship to the land, to the land. And in the Virgin Islands, we may take it for granted. In fact, in the Virgin Islands, we take a lot of things for granted. Um, it, it would be useful for us to travel and don't just stay in the hotels, the expensive, nice resorts. Take a little walk in the local communities and see just how of a far-flung idea it is in many places to own even a little piece of dirt that you can call your own. In places like the United Kingdom, they had, an, and a, a, many places in the world, they had a, a feudal system, a system called feudalism. And we use the word landlord when we're talking about being a tenant in someone's apartment. That word landlord came from the feudal system when there were lords who owned all the lands. And persons had to pay them taxes. You had to pay taxes to the aristocracy. You had to stay, pay taxes to the king for living on this land because the king owned all the land. And anybody who lived on the land, the peasantry, had to pay taxes just to be on the land. And even when you talk with persons from the United Kingdom, they have a completely different view of land than we have. If you just happen to sell a piece of land to a belonger, at a very affordable price, some of them are almost appalled by that. Because they have such a different relationship with land, they're not really used to that type of thing. Land is a precious commodity. And in the Virgin Islands, we have it in abundance. I mean, when you look at some persons, you may not even know you have some person he might be just sitting down in his taxi bus. Like an ordinary person, some tourist might take a ride with him and doesn't realize that he has millions of dollars of real estate. Land is so important and, and other persons spoke so eloquently about this. Land is the basis for our success here in the Virgin Islands because differently from other Caribbean countries and many other countries in the world, which went through uh, slavery and a plantation economy, in the Virgin Islands, those persons who ran the plantation economy they all left for various reasons. Uh, they perhaps they didn't think they could make money here anymore um, after the, the uh, abolition of slavery. Perhaps maybe hurricanes and riots and things like that made them leave the Virgin Islands. Our scholars have written about this extensively, right? But the plantation class, called the plantocracy, left the Virgin Islands and our people bought the land. Even before slavery was finished, our people bought land. And persons like Dr. Angel Smith, 
will give you the details on how we were able to buy the land. And this is why a study of history and culture is so important. Because, of course, if you don't know your history, you may not even know the pains that your ancestors went through just to get this land that we have here today. And it makes me so sad when we sell it so easily. I mean, do we have any idea what our people had to go through to get this land? And sometimes we just sell it to an out... You know, I don't want to sound like I'm against persons who came from elsewhere. But Virgin Islanders fought hard for this land. And just to sell it so easily and casually to someone who came from someplace else is something that I'm not in favor of, Mr. Speaker. And I even think that we have to take stronger measures to keep Virgin Islands lands in Virgin Islands hands. We have to do more to make sure that that is the case. And I call on, I call on our elders, those persons who are, you know, who are executors to these lands, to, to free them up. Pass them on to the young people. You have them caught up. You, don't, you have all of these family disputes over land. Free up the land for the young people. It's not doing good to anybody being caught up in whatever legal dispute there in the hills. And then whenever you check somebody, goes and, 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 and they get it resolved and they sell it to somebody from the outside. So, we take for granted this land that we have. Your home you can become a home owner. When you have land, you can build businesses. When you have land, you have collateral for a loan from the bank. And that can be the begin. That can be the beginning of a journey towards economic prosperity and success. In the Virgin Islands, we should dream big and think big. I was so pleased when I went to the H. Laverty Stout Memorial Celebration and listened to the, I believe he's the president of the investment club, Mr. Mead Malone tell the story of CCT. And uh, it was so interesting for me. And I said to ourselves, we need persons in the Virgin Islands to hear the story. And we need persons to emulate the success of the investment club. And a lot of the persons in the investment club, they started small. They started small, but their investments grew, and they prospered. And that's a model that we all should be able to follow, but the basis of it, the beginning of it, is land. So we must work hard to keep land, our Virgin Islands land in Virgin Islands' hands. And this is what I see this amendment doing helping us to keep Virgin Islands in Virgin Islands' hands. And in the short term, we lose some tax revenue, but in the long term, we establish more of a foothold in the Virgin nation. And we cannot allow any persons to fool us out of our land, take our lands away. So Mr. Speaker, I'm in full support of this amendment and I like my encourage all persons out there, all persons out there, just like the leader of the opposition said, don't just think car, don't just think material objects, clothes and jewelry. Put some money on the side and invest in some property. Yes, the property is quite expensive now. It's not as it was before. 
save up some money and get a piece of property and own a piece of the Virgin Islands drain. With that, I support the bill completely, Mr. Speaker. I thank you for the opportunity. The Premier and member for the seventh district for his contribution. With that, I call upon the mover of the motion, the Honorable Premier and Minister of Finance to wrap up the debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, Speaker, I thought it was a very fruitful debate with the Stamp Duty Act. i like to say that it has turned out to be a fruitful initiative by this government to help our people. Before, it was clear that all belongers was afforded this opportunity as we were in the heart of COVID. And one of the things that we noticed whenever disasters hit uh, persons get um, hardship, experience hardship, and, and the lands come up for sale. So we wanted to make sure that when we come out of these disasters that we, we, don't, find us, we don't find ourselves not owning our lands. And we saw that that initiative was timely as over 500 um, transactions happened for people, over 5 million and change um, in terms of stamp duty that was forfeited, but still yet invested in the people of the Virgin Islands in the economy of the Virgin Islands. And Mr. Speaker, I'm glad to hear some of the ideas because in the recent uh, weeks, the, the Deputy Speaker has been speaking to me, Honorable Smith, about making sure that we can work towards getting the uh, more assistance into different areas, the construction and uh, the building, and uh, how we can help our people with those costs, given that we don't control the costs that's coming from our way. So I, um, I really thank him for that. And today to hear in the House some of the same areas that have come up is, is really heartwarming. It shows that we have been working for the people in the, even in the middle of a crisis. And Mr. Speaker, we can see just like how we can be fully accountable for the monies that was given from Social Security, the full $40 million that each dime is accountable, is accounted for because it did not go in the pockets of any elected official, it went into the hands of the people of the Virgin Islands. So Mr. Speaker, one thing we know is that you can't hide where a check went. So it is clear, Mr. Speaker, that with that initiative also, we were accountable. And with this one, we are account accountable, but more so with both, we have been able to help the people of the Virgin Islands and continue to help them in the middle of a crisis, the worst pandemic in the last 100 years. Mr. Speaker, yeah, um, we have a committee that we've put together in-house in the government with, um, where we met with all the PSs and ministers and junior ministers and um, the whole nine yards uh, finance and the whole team to look at and see uh, customs and trade and um, the whole team to, to see how we can deal with the, the follows that are going to come from the Ukraine tomorrow um, as we'll be making a a statement on that during the press conference of some of the the initiatives that coming out of that and i smile because even in that meeting came up the the way of how we can still help our people to build and some of the suggestions coming out of that meeting is the same as what the deputy speaker has been telling me and what we heard today and i smile because i said um you know i don't mind doing the the stamp duty i don't mind doing all of them but i can hear it now one for the building um, that you all are suggesting. They asked me why, Premier. I said, because I'm building now, and the first thing they're going to say is I brought it up because I'm building. So I told them that that one of the drawbacks of that, but that is not a reason at all. It is to make um, the idea came from other persons, and it came forward. And other persons, young persons in the country, asked them, what can we do to help? And uh, tomorrow we'll name some of those initiatives and uh, to that that we're going to try to do to mitigate against the fallout of what we're seeing happening um in the war that has been waged uh, against the ukraine that we we support their freedom so we've been able to name a few initiatives that we have been able to do in the marine sector already 
um, that we are going to do in the building sector and also in terms of the trade sector, some, some th initiatives that we'll be able to announce as initial initiatives. But I must tell the people at the Virgin Islands though, and I will say tomorrow, please um, get ready for this economic impact and shock that's, that, that war is going to bring to the territory because it's going to happen worldwide. So if President Biden can warn America of the economic shocks that's coming as a result of this war, then you know that if America um, sneezes in terms of where the Virgin Islands is situated, that we catch a cold. So you know that all the different prices are going to be right. And it's not as something that is happening at home. But on the home front, we recognize, the, we recognize how this will affect us. And we've been proactive just like we did with the COVID-19 um, economic uh, financial committee and other committees. So we've been proactive again here, looking ahead at this war that's, that's, that's um, on right now in the Ukraine, the effects it will have. And um, we do recognize all the different areas were uh, battling in, in terms of war and people trying to take away their freedoms over the meet us in persons overall and tell us thanks for the, the, the you know doing an initiative that benefited people of the Virgin Islands. Uh, I remember too that I met quite a few real estate The industry, the real estate industry, uh, some significantly, and so uh, some other, some industry, industries, even during the pandemic, was able to flourish. Some fallout of COVID-19. So I'm really grateful that the policies that the, the government has put in place has helped uh, persons during. Paradox that, that they're those saying the policies hurt persons. Yes, you want to get everything correct, <clears throat> but for the most part, given what all countries have to. Years. So what would this will do right now when this is passed and assented to, which we'll be pushing to get it done right away, is that any first-time home owners or land and property owners that are belongers, only belongers, from paying stamp duty. And as rightfully said by the junior ministers, that might have to buy up for $100,000, you know, that, that extra $4,000 or $5,000 you have to pay um, would, would be a, quite a burden for you, knowing that you Again, I'm reiterating and, uh, that the banks now must come on board. I'm inviting them to this initiative. To, to either continue or start or further enhance your programs that will allow for 100 first time homeowners or landowners so that they will complement the efforts of government. Now, in terms of whether persons who bought to, to, to call, because there are those also who bought the lands on, 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 in January early that are first time homeowners but they are belongers and they're asking, well I was just a few days late, I was just a few weeks off. Um, the, where we used to as a country give certain breaks and we found out in the middle of um, the COI Not, on, not of, of transparent nature or, or good governance where we are taught we are helping our people in some of the uh, 
um, given that, that other persons look at these things or what we do in our culture as, as, um, as something that's not. So we have to be mindful of those. So we, we want to help, but not at the expense of the, the reputation of the. Those will be bear in mind, and they will be born in mind. So I want to thank everyone for their support for this. Um, when this to our budget speech, it reflects our commitment. Respect reflects our commitment to staying true to the policies and programs to help the people of the Virgin Islands that is not just I thank you for wrapping up the bill. It has been to be now read a second time. Those in favor, those against, the eyes have This act may be cited as the state one of the House of Assembly of the Virgin Islands. This bill now stands committed to a committee of the whole House to consider it clause.
members have Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I report, during the, standing, during the committee stage, earlier still up the, the latest up to date, uh, which was up to when the speech from the throne was done and they said that there was still some some um six million five hundred and seventy eight thousand six hundred and ninety four dollars and forty eight cents. That's the Uh, transactions, sales of, of transfer transactions, etc. So, well, um, with that, Mr. Speaker, so that was the exempted figure. And, and for those that are the last that has been registered for up to this year, not that it was $170,971.40. So this was the update figures I just received from the Stamps Amendment Act 2022 be, has been passed through committee, I think with amendments. Mr. Speaker, so I move that. The bill for a third time. This act may be cited as the Stamps Amendment Act 2022. The bill has been... Oh, sorry, I didn't... I, I didn't see your hand, sir. I recognize the sponsor of the bill. It could still happen. It could still happen. Okay, circulate. Okay, the Premier is asking for a division of votes. I will ask the clerk to ask each member via the normal process as to yea or nay. Those in favor will say yea. Those against the bill will say nay. In keeping with standing order 49.3. Honorable Alvaro Maduro Keynes, member for the 6th District. Honorable Shireen D. Flax Charles, territorial member. Yea. Honorable Shari B. De Castro, territorial member. Yea. Honorable Andrew A. Foy, member for the Forest District. Yes. Honorable Julian Fraser, member for the Third District. Honorable Carvin Malone, territorial member. Honorable Marlon A. Penn, member for the Eighth District. 
Honorable Kai M. Reimer, member for the 5th District. Yes. Honorable Neville A. Smith, territorial member. Yes. Honorable Melvin M. Turnbull, member for the 2nd District. Honorable Mark M. Mark H. Vanterpool, member for the 4th District. Honorable Natalia D. Wheatley, member for the 7th District. Yes. Honorable Vincent O. Wheatley, member for the 9th District. Aye. The tally has been handed to me. There are 10 yes, three absents. That means the bill has been passed. I call upon the clerk to read the bill for a third time. Please read it, read it again for a third time, Madam Clark. The bill. This act may be cited as the Stamps Amendment Act 2022. The bill has been passed by a division of votes as amended. Honorable Premier. You had something before we move on to nothing? Okay. Then we will move to, we're on page 11, the top of page 11. We'll move now to invite the Minister for Health and Social Development for the first reading of the Nonprofit Organization Amendment Act 2020. Okay, let's take a one minute recess. Yeah, but if, um, Honorable Premier, if you're changing again, we're gonna have to amend the order paper. We can't just change it on the fly. Okay, I call upon the Minister for Health and Social Development. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I move a motion for the introduction and first reading of the bill entitled Nonprofit Organization Amendment Act 2022. Mr. Speaker, sir, I move that leave be granted to introduce the bill standing in my name shortly entitled Nonprofit Organization Amendment Act 2022. Is there a second? Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded that leave to introduce the bill shortly entitled Nonprofit Organization Amendment Act 2022 be granted. Those in favor? Those against? Ayes have it. I now call upon the Minister for Health and Social Development. Mr. Speaker, I introduce the bill standing in my name shortly entitled Nonprofit Organization Amendment Act 2022, and will explain its provisions at the second reading. Mr. Speaker, sir, I move that the bill shortly entitled Nonprofit Organization Amendment Act 2022 now be read a first time. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Nonprofit Organization Amendment Act 2022 be now read for a first time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. I now call upon the clerk to read the bill for a first time. 
This act may be cited as the Nonprofit Organizations Amendment Act 2022. Thank you. Um, Honorable Premier, do you still wish to make an intervention or we continue with the new bill, Virgin Islands Food Security? Okay. Thank you, sir. I call upon the Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries, and Agriculture to introduce the Virgin Islands Food Security and Sustainability Act 2022 for his second and third readings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that the bill shortly entitled Virgin Islands Food Security and Sustainability Act 2022 be read a second time. Mr. Speaker, allow me a few moments to give the objects and reasons. This is a proud day for me, Mr. Speaker. The Virgin Islands Food Security and Sustainability Bill 2022 is the very first bill I'm piloting through the House of Assembly. In acknowledgement of this green bill, I'm wearing a bright green shirt. And I anticipate that this bill will further help us go green by revolutionizing the food production industry. Mr. Speaker, we have gone from growing, catching, and raising everything we eat and even exporting to the current situation where we are importing over 90% of what we consume. Given the need for a diversified economy, more government revenue, more business opportunities, more employment opportunities, healthier food, and being friendlier to the environment, the VIP campaigned on bringing the food production sector back to life. The people gave us the mandate to take this initiative forward, and a major step towards this goal is legislative improvement. Mr. Speaker, this bill has given us the opportunity to consolidate several different pieces of legislation, including the Animals Importation and Diseases Ordinance, Chapter 88, Plant Protection Ordinance, Chapter 93, Protection of Animals Act, Chapter 94, Fisheries Act, Number 4 of 1997, Slaughterhouses Act, Number 8 of 2001, Dogs Prevention of Injury to Persons, Livestock and Poultry Act, Number 14 of 2001, Pounds and Livestock Brands Act, Number 19 of 2004, and others, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this bill also gives us the opportunity to modernize our legislation. We have agricultural legislation on the books, which is 100 years old. This bill gave us the opportunity to examine existing legislation and ensure it is fit for the times in which we live and the challenges we face, including the war in Ukraine. Mr. Speaker, the Food Security and Sustainability Bill will establish an effective mechanism to promote food security and sustainability in the territory and provide for the establishment, powers, and functions of the Agriculture and Fisheries Management Unit and the Virgin Islands Agriculture and Fisheries Authority, respecting the effective administration and management of agriculture and fisheries resources of the territory. The bill, Mr. Speaker, is comprised of 12 parts and 178 clauses and over 140 pages. And I would just like to highlight some of the main clauses for the public this afternoon. Clauses one through five set out the preliminary provisions 
including the short title and commencement, the definition of terms used in the bill, the statement of purpose and the scope and application. Clauses 6 through 10 would provide for the administrative matters, the establishment duties and responsibilities of the Agriculture and Fisheries Management Unit within the ministry responsible for the subjects, development and review of the policy for sustainable agricultural production, food security, and food safety, while addressing the impacts from climate change and disasters on food production. Clauses 11 through 13 would provide for the establishment and enforcement of standards for food security and safety to establish, monitor, review, and regularly update the standards. Guidelines and operational procedures. Clauses 14 through 16 would provide for the power of the minister to make an order in consultation with the unit, also de to declare fisheries pr priority and protected areas, and to declare fish as protected species by order published in the Gazette. Clauses 11, clauses 17 and 18 would provide for the local fisheries management and bylaws for local fisheries management areas. Part three of the bill, clauses 19 through 50, is a major aspect of the bill and makes provisions for the Virgin Islands Agriculture and Fisheries Authority. It would provide for the membership and board of directors of the authority, the appointment of the chairperson and deputy chairperson, as well as the managing director and deputy managing director. It also makes provision for the assets, accounts, and operations of the authority. Clauses 51 and 52 would provide for the authority to develop a food security management plan for the territory and for the authority to review that plan every five years. Clause 53 would provide for the authority to undertake an agricultural census, the power of the authority acquire, to acquire and issue leases on Crown lands for food and agricultural production. Part 5 of the bill, Mr. Speaker, clauses 56 through 62 would make provisions for plant protection. It includes provisions for notice to be given to the authority to control pests and diseases and would set out the procedures for the eradication of diseases and pests. Part 6, clauses 63 to 73, would provide for pounds and livestock. This includes matters relating to the supervision of the pounds and specify, specifying the stations that would be used for quarantine. It addresses the impounding of animals uh, found straying in public places or trespassing on private property and the impounding of livestock. Part 7 of the bill, clauses 74 through 84, would provide for dogs and the prevention of injury. It would provide for the liability of the owner of a dog for the injury of persons, livestock, and poultry, and includes the responsibility of owners of dogs. Part 8 of the bill, Clause 85, makes provision for commercial farms, including provisions for the licensing of commercial farms. Part 9, clauses 86 through 105, makes provision for the importation and sale of fresh meat and would provide for the following. Licensing of food processing facilities and butchers, sale and importation of fresh meat, the requirements and expect inspection for slaughterhouses and the inspection of meat. Part 10, clauses 106 through 138, would make provisions for fisheries. These include the establishment of a fisheries advisory committee, its functions and matters pertaining to meeting and members of the committee. The bill would also provide for the following, co-opting, record of proceedings, and report. Principle of the management of fishery resources and protecting marine environment from pollution. Stock assessment and authority to develop and comply with the fisheries management and development plan. Clauses 116 through 119 
would provide for the registry of fishing vessels by the authority and related matters, including change of ownership, inspection and registration of local fishing vessels. Clause 120 would provide for the application of local fishing licenses in order to catch fish for the purpose of sale. Clauses 121 and 122 would provide for the conditions attached to a local fishing license and fees, while clauses 123 to 126 would provide grounds for the cancellation or suspension of local fishing licenses, notification and exemptions, and the period of validity of local fishing licenses. Clauses 136 to 138 would provide for the promotion of marine scientific research, the transfer of marine technology and conservation management measures and aquaculture. Part 11, clauses 144 to 175 would make provisions for the enforcement and evidentiary matters. Various matters include stray animals, offenses against authorized persons, offering bribes or inducements, and knowingly introducing pests or diseases. Clauses 153 to 155 would provide for offenses and penalties in orders, regulations and bylaws, offenses prohibited, uh, fishing methods, and offenses relating to certificates of registration and licenses. The bill also provides for two schedules. The procedures in respect of meetings of the board of the authority are set out in Schedule 1, while the list of reportable diseases is set out in Schedule 2. Mr. Speaker, this bill is the culmination of work spanning from 2017 to 2020 of background research and consultations with key stakeholders in fisheries and agriculture. Prior to drafting this bill, prior to the drafting of the bill, reports that inform the content of the bill were produced, which I will briefly summarize. The first is the green paper, proposed revisions for the Virgin Islands Fisheries Act No. 4 of 1997 and dated October 2018. This green paper recommended changes to fisheries legislation including the establishment of the fisheries policy oversight and monitoring, reporting and verification unit, establishment of a Virgin Islands Fishing Authority, transfer of the BVI fishing complex to the fishing authority, adoption of principles for fisheries management and requirements for a climate resilient fisheries management plan, public review of the fisheries management plan and a climate resilient fisheries management and food security policy. A key piece of research that influenced recommendations concerning the establishment of a Virgin Islands fishing authority and transfer of the BVI fishing complex to the authority was a report on the Virgin Islands marine and fisheries sectors. This report was based on a technical mission carried out through funding provided by the Overseas Countries and Territories Association, or ACTA, Innovation Project, to provide technical advice on the future operations and structure of the BVI fishing complex. Some key observations and recommendations from this mission included the operations of the BVI fishing complex were hampered by several policies and government standard operating procedures, which were unfavorable to commercial operations. The need to improve fisheries governance and management in the Virgin Islands, specifically due to the lack of knowledge concerning the fisheries resources of the Virgin Islands and the illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing by local, commercial, and subsistence fishers, tourists in the yacht, yachting industry, visiting sports fishers from the U.S. Virgin, Island, Virgin Islands, and foreign fishing fleets, the need for the development of a fisheries development strategy to set the base for the sector and as a means of attracting funding and support for the industry, and as a matter of urgency, the need to give specific focus to fisheries, the industry, the fishers, and the resource base. Another key report was entitled Issues Paper, 
Review and Revision of Legislation for the Proposed Virgin Islands Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, recommended the inclusion of the following in the revised legislation for agriculture. Strategic planning for the sector and lands for agriculture, marketing and agribusiness development support, the establishment of an agricultural complex slash market, legally established an agricultural uh, marketing board, food safety standards, and emphasis on technical support and extension services. In addition to the recommendations from these reports, which all clearly show that the provisions in these legislations were recommended by exports. These reports, Mr. Speaker, the bill also seeks to consolidate existing fisheries and agricultural legislation into a single comprehensive bill. Mr. Speaker, we consulted various stakeholders prior to the finalization of the bill. And since the bill was introduced into this honorable house and had its first reading, we held additional consultation sessions. We held separate meetings with farmers and fishers on Tortola on the 31st of January and 2nd of February 2022, respectively. We conducted a virtual public stakeholder meeting on the 7th of February 2022. We also held meetings on the sister islands of Virgin Gorda, Anigara, and Jas Van Dyke. I wish to thank all persons who attended the stakeholder consultations and for the feedback they provided, Mr. Speaker. The input was very useful, and during the committee stage, I will raise some of the issues raised and seek to incorporate some of the feedback we received. Mr. Speaker, as indicated earlier, it has taken us a while to get to this stage. At some point, I got a bit frustrated, frustrated with the length of time it was taken, but one thing I can say for sure, Mr. Speaker, we were extremely thorough with this legislation and we went through all the required steps. I would like to thank the consultant, Mr. George debort Ramali, for providing the initial draft and the Attorney General's Chambers for finalizing the, the draft. I also wish to express my sincere gratitude to my team in the ministry, the permanent secretary, Mrs. Carolyn Stout Igwe, and Assistant Secretary, Mrs. Tessa Smith Claxton, and the Director of Agriculture and Fisheries, Mr. Theodore James, and his team for the support given throughout this process and all others who assisted in some way, shape, or form. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to the debate on this important bill and to eventually get this bill passed in this honorable house. Mr. Speaker, I thank you and I submit this bill for my colleagues' debate. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise to second the motion and I resolve my uh, comments for a later state. Thank you. The bill has been moved and seconded. The floor is now open for debate. I recognize the Deputy Speaker and Territorial Member, the Honorable Neville A. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support this bill. Mr. Speaker, a lot has been said about agriculture, fishing, but a lot has not been done. Now, this is what you call putting your mouth, putting your hand with your mouth, yourself in place to get things done and I think this is a very good bill that we could start on and build on. There's a lot of things that need to be done to correct what's been going on when it comes to fishing and agriculture. Mr. Speaker, by looking at this bill too, I want to ask a question. I want to say something in this bill because I heard a lot of the fishermen making a, a statement saying that um, sometimes when they, they're going fishing and their boat break down, they cannot they're not able or allowed to go and borrow another boat and go out. I don't know if that is true, if I'm saying the wrong thing. But 
But these are the things that we have to make sure in this bill that we picked up on. Because if a fisherman cannot go to his shops and attend to them, we're going to create something call a ghost trap sometime because they may lose their traps, which is one of the most dangerous things that we have going on right now. So if, if, if it's not in this bill, I haven't seen mention of it, we have to make sure that we fix it a lot that winters a fisherman boat broke down, he should be able to go and borrow other colleague boat. And also what that does, it, it enhances the partnership with other fishermen. It's not a competition. You know, they're all trying to have food for everybody to eat. So we have to be careful of what we create in terms of that, because if they leave their fish traps out there for a certain amount of time, they lose them as well. So that's the one thing I would hope that when we go through this whole bill that we could see things like that. And also we could talk about the spare fishing, Mr. Speaker, where there's a lot of young men around here who, who does that. And there's a few people who, done it, who does it for a living. They grew up doing it that way and we have to speak to that and make sure that we put some sort of fixture to that as well, Mr. Speaker. And it's also a tourism product. I mean, I stay, sometimes I sit at home and I watch a lot of the YouTubers showing, you know, diving and catching laps and catching fish. It's a big, the, the kind of views that they get is, a, is very high. And you can imagine we have some very, very good divers there locally, free divers, who go out there and they free dive and you won't believe what they come back with. You know, so we have to be careful what we're doing, but we still have to protect what we're doing as well. Because sometimes people say that a spare gun fishing is more harm to the reef, which I think is wrong, because when you set a fish by a fish trap and that fish trap goes missing, it's more, it's more hazard than anything else than to the, the, shore, the reefs and shores as well. A, a, spare gun, a, spare, a spare gun person goes on and he's not going to destroy the reef because they catch his fish. So he's going to make sure to protect the reef as well. So we have to be careful what we're saying and how we have it out there because when did you talk about fish traps? That's one of the most dangerous things we have out in the water right now. You know, so one of the things I'd like to say again also is that there's some sort of mechanism put in place that when somebody lost the trap, lose the trap, it can be tracked. Some sort of device can be attached to those traps, a locator, that when those traps go missing, that we could find them. We have to find ways to also to make sure that that happens because a lot of times you might not find them. And like I said, that's more dangerous than anything else. So we have to make sure that we create, put things like that in the law, that there's some sort of mechanism that we can find some de location device on the traps, because I know most of the fishermen are using GPS to find the fish, but as well, they set them with GPS as well. But depends on terms of a hurricane, you can't use a GPS to find a fish, but after it goes missing. So we need to put things like that in place. Mr. Speaker, I'm not gonna stay long on this because um, it's a big bill. There's a lot we have to go through this bill. I know it was a lot of consultants went, went wrong. Different, I think the, the minister came from just when they just the other day discussing the bill. So it's, it's not a bill that was out there and nobody had a chance to read it. But in every bill, Mr. Speaker, you will have some changes. You may come in and make some adjustments after we go to the public and we get some feedback and we come and make some changes. So this bill is not going to be a walkthrough bill. It was a well-thing bill, and I'm looking forward to the, the committee stage where we could sit down and go through this bill, class by class, and make any changes or adjustments that need to be made to get us forward. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Deputy Speaker for his contributions. The floor remains open for debate on the Virgin Islands Food and Security and Sustainability Act 2022. I recognize the Junior Minister for Trade and Economic Development and Territorial Member, the Honorable Shireen D. Flex Charles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of this bill. It is important, Mr. Speaker, to note that persons really started to pay a lot more attention to agriculture and fishing when the pandemic began, 
you saw an upsurge of, of farming and fishing. Horses were more cognizant of the fact that they needed to stay healthy as well. And uh, because shipping was also compromised, horses looked to the local farmers and fishermen. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you I usually have a salad at this time of the afternoon when I'm at home or in the office. And Mr. Speaker, I am proud to say that the only thing in that salad bowl that is not produced in the BVI or grown in the BVI would be the croutons. When you look at the imports, I, I, I go mainly to tomatoes and cucumbers. 99% of the times, Mr. Speaker, when you go to the supermarket and pick those two items up, if you don't use them the same day or the next, they are of no use to you. I've had the opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to purchase eggs um, from Anagadian um, farmers. I have seen where the Minister for Natural Resources and the 9th District Rep have purchased quite a lot of dozens of eggs from Anagada to donate to the food pantry at the Methodist Church on Virgin Gorda. So there's potential, Mr. Speaker, and so we must put things in place for sustainability of the industry and security as well. We also have to look at the technological aspects and the new technologies that are out there for farming as well as fishing. I myself have done some research, Mr. Speaker, on the container farming. And for, I think that we need to pay a little bit more focus and attention to that, Mr. Speaker. I had the opportunity to speak at length with P.S. Uh, Igwe, Stout Igwe, on, on that particular topic. And I, I found that she is very knowledgeable on that topic. And it is something that we need to, to incorporate and introduce to our young farmers. Uh, most of the farmers that are, I would say, between, um, let's say, 18 and 40, are very technologically inclined. And it is something that we need to look at introducing to them, not leaving out the older, more mature farmers. They can, while some are uh, set in their ways, with the traditional way of farming, Mr. Speaker, we also need to incorporate a combination of the new technologies along with the old traditions. As it relates to fishing, Mr. Speaker, during the pandemic as well, you saw persons reaching out to fishermen from Anagara to Jasmine Dyke. I was able to I'm a lover of the flatfish, as most everybody knows, and I had to go as far as Joss Van Dyke to make sure that I had that particular securing our borders and policing our borders to ensure that our fishermen are able to reap the benefits of our waters and not anyone else. Many times, I remember years ago, Mr. Speaker, we saw a big spread in one of the major international sports fishing magazines. And it spoke about a different territory, but all of the pictures were in BVI waters. So we have to make sure that we police our borders, protect our borders, and in turn, that would protect the livelihood of our sports fishermen and women 
as well as our traditional fishermen. So on that note, Mr. Speaker, I fully support this um, bill. I know in committee we will have um, hearty debate, but at the end of the day, we will come to solutions that will work for the entire territory, for the fishermen and farmers, to ensure that all of us feel safe and comfortable and that we're secure, knowing that we are able to put food on our tables, that when you walk into the supermarkets, that we're not looking at empty shelves as we are seeing now. And everyone, Mr. Speaker, is, is worried, yes, about the war in the Ukraine and the effects it, that can have on us as did the pandemic in terms of shipping and, and importing goods and, more importantly, food into the territory. And so this act, when passed and assented to, will ensure that we move in that direction to secure food and to have a sustainable fisheries and agricultural industry in the Virgin Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the territorial member for her contributions. The floor is still open. With no member catching my eyes to speak, I call. I recognize the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor, and Immigration, and member for the Ninth District, the Honorable Vincent O. Whitley. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunities to opportunity to say just a few words on what I think is an incredible bill. Mr. Speaker. This country and this world is full of problems. And it always asks me when I heard people say, if you only do just this, all will be well. You could then say in Kumbaya. Just because these are complex problems that require complex solutions. And I must commend the minister, because I know, Mr. Speaker, he has been under a lot of pressure to do something about agriculture and fishing. I've been hearing for the last three years, but it's important that we understand when you approach a complex problem, you must bring a complex solution. Mr. Speaker, this, this is a hefty bill. It's a hefty bill. It's not bringing a band-aid to a serious surgery. This is bringing serious tools to address something that we should all be very, very concerned about, especially in a time like this, Food Security and Sustainability Act. Mr. Speaker, you, you know what food security is? Everybody throws around this word here, food security. You hear it all the time, food security, food security. But do you know what it really means? Mr. Speaker, I took a little time to look at a few definitions that I found around the place. And I like this one here, food security, having at all times both physical and economic access, physical and economic access to sufficient food to meet dietary needs for a productive, productive and healthy life. Look at the key words there. Physical and economic access, sufficient food, dietary needs, productive and healthy life. A family is food secure when its members do not live in fear of hunger or hunger. You are either in hunger or fear of hunger. When you're food secure, those things don't come into play. People think food security is simply growing food. It's more than just growing food. Because if you can grow food where stem and a person in the garden can't get it, a person still isn't food secure. Food security, people think food security means I don't import anything. 
I grow every single thing that I need. No, that is not food security. That is something else. You can be food secure and don't grow a single tomato. Once you make sure you have access to it, you must have access to the food. You know that you yourself must take on the burden of trying to grow every single thing that your economy needs. Every single country in the world imports something. So food security is about growing every single thing you need. It's about having access, financial and physical access, to things that you need. Mr. Speaker, the bill covers everything. It's a comprehensive approach. Because, Mr. Speaker, we have to look at, let's, let's take a one at a time. Let's look at fisheries. We have our fisheries going on for many, many years. We are, we are our seafaring people. But Mr. Speaker, we have 200 nautical miles of water that belongs to the BVI. But if you look at the maps, all fishermen tend to go no more than maybe 20 miles out, 180 more, miles over there that we don't even venture into. This bill gives us a, a map, a road map, of how we could begin to explore more of our waters. You know the map for the, for the deputy speaker said, and the, uh, the junior minister, other boats come into our waters and catch our fish. But they ain't really catching all fish, because fish move around freely in water. They're catching fish in our waters. That is correct. We have to be able to go out there and do the same thing. This bill addresses that. It addresses, Mr. Speaker, I mean, I was small. You could walk the seashore. You could see conks, wilks, small fish, shellfish, turtles. Not so anymore. So we have to protect our stock. We have to first assess our stock and then move towards protecting our stock. It's captured in here. If you're gonna do fishing on a sustainable basis, you want the fishermen to be more professional in what to do and more dedicated to what you do. So you have your, if your fishing units. Fisherman, he goes fishing, the, the landing sites. He comes in with Enagada, Vojangada, Western, Rotong, he drops off his fish. They're bought immediately and paid, taken to a centralized market by the authority. And the fishermen, instead of getting in the back of a truck, going around blowing a conch shell, trying to sell his fish, the fisherman is back in the ocean. We want our fishermen to be fishermen, not fishermen, salesmen, and so forth. That is captured in here. That's what you call a comprehensive approach, Mr. Speaker to a problem, not a band-aid, superficial approach. Yes, that's taken a while, but these things don't happen overnight, Mr. Speaker. They call for resources, and they call for intention to get this thing done. So I commend the minister and his team. Mr. Speaker, continuing on fish, fishing. The Deputy Speaker raised a very important point that it concerns me greatly, and it's the issue of, of lobster traps, uh, fish traps. Will they catch both anyway? fish traps as traditional around here. And the fishermen, and I don't blame them, to make it more economic, they get as sturdy a trap as possible. So they don't rot in the territory too quickly. So you can have a trap for years catching fish. You ain't gonna buy no wire, you ain't gonna buy nothing. Got a trap is sturdy. But Mr. Speaker, also remember that all waters here are used for more than just fishing. We are the sailing capital of the world. So you have all these boats sailing through our waters, and sometimes these traps are caught in the, the boat's propellers. And what I've seen now, these fancy boats have a special little rod under them, specifically designed to cut fish part trap ropes off. It prevents the rope from going into the propeller. There's a little rod under the boat with a hook on it. The minute it hits a rope, it cuts the rope off, so the rope never gets in the propeller. Well, that trap is now lost. Even with GPS, the traps tend to move. The trap is now lost. And sometimes the fishermen, they string up maybe 20 traps on only one buoy. So when you go to the one buoy, you have 20 traps. So if you lose that one buoy in that instance, 20 traps are now lost. Fish, on average, live about three days 
in a fish pot without food. After three days, they'd eat themselves or die. When they die in that fish trap, guess what happens? They attract other fish. They attract other fish. And so there's a vicious cycle of death right in our oceans. I don't know how many ghost traps are there. I don't know if the members are required to register all the traps at all times, but it is covered in hair because each fisherman who puts a trap on that bottom of the ocean should be made accountable for it, for its location at all times. If I register 20 traps, at all times I must know where those 20 traps are. I must know. This bill addresses that because these become killing machines, killing our ocean. Is there 100 traps out there or 1,000? We don't know. Are we going to continue to guess about these things? Are we going to ensure that when you bring a bill forward, the bill addresses this concern? Mr. Speaker, we have to look at our reefs. Like I said earlier this morning, I went to a workshop where the gentleman from the North, let me say that, the South Atlantic Environment Research Institute for training some local guys to monitor our, our coral reefs and when they discover diseases, how to treat these various diseases. Our reefs have been under attack for a very long time. But the reefs are the lifeblood of the oceans. That's where the fish that we eat feed. So we have to make sure that we aren't ourselves contributing to the deterioration of these reefs. Now, we have to look at what fish we catch and don't catch. We have to pay attention to say, just because in most Caribbean countries, they don't catch parrot fish anymore. Because the parrot fish serves as cleaners of these reefs. They keep the reefs clean and healthy. Now, they taste okay to me, but they're very easy to catch. So people like to catch the parrot fish. They're slow, they're sluggish. So they used to catch. But if you get to a point where we start saying, no, 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 this particular fish here, you can't catch anymore. That one there, you can't catch anymore. So we have seasons for some fishes now. The question is, do we expand that or what? This here addresses that. The Deputy Speaker also mentioned the issue of spear fishing. And the fishermen have been, have been crying out for years. The catch was banned some years ago. Can we get specialized licenses? Can we do this? It's dangerous to go diving in certain areas because we are attacked by sharks. I can kind of pick and choose exactly which fish I want. This here allows us, to, again, to relook that decision and to decide how best, if at all, to go about dealing with spear fishing. It should be treated like any other dangerous weapon. License only, carried particular ways, and used in specific areas. Mr. Speaker, we move to the land, and again, we, we've seen since the pandemic a lot of interest in agriculture. We have a lot of talk in agriculture. Some interest, some persons have been doing a phenomenal job, an excellent job in farming. I was on a farm, I think January 14th, KNK poultry farm, had a tiny chickens, and I couldn't believe six weeks later, I had one in my freezer. That's serious business. But I came because the government, we had taken food security seriously. And we did all that we could to support that young man and his team to do what he's doing. Everybody was laughing when we started creating the stimulus for farmers, stimulus for fishermen. Because some person only had an interest, but they didn't have the support to do it. Some of those persons who never fished before are now fishing. And everybody laughed at it. Oh, what are you all growing all this food for? But now with the war between Russia and Ukraine, all of a sudden everybody, well, thank God you all had to do that back then. Well, thank God I started fishing then. Thank God you all did X, Y, Z then. This because it can be short-sighted in a war like this here with something like food security, and you can't just talk about it. At some point in time, you got to stop the talking, do something. And here is where we are today. When we listen to the cries, the minister did consultation every part of the BVA from Enegada to Jasper Neck and all over Tartola. 
So we have gotten great, great input. The speaker, I wouldn't get into the details of this act here. I know committee stage with plenty of time to go through the various aspects of this bill here. Food security, Mr. Speaker, cannot be just a, a thing we talk about. It must be something you put money behind and legislation and time and energy. And a good minister has done just that. And he has my full support going forward. God, Mr. Speaker, technology is on the rise with agriculture. There used to be a famous um, song a long time ago, Computer Don't Grow Tomato. Computer don't eat tomato, but they can sure help you grow tomato. We have to use technology in agriculture these days. The days of requiring 10 acres of land for something, those days are almost gone. You can do that. You can do almost the same thing now in a trailer with modern techniques, more direct uh, marketing of your product. In some places, you have uh, farmers growing one crop, but the crop is grown for a particular business. I'm growing this crop for that bit. So there's no wastage. You're not growing to, to guess, am I going to get it sold or not? These things are pretty much pre-sold, and you could do that with technology in a trailer these days. Any crop you want to grow, strawberries, grapes, onions, you name it. You can grow it right in your backyard. You don't need 10 acres of land anymore. Just because I grew up in a agrarian society before we moved into tourism, where the cow, cow was king back in the day. And I grew up and I met my father <laughs> rearing cows. I always thought it was, it was funny because I watched my father behind these cows from call up Mac Hill to South Song and every two or three years he would kill a cow to make $800. So I could do the, the, the mathematics. I say, what are you doing is a waste of time. This money can't do much now. But he grew up seeing his father rearing cows. But back in that day, when they were rearing, when the cow was king, you could have sold a cow and buy an acre of land. You can't do that now. You can't buy no cow, sell no cow, and buy land. Long gone. Those days are long gone. Rain cow now almost for fun, I believe. You rain a cow now, maybe because you, you, you like it, you feel nostalgic about cow, so you up and down behind a cow. But we have to keep with technology. We have moved beyond that, Mr. Speaker. We have moved beyond chasing a cow to make $700. Unless you can have three or 4,000 cows, land like Guyana, where you have thousands of acres of land and grass, you could do that. With the weather pattern changing, where rainfall is less, and so forth. We have to get into technology. As I said, you can get these nice trailers now to grow any crop. And if you're savvy and a good businessman, you link that particular crop to a particular business. You go to Rotom and say, I can grow all the onions you need, only onions. But you have to sign something here. Every month I guarantee you a thousand pounds of onions. You could take it off your import list. The speaker, the bill addresses that. So persons can make a living, go back to the point in time, you can actually make a living out of agriculture, out of fishing. Even fish farming is something that persons are looking at to grow cobia, to grow uh, tilapia. I think to grow, what, what do you call them, commercial fish? Not commercial, but the decorative fish, like the goldfish and so forth. There's big money in these things. Everybody likes like to have goldfish in their house. That's a business. Fish only, only, only for eating. People like to have little things, fish in the house. That's a business right there. Not too hard to do. Not too hard to do. The speaker, we have to embrace technology. So as Mr. Speaker, as I wrap here, I want to commend the minister for really taking the time out to bring a comprehensive bill. I want to thank all the farmers out there who have stuck with farming, a brighter day, who have stuck with farming, who have stuck with fishing, a brighter day is there. And it's going to come through this instrument here. Mr. Speaker, I fully support this act. Thank you. I thank the member for the 9th District for his contributions. The floor is still open. I recognize the Minister for Health and Social Development and Territorial Member, the Honorable Carvin Malone.
Are you yielding to the transportation minister? Okay, well, the health minister yield to the Minister for Transportation, Works and Utilities and member for the 5th District, the Honorable Kai M. Reimer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I didn't know the member was ready to go, but since he yielded, I, I just want to stand, Mr. Speaker, in, in full support of, of this bill that is before us this afternoon. And, uh, you know, before going into the bill, I need to acknowledge the minister and his team at the ministry for staying resolute in terms of this bill. I know it's been around for a little while. And the minister is, is quite passionate about this bill. Uh, we have seen where he is taking it on the road to throughout the territory getting feedback pertaining to this bill. So, Speaker, I do applaud him, um, especially at a time like this. And we understand how important food sustainability is for, for anywhere in the world, you know, especially us as a territory where we do uh, so much import. We import just about everything. And Mr. Speaker, the, we understand this is a, a hefty bill, uh, quite a huge bill, and I know going through the committee stage it will be a task, but it's quite important that we go through it line by line because this affects the well-being of us uh, as a territory. And Mr. Speaker, I like, I like this bill as well, and I know growing up, I basically grew up into farming. My grandfather, my grandparents, actually. You know, I remember growing up, they would call me farmer boy at some stage. But my grandfather, he was an avid farmer. I, sometime when I, as a young boy, when you drive down Soldier's Hill, and you look across to the left, you would see the whole hillside planted with potatoes and cassavas and yam and tanya, pigeon peas, sugar cane, anything that could be planted and be eaten. My grandfather, he would be, he would plant it. And I'm not sure if farmers these days use the McDonald Almanac. But that was the, the guide, that was their Bible at that time. I think it was about 75 cents for a, a book at that time. And every day you would see when the, the moon would come out and they would choose when they, could, when they should go and farm. And that's when they expected a, a plentiful uh, ripen. I'm not sure if that is used today because you know, when I graduated high school, you know, that my grandparents, they thought it was necessary for me to go away to school. So I, I think the famine kind of died there. And, you know, at times you, you was happy that you didn't have to do it anymore. I knew he had at one stage nearly 100 white sheep. And that was my task of waking up every morning. And taking the sheep out and bringing them back. And if you miss one sheep, you know, he was sending you back for that sheep. And the distance you had to go, you know, sometimes it was half an hour away, sometimes an hour away. But those were the days I, you know, I, I, at that time I thought it was a bit tasking and it wasn't enjoyable. Especially when I, you know, in high school and my, my friends would pass and they see me in, in the school bus, you know, I, I had to, be behind the sheep, but that is what helped to send me to school, and you know, I'm now appreciative of those that hard work. I remember going and having to leave school at certain times to go and pick avocado, avocados, lime, mangoes, those are things that my 
my grandmom and my, my grand, she would take to the market square every Saturday morning. And you know, I, I feel proud here, you know, standing because I, I, I know my grandfather, he was everything. He would even uh, butcher the, the, the livestock himself. You know, he, he, he was a jack of all trades. So Mr. Speaker, you know, I, I know how important farming is. And it's, it's quite pleasing to see that this bill is here. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I know it's a hefty bill. And as we go through this, the, 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 the committee stage, you know, we hope that it will re reduce some of the bureaucracy though, Mr. Speaker, because at times that, that tends to get into our way of, of getting things done. You know, eliminate some of the red tape. Though we are putting a, a, an authority in place and we are moving it from to a, a statutory body. Mr. Speaker, as we see what is happening in the world today, we reflect on the hurricanes of, of 2017 where the, the, the entire hillsides were, you know, gone, wiped away. And, you know, for farmers, that was a, a difficult time. And we saw now where, as we went through the COVID, we were able to give back to some of those farmers, some that, they, you know, they missed during the hurricanes. And for those aspiring farmers and fishers as well, you know, they were able to, to then get more into it. And now you, we see um, persons around the, the territory selling different food and fruits and vegetables and, you know, fishing, you know, it, it's in abundance right now. But well, Mr. Speaker, we need to, what I would encourage the, the minister and his team is to get it back into the schools. I remember where we would go and, and, and plant trees. I think it was Abba Day as well. I'm not sure what, what takes place with that now, but we need to take it back into the schools so that persons could understand how important farming is. And, you know, the, the, the fishermen around the territory, I heard the the deputy speaker spoke about licenses where you want to go out and just do regular fishing. I remember growing up, you know, we would just go out and, and throw a line. But I think things have changed a little bit where they, expect, where they want our persons to be able to, to have a license. But I, I think that could be a two-tiered license and encourage more, you know, commercial fishing and, and, and so forth. And Mr. Speaker, I, I, I am aware uh, to the minister as well that as we go through, as we're going through this, this situation out in the Ukraine right now, I know there is, there's a meeting to be had with the OECS where they are trying to include all the Caribbean islands to be able to trade at a minimal cost or at, at no cost. I'm, I'm not sure what the details are, but that is exciting to hear because, you know, when you have um, different Caribbean islands, they, they, they produce various things in abundance. We can be able to, to share and, and trade amongst each other and you know, depend less on, on the importation from the US and, and other places. I know they're, especially down in Guyana, I think they're willing to, to give us free, uh, free stuff so that we can plant here within the territory. I, thought, I think those are opportunities where we need to, to jump on. We need to take, take advantage of, of those opportunities. And you know, it, it's, it's great to hear that we have that opportunity. But you know, if we don't get persons excited about farming and fishing, excited about doing it, you know, then the, those opportunities will pass. So I, I, I suggest as, as we went through the COVID, now we see a lot more backyard farming and you know, we got more fishermen. You know, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm sure we will be able to meet that mandate in terms of sustaining ourselves as a territory with, with food security. And you know, Mr. Speaker, you know, when, when, those, when we get to the genesis of those, those opportunities, then we'll be able to, to reap the benefits. And, you know, within the, 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 the body, we should be able to put quotas in place where 
you know, especially for persons farming locally, you know, we'll be able to, to say we limit import on certain things and be able to utilize what we have here within the territory. Mr. Speaker, I know, I, I just want to make mention of one part in the, in the, in the bill, and that, that is a part that speaks to the functions of the authority. And Mr. Speaker, I will go through the functions quite quickly, if you permit me to, Mr. Speaker. The functions of the authority shall be to support the sustainable and economically viable development of the agriculture and fisheries business within the territory. Another function is to promote, organize, and develop fishing, fishing industries, fisheries businesses, and fishing resources within the territory. Coordinate and develop agri agricultural production, agricultural marketing, and agricultural businesses in the territory. Assist the Agriculture and Fisheries Authority in the formulation of a national policy and plans with respect to the sustainable and economically viable development of the agriculture and fisheries business in the territory and in the implementation of that policy. Develop and implement a business plan to support the implementation of the policy and strategy for sustainable agricultural production, food security, and food formulating under Section 10.1. Conduct negotiations or engage in meetings, seminars, or discussions with regard to the sustainable and economically viable development of the agriculture and fisheries business in the territory, whether at a national or international level, on behalf of the territory or otherwise. In conjunction with the Ministry responsible for national, natural resources and the environment and the unit, they are to promote, organize, and develop fishing, fishing industries, fishing resources, and for the purpose of to facilitate and coordinate the re registration of licensing of vessels and fishers and the promotion of local fisheries management groups. Maintain and make available to government agencies and the public information concerning marine ecosystem, fish catches, fish stocks, fishing vessels, and licenses issued under this act and regulations. Provide support and assistance to local licensed farmers and fishers in the development and operation of farming and fishing industries, including the provision of financing for the procurement of farm equipment, livestock, fishing vessels, and equipment, and to support the establishment and delivery of microfinance and microinsurance schemes to address risk from extreme events, disasters, and climate change. Manage any incentives provided by the government to assist farmers and fishers, especially in time of emergency or disaster. And in this regard, the authority shall have the capacity and, and ability to receive and manage disaster-related assistance and to dispense item at prefer preferential rates, discounted rates, such as, but not limited to, farm equipment, seedings, livestock, fuel, gear, engines, engine parts, and boats, and identify and undertake the manpower training requirements with regard to the sustainable and economically viable development of, ag of the agriculture and fisheries business uh, within the territory. The body also will provide, operate, and maintain services and facilities in the territory for the rearing, processing, and sale of domestic livestock and locally reared fish. Provide for the sound management of domestic animals, pests, and diseases. 
take up such action in relation to the ex exercise of any of its functions mentioned, in, mentioned above included, but not limited to collaborate as directed by the unit in the implementation of any fisheries con conservation measures that are established, provide food safety inspections at the port and at food production centers, including slaughterhouses and food processing plants, uh, the control of pests and diseases, the control of gene genetically modified or organisms and the living modified organisms controlling the use of pesticide and fertilizers through life cycle management of such substances, managing abattoirs, undertaking pre- and post-mortem inspection for livestock, manage nuisance livestock and domestic animals, and manage animal welfare, and take such action in relation to the exercise of any of the function mentioned above. Mr. Speaker, this is important to understand what the functions and the, the powers that the body would have. And I know persons may ask why not use what we have right now in terms of the Agriculture Department or the Fisheries Department. But well, Mr. Speaker, what this will do would take the bureaucracy away from having to go through the policies of government and, and give more autonomy to this board to be able to, to manage the affairs of the fisheries and the agricultural department. Mr. Speaker, this is, this is important. And this is what we'll see coming up with the, um, the Water and Sewage Act as well, because we see at times where you go out there and you want to achieve something immediately, but then you have to go through the processes. You have to go through and get permission to do certain things, whereas you would have more autonomy and more ability to be able to rectify some issues that should be done immediately. And Mr. Speaker, while not in any manner limiting to the generality of, of, the, of the subsection one, the function of the authority shall be able to provide for the effective management and sustainable development of the fisheries of the territory in accordance with the relevant international convention and treaties to which the territory is a signatory and internationally recognized norms, standards, and best practices, including the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries 1995. And Mr. Speaker, as we speak about fisheries, you know, I, I, I know right now we have our fishermen and, and, and the fishermen and they, they go out there and they make their catch, especially those long liners. I know, you know, right now, I, I remember there was a time where, you know, fish, fishers from, fishermen from other jurisdictions would come into our waters, come into our waters, catch our fish, and, you know, we, we usually as a territory we like to go overseas and go various places to, to buy certain things. So, you know, we would make the trip and go elsewhere and, and, and still purchase the fish that was catch in our waters. I know I, I've been in conversation with some of the fishermen, you know, and they say, who frequent our waters right now, you know, maybe 100 miles out, at the Japanese trawlers and, and those persons from um, China and all those places. And, you know, the fishermen, they are a bit concerned right now because their, their catch is a bit reduced. And, Mr. Speaker, I hope within this, this bill the, the, they would be able to do more monitoring of our waters, though it's, it's a ways out, it's important for us to um, maintain what we have and not overfish our waters. So that is a task, uh, Mr. Speaker, the minister, you would make sure that that is taken, that, that is observed and, you know, so that when our fishermen actually get those trawlers and those big boats and they go out and they do those fishing out there, you know, they will be able to bring back a healthy catch so that we'll be able to sustain ourselves and our restaurants and our hotels and, and, and so forth. So that, that is important, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, some of the, the powers of the authority 
um, subject to this act, they would be able to acquire, purchase, hold and lease land and buildings. They would be able to develop and manage all land, including crown lands, leased, leased to or vested in the authority. They would be able to own, lease, or dispose of property, both movable or removable, including any vessel. They would be able to own and manage docks and fish landing sites, own and manage abattoirs and fish processing facilities, construct and manage buildings, establish, operate, and maintain information management systems, operate seed banks, promote and support mixed cropping, organic and other sustainable farming practices, promote and support mixed cropping, organic, and other sustainable farming practices, promote and support the protection of traditional food protection, food production areas. Um, they would be able to act as agent for the purpose of the management of any agricultural or fishery business or enterprise or for any other purpose and hold shares in or debentures of any company and carry on any business or enterprise for, for a, with their connection with fisheries or farming, processing, transporting, handling. So the, Mr. Speaker, they have a, a, a quite a few, a, a broad scope in which they, they can able to, to operate. Mr. Speaker, I know it, the question may be asked how they would be able to sustain this or even get off the ground. We understand that at the initial stage, the government would have to give a subvention at some sort. But Mr. Speaker, too, with the, the money, services money, I know two of the clauses where we collected the 7% was attributed to fisheries at some stage and farming. And uh, I am not sure how much money is in there right now, but that is a good start up right now for this authority to get off the ground and running. Because if there's ever a time that we need, food sustainability is now. And we need to get our people excited about it, those that are ambitious about farming, those that are ambitious about fishing, you know, with the passage of this bill, we would hope that everything flows into in place so that we can make sure that, you know, this is, is taken care of. And Mr. Speaker, I know at this stage, you know, coming into uh, this seat in 2019, we've heard the cries of the farmers at Parakita Bay. And Mr. Speaker, it's not for the want of us not trying because we've expended quite a lot of resources in Parakita Bay especially to run new lines, run new infrastructure so that persons have the, the access to water. And before that, we had a, a cistern where the, 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 the sewage plant is there in Parakita Bay that we utilized briefly where it held 150,000 gallons and Mr. Speaker, where we know there was a problem with the infrastructure is that once that reservoir was filled, once that system was, was filled, it only took two hours for that water to, once you turn it on, two hours and the water disappeared. The water, we, the water just flew into the ground. So what we did is run new pipes, Mr. Speaker, we ran, and, and I must acknowledge that the guys from the Water and Sewage Department that came through Spring Gut and through the hill to run new pipes so that those farmers would be able to get uh, water. And what is to be done next is that a reservoir would be built in the area so that, you know, we have water available for the farmers. And Mr. Speaker, yes, we understand that it was a long-standing issue, but you know, we, we, we can't rely on, on that anymore. We need to do what it takes to make sure that the farmers have access to, to water as much as necessary. And Mr. Speaker, with money services fund that is available, 
I'm sure when, when the, the minister gets up to speak, he would explain exactly how much money, how it was sectioned off. I think there were uh, five different sections for the 7% collected, and, uh, and exports was even involved in that, but we're speaking now of, of fisheries and farming. And I think at one stage, I heard there was probably about four or $500,000 in the account. So that, that should be a good start to get some of these things going for, for this, this, this authority. And it's in millions? So it, it'll be good to confirm that number, um, Mr. Speaker, when uh, the minister comes and, and do his wrap up. But Mr. Speaker, I am excited about this bill. I definitely look forward to to seeing more of our hillsides with potatoes and cassavas and, and different trees. I know we do a lot of imports right now, but Mr. Speaker, our soil is rich for farming, and we just need to have the, the ability or, or have that with about us to go and, and do it right here. We have a lot of young persons in our community, and if we need to offer incentives so that they can go out there and do some farming, or we need to have whether it's training in, in terms of how to do a, a row, how to do, how to um, get the, the farming done, I think that is necessary. We have taken it upon ourselves to, to give this stimulus grant to the fishers and farmers, and you know, some may say that it, it went to the wrong persons who are not fishers or who are not farmers, but we have ambitious persons. Persons cry out and say that they want to get into this, and we offer the, the, the funding necessary for them to go and purchase whatever uh, was necessary, whether it's for the boat, whether it's for engines, whether it's for um, fencing, seedlings. You know, some persons may have utilized it the for other reasons, but the intentions, the intention was pure. And, you know, we, 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 we are seeing the benefit, and most definitely with this bill being in place and the authority being in place, we are hoping to see that us as a territory would have access to uh, food, because, you know, I, as we speak about access, Mr. Speaker, I remember when my grandmother, she would load up the vehicle, my uncle, um, I think it was a Grand Cherokee at that time, in, back in the day, loaded with food, and quite often, my grandmother, what she didn't sell, she would give away. Um, she would give away, and that, that is what we grew up knowing. Persons would be there, and she would say, no, you, you take that. You know, and I remember when my grandmother, when she started to get down a little bit, she said, Kai, you could imagine that I have to now go to the supermarket to buy a uh, Hannah banana, when bananas at that time was knocking dog. You know, that's what you used to feed the, the pigs with, because it had so much banana and, and mangoes and, and, and various things. And we need to get back to that. We most definitely need to get back to that and as this government and putting this this in place and knowing the road show that the minister went on i'm hope that he converted persons in terms of getting into fishing or getting into farming so mr speaker i applaud the minister i applaud the minister and his team and you know i i again i'm in full support and you know before i sit down i i, I remember a years back when the former minister for labor, I think it was, was for labor, he spent a, a few million dollars for some greenhouses. And, you know, back in, back in those, those years back, persons laughed at it, like, you know, you're going to spend this set of money on, on, on greenhouses. But now, if we had those greenhouses going, Mr. Speaker, we would have been able to sustain ourselves and even export, because that is what I grew up you know, and my grandparents, they would export. They would go to St. Thomas. They would, you know, supply the USVI with, with, with food and go to other places. So hearing that we had the greenhouses here, we expended the money for them. We expended the money for the greenhouses, 
and we just sat and let them, let the greenhouses just, you know, I, I guess it was after we came, they were blown away. But we never got to reap nothing from those greenhouses. And that is the technology that many other jurisdictions are using right now in terms of planting, in terms of, of, of providing food for, for, for their people. You know, but, you know, we have to come out of playing politics and, and when it's a good idea, we, we, we must, whether the government change, we must continue on with it. And I'm sure now if we had those greenhouses, we would be able to, um, you know, grow something up there by now so that whether we had it in abundance or we use it for export, we would have had um, something. So, Mr. Speaker, though it's going to be a long night in terms of going through the committee stage and, and, and the debates, Mr. Speaker, I, proud, I stand proudly in support of this bill and I look forward to it coming to fruition after being assented and seeing reaping the benefits of the hard work of this bill. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. I thank the member for the 5th District for his contribution. I recognize the Minister for Health and Social Development and Territory Member, the Honorable Corbin Malone. I would like to thank you very much for affording me the opportunity to make this presentation on this bill entitled Virgin Islands Food Security and Sustainability Act 2022. Now, lest I forget, let me congratulate the minister and I want his undivided attention at this point. I want to congratulate the minister for his persistence, for bringing this forward, for working on this bill. I know he has been working on it since, was it December of 2019? And he had been working hard and consistently. Mr. Speaker, um, there's nothing in this country that gets done without passion. Whether it is bringing in secondary education, tertiary education, building of the administration building, building of the college, building of all institutions, wherever they are, they can only be done with passion and he would not know this, but I was sitting around the lunch table with the gentleman and you don't know whether he's happy, glad, sad, or mad. His expression doesn't change. But this is a big deal. And if I were him, I, I, I would have more um, expression. I'll be touching the roof every so often because he have endured. So, Mr. Speaker, my contribution, I, I, I want to go ahead and invite everyone to get closer. Come, get your, turn your radios on. Turn the TV on. Turn, go to Facebook. YouTube, is it on YouTube also? Um, Mr. Cox, is this on YouTube also? YouTube, turn into YouTube. Yeah, just a little closer. Because... When you, uh, well, before I even start that, I, I have one confession. I told my wife this morning that I'll be rather nice all day today. I didn't know that this was coming up. I didn't know this was coming up. I thought this was going to be delayed until next week. So I had all intention of being totally nice. But, so she had to excuse me going into this. Those same people that killed agriculture, killed fisheries, kill everything they had is, is on the radio every morning talking about, Minister, what are you doing? How could it be? How could it be? You see, my members, they don't like me when I say I've been to a few of these rodeos. 
Now, I know what I mean by it, and they will come to learn what I mean by it, because I was around when the late Omar Wallace Hodge had this vision of the same greenhouses of what the members spoke about. I was around when they laughed him out of town, but it's only by persistence he actually got them up and still being ridiculed up to today. I was there. I was there when the late Omar Wallace Hodge had the vision of the fisherman wharf in Bargus Bay. And the honorable member for the six, when she get up, and she must, she would say this was a dream of his, it was a dream of hers, and she could not get it moved. She, up to today, praises the minister um, for natural resources for coming to assistance even before there was a dream of anything, up to greener pastures. Even before. But these are not made up stuff. Look at the proof. What was done? Code blue. Code blue in the hospital is when you are in the most advanced ward in the hospital. Code blue on agriculture. Code blue on fisheries. Dead. Mouth to mouth resuscitation couldn't do this. So the minister had to start from start. He had to start from the very beginning. Now, if you think this is any small thing, according to those boys, you look, um, you look at what bills, because he spoke lightly of this stuff. I, I was looking for him to be an hour long in the introduction of this, but let me help him a bit, because he wants to, well, he have a rap time anyway. What all does this bill repeal? Chapter 88, Animals, Importation, and Diseases Ordinance. Chapter 93, Plant Protection Ordinance. Chapter 94, Protection and Animals Act, uh, the Fisheries Act, number four of 1997. Slaughterhouses Act, number eight of 2001. Dogs, Prevention of Injury to Persons, Livestock, and Poultry Act, 14 of 21. Uh, Pounds and Livestock Act number 19 of 2004. And they said, notwithstanding the provisions of subsection 1, the following shall remain in force in effect. The animals, importation and disease regulations. The a whole host of acts and bills that this is going through. This takes time. If there was a blueprint for this, then he would not have had to start from scratch if there was a blueprint. There was no blueprint left. And Mr. Speaker, are you aware as to what occurred just a few months after he engaged consultants to assist in this? The global pandemic. The global pandemic, it was declared this in March. We were locked down, couldn't move, quarantined. And when you hear folks talk, and you know, one legislator used to say, it irks me, but I wouldn't say that. They, because when you hear folks talk, they'll say, well, three years, three years, and now, they come in with a Food Security and Sustainability Act. Three years. One year short of one third of how much time they had to kill it. 2011 to 2019. Eight years. And in three years, we were able to bring an all-encompassing act to deal with this. So I want to make sure and I am not going to let myself forget, nor anyone else, that this took a lot of work to get to here. This is the base, this is the plan, and any administration coming from here, down the road, here, into tomorrow,
can take this up and have a road map to food security and sustainability. It is critical that these maps, these road maps are set, Mr. Speaker, because let me just explain. I've been to a few of these rodeos. Mr. Speaker, I hail, and so too are a number, well, almost everyone, because um, the immediate speaker before me spoke of his grandparents. There's not one of us that don't have a history of farming in our families. But I have a unique perspective to it because I had an uncle, and no matter, once he's finished teaching and head of high schools, sorry, head of um, primary schools, and, and, and uh, you will have to find him in a fishing boat fishing. Big Mac. <laughs> Big Mac, he'll be fishing. Uncle God, his, grand, his, um, his granddad, the fisherman, traditional. I had, um, I had on the other side, well, not on the other side, this side still, because we have lands up in Parakeeta Bay, up the hill. Um, what is it, land above the hill there? Well, honorable leader of the know knows all of the lands. He knows them all. So, um, so the whole thing is that um, spring gut. We look at spring gut. Big lands, swaps of lands, because these are the lands that our parents work. In fact, in the later days, my uncle, he remembered spring gut. He remembered going there as a kid. So when you're looking for him, you had to remember where he used to be, because he went there. And this is how that disease worked. But this is what they knew. Cattle, ground provisions, fishing, all of this part of our tradition. You come to Road Town and there's a place called George's Hollow. There were no farmer with bigger feet, no farmers with bigger mouth, no farmers that can work the ground better than my grandparents. No, you couldn't buy shoes for him. You had to make it out of built tire. But this is our tradition. This is what we did. So, Mr. Speaker, um, I didn't naturally gravitate to the grounds. I'm looking at it more now than I did in even earlier years. I don't know why. I wouldn't be able to climb the hills if I had taken it from early. But the fact is, is that there, the time has come for us to take agriculture seriously. When we had Hurricane Hugo back, I think it was 88 or 89, 89, I had opined then because I was um, head of the Chamber of Commerce and Hotel Association at the time. We had said, even back then, if Tropical, Crowley, and the others were to miss three consecutive weeks of sailing from America to the Virgin Islands, where would we be? Yesterday, we sat in meetings that looked ahead and said the time is now for us to look at even a better approach to Caribbean integration because at the end of the day, whether it's coming from Guyana or Trinidad or Barbados or um, Guadeloupe or Grenada or any of the islands, we have to make shipping affordable so that whatever it is that the various lands can produce, it could then be traded. If we are going to be most proficient in fishing, in the fishing stock, 
then why do we want to compete against a place that's more efficient in banana wearing? In yams, cassava, all of the others. We'll have to make sure that we find our niche in this particular market. So when the vessels come up, we can send them down with what we are best at. And if it is that we have found that whether it's phonics or any of the other modern facilities that we can combine and we can then look because what sense would it make to send certain foods to a place that is basically filled with that. So we'll have to find what is best. So Honorable Minister had mentioned that, you know, we have to look in terms of all of the areas, including the analysis of the soils to make sure where we are in terms of what best can we produce? How best can we produce it? I, well, the minister was opining earlier that we go in and visiting chicken farms and other things within his district ministry and when he's busy, we're not waiting until he's done. But no, if he goes, I go. If I go, he goes. This is what I'm saying. At, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's all a teamwork. The producers are happy that they finally have a government who visits the facility. That's what he's happy about. Finally happy about a government that takes. And what did we do? <coughs> what did we do? We made the land available. The storms came. We used the land for you know, easy disposal or bulking of the solid waste. It was so what did we do? We took some money and we engaged some trucks, engaged some excavators, and we cleared the land. If this is where you are going to build it, we don't want you to spend a penny moving a piece of paper. We'll move it for you. Because if you are prepared to go and stretch yourself out to this particular level, then we, as a government, we are prepared to facilitate, do whatever is required. My understanding is that there is another facility that will be going up equal to, if not bigger than, the very same one. So when it comes to chicken and eggs and all of the parts, we are in a better place today than we were last year than we ever have been when it comes to production. My good old family friend, I, I call him family because I grew up with um, Alan and Greg and all the brothers and sisters. So the sheep production, the sheep uh, mining that he does, what was it the white, the, um, yeah, the white sheep? We have to make provisions for all of this, food security, we're talking, we're talking the real deal here now because at the end of the day, we are looking at a war that is going to, if COVID did not disrupt the distribution system before, then what do you have? You have a total disruption that is possible. You take up and open up any paper, any news, and you'll see that the cost of transportation is skyrocketed. The cost of oil, fuel, skyrocketed. That will translate to the chicken tip on your, on your plate. They used to cut the chicken wing in two and sell each piece at a dollar or two. A chicken wing, they cut it in half and tell you, when I go to a chicken wing, now a big guy like me, I said I want four. 
What I look is four halves, two chicken wings. Six dollars, six dollars later. You know what I mean? So this is this is how expensive it's coming. Four pieces. Now it's going to get so bad that one chicken wing is going to get cut in three. <laughs> and they're going to tell you that the tip is only a dollar. Could you imagine this? The late Omar Wallace Hodge, I've been around. He said that food is so expensive, chicken back. Any of you remember any of this? He also said chicken back. Chicken back was so expensive, you used to be able to, to buy chicken back because they, they used to skin it and then throw it away. Now it's the most expensive piece in the supermarket. Can you imagine? They throw away nothing. My aunt had liked the chicken butt, so I know that that would have come expensive too. There's none, there's no part of the chicken that's safe. None. So, Mr. Speaker, this is what occurs. But we have to be mindful that we have to continue to excel in what is best for the particular territory. I was pleased. When did we, when did we have a resumption of the agricultural fair in some form or the other? Was it 19 or 20? 20. 21. We couldn't have it in 20 only because we had the pandemic. We couldn't have it in 20. 21. Some inkling. We were able to take it into the code blue facility, put the things on, bring it up to life. Some sign of life. And now he has to endure the kind of criticism that they want to yield on him. I will listen. I wouldn't call in. But at the end of the day, it is unfair. It's not right. He has a lot of heavy topics to do, and he's dealing with them. But this plan here that I am seeing, um, it, it has 130 pages plus the schedules, so 136 pages. We have 177 chapters, and the two schedules is another six sides. You can't put anyone here without the passion we have to see this through. So this alone owns him another four years, but that is off the record. So this alone gives him a edge up, Mr. Speaker, in terms of seeing this true. His people who were behind him yearned this day that they can say that in addition, because they, they want to call him the medicine man, that will is working everywhere else. But it was not to the isolation of what he was charged to do. Food security and sustainability. Let me tell you what, because um, you know, everybody is a Google expert in health, in education, in agriculture. Well, I do a little research myself, and it says what is required for, so for food security to exist. It says access to safe nutritious and sufficient food is a basic need and should be treated as a human right with priority given to the most vulnerable. Apart from basic nutrition, food security is linked to economic sustainability, stability, long-term health, women, empowerment, and the environment. This is what food security covers. So you know, Mr. Minister, that this was all of this is what you were doing? <laughs> I mean, it's, 
Now you can see why it took as long, notwithstanding the pandemic. Apart from basic nutrition, food security is linked to economic stability, long-term health, women's empowerment, and the environment. If you have land, if you have food security, if you can feed yourself even in the midst of the worst pandemic, worst natural disaster, you have a safe place. No need to go looting. You're secured. No need to do all of those things that will, will render you a criminal. You have your land. You have your house. You have your backyard garden. You have a particular minister who's working to make sure that all the fish that the 200 miles give you, it will give you. He's going to build. He is going to build and construct the depository establishment required in order to, to yield everything that is done. We know these things, and yet we go up and we spew all of this stuff for people to go and correct. You have to turn your radio off sometime. But Mr. Speaker, the fact remains that this bill covers most of it. Would we need to come back something that he missed out? The answer is most likely yes. But what does it cover? I told you about the areas of repeal. Um, he mentioned, and I'll just summarize, part two. It deals with administration. Part three, the Virgin Islands Agriculture and Fishing Fisheries Authority, a powerful act, 19 to chapter 50, in this particular area. Uh, part four, management of agriculture and fishing industry. Part five, plant protection. Part six, pounds and livestock. Part seven, dogs prevention and injury. I'll talk about that very soon. Part seven, commercial farms. Part nine, I missed eight, seven and eight, yes. Commercial farm is part eight. Part nine, importation and sale of, what is that, fresh heat or fresh meat? And part 10, fisheries. Part 11, enforcement and evidentiary matters. And the repeals covered in part 12. Mr. Speaker, this is a comprehensive bill. This is a roadmap. This is what foundations, this is what legacies are built off. My minister is a legacy builder, building a legacy of agriculture and fishing. So I lend full support to this bill. It says in the objects and reason that this bill seeks to establish an effective mechanism to promote food security and sustainability in the territory and to provide for the establishment, the powers and functions of the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries and the Virgin Islands Agriculture and Fishery Authority and respecting the effective administration and management of agriculture and fisheries resources of the territory. We have to give the drafters, we have to give the Attorney General Chambers, we have to get everyone who, even if they only put in a word, we have to give them the credit for bringing this forward. Will we need amendments? Yes. Would we need to put other things in place? Yes. Would we need to get some more ventilators? Yes. But this is how far the patient was. We will get it here. We will bring it. We will make sure that all of what we need for the food security and sustainability is had. It is, well, let me just say this quite clearly. Now come closer because this is the one that you need to hear. Food security is not just a plus. It is a must. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the territorial member for his contribution. The floor is still open before I ask the 
sponsor of the bill to wrap up. With no other member wishing to speak, oh, sorry, I recognize the Tuna Minister for Tourism, Central Member, the Honorable Sherry B. DeCastro. I rise to fully support this bill, the Virgin Islands Food Security and Sustainability Act 2022. I believe that a lot has been said um, to endorse and illustrate the magnitude and the importance of the bill that we have before us this afternoon. I want to commend the Minister of Education um, and Agriculture and Fisheries for the in-depth work that he and his ministry and staff have put into bringing this bill to Russian and to the state that it is at today. It takes innovative leadership and visionary leadership to seek to create a, an avenue and a new vehicle by which the agriculture and fisheries sector in our territory could continue to go from strength to strength. I want to commend that type of vision that pays homage to our ancestry and our heritage. Uh, the member for the fifth spoke about our grandparents and many of us show that linkage and that lineage of the hard work and toiling and the security that came from our lands in, in years past. And I believe we owe it to the memory of those that are before us and to the future of those that are to come to ensure that we revive this sector for generations yet unborn. And this bit, I believe, will cajole and will, will push this sector into a new era uh, where we haven't quite yet even imagined what will come of it. I want to also encourage the minister to continue to advocate for the development of our garden. And we had to go out on various days and plant and tend to our garden. And it taught us a lot, not just about food, but it taught us about life in general. And I've seen many schools have continued on that path. I recently saw my twin looks like she has um, taken the green thumb in the family. And I've seen some amazing produce that they are growing at Imagination Academy VI and so many other schools throughout the territory have endorsed and endeavored to also seek to train up our children in understanding the fruits of their labor in terms of agriculture specifically. But Mr. Speaker, it goes to a greater understanding of our young people, even understanding that they can endeavor to uh, fulfill careers in these areas and in these industries. Oftentimes in the classroom, they are exposed to particular, uh, more office-oriented jobs, and I think we have to do a lot more. And through avenues like this, uh, we'll be able to avail them to a lot of the more hands-on technical um, career paths, like farmers and fishers, and help them to understand that there, there's a lot more to what the, the, the whole process than just tending the ground. And I believe um, through this project that the minister will take on and the various layers and the various infrastructural developments that will support and, uh, um, and, and uphold this bill and that will come to pass because of this bill will even further strengthen the industries and will cause the territory to benefit tremendously from the economic development that will come out of it. I was speaking with the at-large representative a bit earlier and he spoke about the reality of what, what it means for us to grow our own food and even how through a process like that a food bank could be created for the vulnerable um, and, and, and the more we tend to our ground and the more food that becomes available out of the ground gives us more opportunity um, to locally be able to help persons who are in need of food and Truly, we understand that the processed food has its challenges, 
And I believe that's why your elder persons in the community are living such longer years because they would have grown up off of the ground and the sea. And the more that we can endeavor to incorporate that back into our societies, it would help us, even it would help the Minister of Health in his work in terms of lessening the, the, the unhealthy impacts of uh, the foods that we eat that are more processed versus those that come directly from the ground. So I want to just encourage us as we seek to reimagine agriculture and fisheries um, through the eyes of the Minister of Education and his entire team. Um, I am excited because I know it beckons a new age um, and a new level of thinking and a, and a new level of future proofing or territory for what is to come. It is also a mediator in terms of the challenges that we face globally in relation to um, getting foods to our shores. And I believe that this is a proactive step, um, though it should have been taken a long time ago. I'm happy to be a part of the team led by the minister that enacts this legislation and also takes it forward from strength to strength to ensure that these two pillars agriculture and fisheries continue to grow in our territory. So I thank the minister, I thank the Attorney General's chambers, and I thank this entire team led by the Premier who has seen it fit to ensure that our fishers and farmers are not on the backbone anymore, but that they are the, at the forefront of development of our territory. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the territorial member for her contributions. Final call for anyone wishing to speak before I ask the minister to wrap up the debate. I recognize the Honorable Leader of the Opposition and member for the 8th District, the Honorable Malin A. Penn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity to make my brief comp contribution to the Virginia's Food and Sustainability Act 2022. Mr. Speaker, this is a very, I know we used to say in this honorable house, the smaller bills are the weighty ones, but this one is literally a very weighty bill. All 177 clause and two schedules, schedules. Mr. Speaker, before I go into my contribution, I, it would be remiss of me to sit here and not make a contribution on this very important transitional bill as it relates to the food security and creating a parity and a management council for agriculture and fishing in this territory. Speaker, I want to first of all to thank all the public servants and the technocrats who labored, and the minister was fair in his, um, his assessment and the timeline in which many of the work, much of the work started. I believe that government is a continuum. And it's important for us to do things that are in the right interest, in the best interest of the people of this territory and the industries in which we wish to promote and develop in this territory. So I would like to acknowledge the former minister and the technocrats who started this process to get us to where we are today, and as well the current minister who sighed to follow through to ensure that this bill comes to the Sambo House. And that's Ms. Tessa Smith Claxton and Mr. Theodore James and the former head of the agriculture I know was involved somewhat in the process of getting this bill to where it is today. It's no surprise that the two thirds of them are from Eastern, but the reality is that food security is not just a buzzword. And I think we, we tend to, to say these things loosely and continue to talk about food security in very loose terms. And I believe that there are some realities that are sinking in, particularly to concerning what we saw after the storms 
and the challenges that we had getting ships back to the territory and the, the anxiety that everyone experienced at the supermarkets after the storms, considering that they had this perception that we were running out of food. We now see during the pandemic, a similar dilemma, the beginning of the pandemic, where the whole issue of inflation and production, and where wealthy countries will now have to secure and maintain and retain most of their goods that they produce for consumption by their population and, secure, and securing the, the, the food supply within their populations. These are real challenges. And more particularly now, the challenges with the current unrest in the Ukraine, between the Ukraine and Russia. And, and you see the, 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 the numbers and statistics that are going out in terms of the importance of those two particular nations when it comes to the production of the raw material to make much of the food supply that we import and countries around the globe use. I think it's some 25 to 30 percent of the world's uh, wheat production comes from those two nations alone. So you could understand the dynamics in terms of inflation, one, and the dynamics where wealthy countries who has purchasing power that we cannot even imagine will now look to secure whatever resources that are out there for themselves and their citizens. So, Mr. Speaker, it's important for us to, and I want to again commend that we now have a, we had frameworks that was all over the place. We now have a consolidated framework to address the issue of food security. But I, but I, I, I continue to say publicly, and the minister and I have had conversations on some of the things that need to be adjusted in this particular legislation, I stuck around because I believe that this process is important. There is going to come a time, and, and, I, and I, I, one of my favorite artists, who is Bob Marley, I, in, in actuality, my son and I share this famous artist. I wake up in the morning, I hear him at seven o'clock pumping Bob Marley music while he getting, he's getting ready for school. This guy, he, this young man, has a, he has an old soul. And one of Bob Marley's saying is, um, says a foolish bird the backs of the flying, the foolish dog the back of the flying bird. There's some bird flying over here today looking for a dog to back. <laughs> but I choose, I choose which birds I back at. And I'm going to be very deliberate because this is very important. And the time is cut, will come for backing. We all have our time to back. But today I believe that this is very important for us to get this right. We have to get this right. We see what is happening around us, the implication for us import importing over 90 plus percent of our food for our people to survive. It's a big deal. We need to at least by within the next two to three years get to at least 40 percent in terms of our own production. And I want to commend those legitimate fishers and farmers who continue to ply their craft, who continue to push the envelope, invest their own financial resources to ensure that we have products on a weekly basis in and around this territory. I, I, I hear the member speak about the poultry farm in, in in um, Parakeeta Bay, but he, he, didn't, he needed to know the origin of the poultry farm and where, where it originated from in, in Josiah's Bay. And the efforts to get that going and the importance of it to make sure that it happened, me as a backbencher saw the realization and, and my colleagues did see at the time the potential for that. And I'm happy that you could continue to support because at the end of the day, our focus is not to get red stars. When you were in school, you used to get these stars on your book. 
to say who gets what, but it's to ensure that the industries and the people who invest in these industries are given every opportunity to survive, to be productive, and to create long-lasting industries that supplies and supports our territory for decades to come. So I want to commend Mr. Pickering. He knows my position in terms of the support, in terms of what he's doing. I think we have a, a, a golden opportunity with that establishment and the other persons who are doing this to, to put down, to, to really eliminate the level of importation that we need in terms of poultry in this territory. And I'm happy to see the bill has aspects of it that speaks to um, certification. And, and we need to look at the possibility of having FDA certified products in the BVI. It gives us the opportunity to export on a larger scale into this, the, the USVI and other regions uh, that could support and grow these industries. We have to start thinking beyond BVI and just the matter of developing for just or local population, which is important. We need to be, be able to get to the point where we don't need to import much of the supplies that we need as a territory. But we now have to look at our businesses to be global businesses, businesses that looks beyond the shores of the Virgin Islands in terms of developing these critical components in economic development for our country. So I, wanna, I just wanted to make sure I, I because the history lessons we get sometimes is, is cute. Uh, our memory tend to go only eight years back sometimes. So, so I want to make sure that we get the right and accurate history on some of these developments and where they come from. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, once all people benefit, that is what our objective should be in this animal house, to do things that are in the best interest of all our people and all these critical industries and the issue of food security be more than just a buzzword, but more of an action. And it comes to my point about action. Legislations, they are good. We have a lot of them on the, on the books. We have tons of legislation on the books. In fact, we passed so many this year, I've lost count. But we have to ensure that when we pass these legislations, they are enforced they are put to action. And the reality is, a regulatory body is an expensive undertaking. And this is essentially what this legislation seeks to do. Create a management board and essentially a regulatory authority. So Mr. Speaker, we have to then start to think about, and I'm happy that it's there as, as well, Minister, the issue of co-ops and ways where the authority could be creative and generating revenue for the authority. So the authority could be more self-sustaining, where they could share technical resources from their partners, where they could form relationships with already established regulatory authorities, where we don't necessarily have to outfit the entire suite of some of these areas on the ground, but have relationships where we could be more efficient and focus on the main objective, which is planting food, growing um, a, 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 a chicken business, or what, you, what the word you use for that business, Minister? The poultry business, or livestock business, and, and focus on the actual production of food in the territory. So Minister, there needs to be, and when we go into the community stages, where we could find the level of synergies within persons within the region particularly. There are territories, there are countries who have been in agriculture for decades, who have had some of the structures that we're seeking to do in this legislation established for decades. It will just need and require us to have the MOUs between ourselves and them to ensure that we could do the necessary checks and balances to set up the frameworks to govern how this bill is intended to govern. And that would save costs and put more money into the actual production of food um, and, and the poultry and livestock area that we need to look at. Additionally, Minister, I'm going to talk a little bit about the fishing side of this bill. We tend to speak a lot in terms of the fishing industry and its potential. 
and the nautical miles outside Ambivi waters. We talk a lot about the, the type of fish that pass through the BVI. But one of the areas that I think that we've missed, we've, 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 we've lost, or we're not focused on, uh, enough on, is the aspect of really quantifying what is actually under the water. There are ways to do that. There are countries and territories and who are in this industry that have done that and continue to monitor the, the, the supply and the stock within their nautical waters, their fishing grounds. Minister, we need to have a better handle of the, the quantum and the, where we need to possibly, we know we have the seasons now where we have certain seasons where we wouldn't fish certain fish, but we need to have a better handle of it in terms of the statistics and the data that says, look, this particular species is close to extinction. This particular species is overpopulated, so we could have as more of this particular species. You know, we have to look at data and not talk in general, generalities or hypotheticals when we're speaking about this industry. We have to get to a science. We have to get scientific when it comes to this industry. We have to roll up our sleeves and get the job done in terms of really understanding what our industry is and the quantums within our industry. And, and while I'm on that point, I myself have some concerns in terms of certain species and how do we preserve them, particularly we're in turtle season right now. We have to look at putting quotas on the amount of turtles. I know it's a tradition, it's a culture, but we have to look at putting quotas in place in terms of how much of these, this species that we take out of the waters every year. We have to have proper record keeping in terms of all the different species, uh, lobsters and all the different things that we're doing and how we really measure what we're taking out versus what is in there. So I am going to support, where, and I don't know if it's in this legislation, Minister, where we could put quotas or, or put some kind of aspect in it where we could, we could we, the minister or through cabinet or through the house could impose quotas um, on certain species once we do the, the proper analysis in terms of where we are with some of the species within our, um, our, our what we call it, residential waters or fishing waters. And I'm gonna to touch some points that have already been touched, but I think it's important for us to really re reinforce and reiterate some of these points. Um, the point raised by the Deputy Speaker and the member for the Ninth District uh, regarding our fish tracks and this issue of ghost traps. I stand with the, 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 the member for the night because it's important for us to look at technology in terms of materials now that are biodegradable. We can't continue to use half inch steel to make fish pots and then drop them in, on, on, on the bed, sea bed. First of all, they, they erode in the water, they're going to mess with our coral reefs, and they take a longer time to to break down, or uh, whatever size steel, steel. I know some, many of the parts that were made back in the day were being used, persons were using actual steel to make the infrastructure for our fish, fish traps. So the issue of ghost trap is a real issue. So we need to find ways, Minister, to engage, and Mr. Mr. Speaker, to engage to ensure that if, we, if the co-op or the authority needs to source the material, a, bio, a biodegradable material that can be used by a fisherman to ensure that there's a, there's a, there's a there's, even if it's expensive, I don't know what the cost is, you need to look at those things, though that level of detail will be done by the authority, but to ensure that every trap that is made from a certain timeline is made from this biodegradable material so that we don't have an issue there where the traps stay out there and they're lost over a certain period of time. And the issue of tracking, I agree with the member, territorial member. We have a, a system in government, the GIS system. And I don't know, and I haven't seen it, Minister, and you will have to correct me if I'm wrong, in this legislation where mem persons are, are required to let the authority know where they set their traps, 
where all the traps in the BVI are located. So it gives you an easier chance in an event that's, that we're go, if we have ghost traps anywhere around, that they could be found, you track that same area and take them out, out of the water. If someone decides not to engage with the industry anymore, or their traps, for whatever reason, they can't find them anymore. So we have to find ways using the current technology that is on the market that we have already at our disposal as a territory to sort of maximize how we could really manage this industry and manage it effectively. Speaker, I continuously get barraged and I am, I'm someone who grew up in a fishing village. The Eastern Island community is a village where all of us, at one point or the other, there are a couple of things you do in that area. There are certain things that are right up, rites of passage. You have to jump off a red bay. You have to jump off on the bridge. I remember one time, my son was about six years, six or seven years, and someone called me and said, in a frantic voice, I just see your son walking from around the bridge, going by the bridge. And the next question I asked them, he jumped? They said, yes, he jumped. I said, good. So he, he, he had officially had his rites of passage, jumping off of it, um, the, the Queen Elizabeth Bridge. And going fishing around Red Rock. All of us, yeah, exactly, swim, and swim out to Red Rock. My cousin reminded me about the swims you used to do going out to Red Rock. And I don't believe that the intention of the legislation is to take away those traditional things that we've done as a, as a people and as a territory through a licensing regime and the strict um, restrictions that have been imposed uh, regarding a, a licensing regime. And so we have to look at who we are as a people the cultural aspect of our upbringing. I just last, just during the pandemic, I took a trip with my um, nephews and my son to Red Rock so they could do a fishing exercise. They didn't even know how to tie a hook. I, I felt shame. At, at 12, 13 years, they, they couldn't tie a hook. So, so, so I, it's important for us not to put restrictions or make it difficult for our people to be able to still engage in so a lot of our traditions and, and, if, and it relates to fishing. I, I think they have to have several tiers in terms of the commercial aspect of it. Persons who are doing recreational fishing or somebody who makes up in the morning and say, look, I want to just go catch a couple of fish around the rocks. So we have to have that discussion and make sure that we're not creating an environment where we over-regulate and you have an authority that's overzealous, trying to find persons, try to get persons to, to do whatever because of just a, a little recreational activity. So we have to find that balance. I understand what we're trying to achieve and ensure that persons are not illegally fishing and not um, overfishing in certain areas, but we have to find the balance in terms of these key, these traditional things that are traditionally and uniquely Virgin Islander. And also the point that was raised earlier regarding the transferability of a licensed fisher person or fisher folk to be able to move between vessels. We have a real example right now in our community where unfortunately one of our fisher, our fisher folks had a tragic accident and God forbid and God, thank God he was able to be rescued and and is, and is back with us. But now his, 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 his traps are out there, and based on the law, if he goes out on any other boat, he's breaking the law, and he's subject to a fine. And it might take him at least a year, two years to get a new boat, or get his boat if he gets it from the bottom of the surface, and get it repaired. So we have to have a level of flexibility with circumstances like this. We have to ensure that there's portability in terms of even the, the hands, the fisher hands on the boats to be able to go work with other boats. If boats are short hand, they need some additional support. 
So if a guy is, is Gary's going out in the same boat and he has a bed of fish, that two of the guys that work with him is not enough. He needs another four guys to help him to hold the arm and, and, and pull the fish to shore. He don't want, he don't, we should, he should not have to worry that he's breaking the law to bring his fish to, to fish the market. So we need to have that flexibility and mobility between licensed fishermen and licensed boat and the ability, mobility to move between both of them. So I, I'm, I'm encouraging in a committee stage for us to have a more in-depth discussion. I think it's section class 120 and 121 in terms of how we could create that level of flexibility uh, with those particular clause that speaks to those um, nuances or real situations that we now see occurring within the industry. I also want to touch a little bit, and I've been getting these calls in terms of the spare fishing. One of the most sustainable form of fishing is spare fishing. Because you go, you can pick and choose. When you, when, you, when you launch a pot, you catch everything. When you draw a net, if a fish is caught in the net and you don't want that fish and he dies, you have to throw it back in the water. With spare fishing, you go, you select the fish that you need, the size that you need, without um, compromising the environment. And I would love to hear the rationale from the technocrats and the reason why we've banned spare fishing for so long. I'd like to hear why we can't go back to a controlled environment in terms of spare fishing. Because logically for me as a, a, a layman looking in, I don't see the logic or the reasoning behind of it. But I'm sure there has to be some technical reason why the technocrats are saying this. Uh, we'll have that conversation, but as legislators, we have to make a decision um, on this particular style or source of, or, or, or form of fishing. Because I personally believe that from me looking at the industry is the most sustainable form of fishing. And it's one that I think we could find, out, find ways to make it work. And I don't know of many other countries that have banned it. And if there, there are those countries, I would love to see the statistics, Minister, with your technocrats, on why they banned it, the rationales for banning it, and, and so forth. So that is one aspect I do support the members who have raised that point. That is something that we need to look at and something that we need to figure out and how we work, work that particular aspect of it. I have two more points, Mr. Speaker, and then I'll, I'll take my seat. The issue of land. I see in section 55, it speaks to the authority having the ability, and I wanna read a specific clause, and I found it to be very vague in terms of how they, how they, and the minister will have to explain this when he's wrapping up. It speaks to, I wanna read it so, to, so at least I could, there we go. Expects the power of the authority to issue leases on crown land acquired for food production. It says 51, one says the authority may, with approval of the board, issue to any person, any person a lease for the purpose of food production on any land acquired under section 52. In section 52, it says two, and issuing any lease pursuant to sec subsection one, the authority may impose such conditions as may be deemed necessary, including compliance with any standards established. So Minister, so are we saying now that the authority now, the, the power to manage crown land is now vested in the authority? So, so, so we have to, uh, I think we have to be careful and I want to make sure I understand how that works. And I'm sure you'll explain it that we have a, a wider discussion in the committee stage, section 52. So we'll have a discussion on this, particularly how crown lands are being disseminated. Because we now have an issue at the, at the, at the Parakeeta Bay, um, up in Parakeeta Bay. 
we see what's being done and what's, being trans what's transpiring for the lands that are designated for farming and the abuse at those lands where persons are, are building um, structures on those particular properties that should not be there for land that's built for farming. So we have to make sure and look at how we can, as much as possible, if we're investing the authority with the, the authority in the authority, we must make sure the authority has the authority. Because we can't have these clauses so loosely. There need to be certain penalties if persons are using lands other, for other purposes other than what is designated to be used for. We have to make sure that if we're going to vest this kind of power within an authority, that we don't create a rogue environment where government's properties and limited farmland could be abused and further abused. So I'm, I'm looking forward for us to have a more robust discussion on Clause 55 and how particularly this particular aspect of the legislation is going to work, but we must ensure that the lands that are, that, that are designated and proposed for farming and food security, because we see the importance of, in, in my initial deliberation, where we are as a territory in the global scheme of things, and every inch or hectare of land or square foot of land that we have for farming needs to be used for farming and nothing else but farming and food production. So we need to ensure that these lands are properly utilized as a country that is limited on land space, that we maximize the use of the lands that we have designated for farming. And Mr. also the concerns that were raised by members of the public to me concerning the relationship between the authority and the management board and how that relationship will work, particularly with the relationship with the minister, and the level of autonomy, autonomy that the authority will have, free of interference from the ministerial aspect of it. So the authority needs to have a level of independence in the way that it functions. The minister, whoever that minister, and that's not, that's not against you personally, minister, but the position of minister needs to be hands off, so to speak. Set the broad policy positions, set the direction of the authority and the statutory institution, the statutory instrument, and allow competent persons to be appointed and installed in these institutions and allow them to work. Allow the institution to run with his independence, without political interference, and there's some concerns in terms of the language minister, in terms of how that independence between the authority and the, and the, and the, the board out from the minister. So we need to ensure that that level of independence is enshrined in the legislation. And we don't have a, a so-called statutory board where the minister is still directing. So we need to ensure that that level of independence is developed and maintained in the functioning of the, of the authority. Now, Mr. Speaker, the bill, as I said, is 177 clause, two, sketch, two schedules. It's going to take us several meetings to go through this, Minister, um, and speak, Mr. Speaker. But it's important for us to do this because I think the, the framework is important. But as I said earlier, we have to ensure that this does, does not become another legislation on a shelf. We have to make sure that the aspect of implementation, the aspect of actually getting the farmers who are already on the ground in place, put them in a position to be successful. The work that has been done by several across administration and ministers to get certain aspects of the industry up and running, get it in place, ensure that the infrastructure in place so that the farmers and fisher persons and fisher folks could be successful. Our people have proven 
from back in the 60s and, and, and when we had to depend on ourselves to feed ourselves, that we can do it. There's no reason why with more technology, with more education, with more financial resources, that we're at the place that we are. Be that as it may, it is important for us now to do the things necessary to support the ones who are there currently doing their best to ensure that they provide a viable industry and viable food. I, I, I also want to make, give a plug to my neighbor. So uh, I can't remember his, his real name. His, his name by, I want nickname. I wouldn't use his nickname in the house. Um, he's been planting, planting, and other banana and other stuff. I am amazed right down the ledge from where my home is. The quality of planting that he was able to produce. He gave me a, um, a, a box the other day, and I was amazed, Mr. Speaker, the quality and the taste. I haven't tasted a sweeter planting in a long time. That's my brother from in Greenland, who now, who runs the little jock stand there uh, by Andy. I want to bring him a plug. He's been doing a great job in terms of trying to move the issue of, independently, the issue of planting, getting the, um, those kind of products in the territory, around the, the country. So we have people that have the capacity, have the capability, and I can get it done. Just need an extra nudge to move to the next step. So I look forward, Mr. Speaker, to a more detailed conversation. I have some more concerns raised by persons within the industry, within the public, which I intend to stay, stuff it out, and ensure that I perform my duties as a legislator to ensure that the people's concerns are in, enshrined in the legislation as much as the House accepts, because at the end of the day, it's the government's bill, and the government will determine what's in the bill. But I will make sure that the, people con the people's concerns are raised and brought to the forefront, and we will see what happens at the end of the day. But I think we have a lot of work cut out for us, Mr. Speaker, and I think we shouldn't rush. We waited as long as we waited, but we shouldn't rush this, Mr. Minister. There are some salient points raised in the public meetings. I've been listening to the points and concerns raised by some of the persons within the public. I think we really need to give serious consideration to those concerns, because they're the ones in the industry. They're the ones that understand the challenges that they face in the industry. We have to make sure if you don't have a, a framework that works for the persons working in the industry, the industry is going to be in trouble. So we need to make sure that we come to some common ground, some middle ground, to ensure that we have a functioning framework in a, a successfully run industry, both for farmers, livestock farmers, and fishermen in this territory. And time for the other stuff will come, and we'll deal with it at the appropriate time. I thank you. I thank the leader of the opposition for his contributions. Is there any other member before I call on the sponsor of the bill. I recognize the Premier and Minister of Finance and member for the first district, the Honorable Andrew A. Foy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'll be brief. Mr. Speaker, as I uh, stand here in this uh, August body, in these hollow walls of the House of Assembly, I stand here beaming with a great sense of pride and a, a great sense of fulfilling of purpose with being able to deliberate this bill. Mr. Speaker, now known as of Virgin Islands Food Security and Sustainable Act 2022. Mr. Speaker, the reason that I said so, Mr. Speaker, is that government is a continuum. And I'm amazed, Mr. Speaker, 
when I speak to the technical persons on the ground and was asked why wasn't this pushed much faster in terms of what was there, because a lot of work has been done since. And I was told, Mr. Speaker, that there was no appetite for it. But Mr. Speaker, of course, they told me so in a way where they were concerned that it would be said where they would have to back up themselves out of fear, or back up out of fear, but I don't have to. So I thank God we are finally at this point where food security is not just a talk, but now have moved into action. Because as the Minister of Health rightfully has coined that food security is not just a must, it's not just a plus, it is a must. Not just a plus, it is a must. Mr. Speaker, I need to make it clear for the history of this action that it didn't just sprout out of nowhere. This action formed part of the Bosnian Party Manifesto. And Mr. Speaker, you will find that this action of bringing this bill to this Honorable House and moving in this direction forms part of our budget speech. And Mr. Speaker, if you dig deep, you will also find out that the speech from the throne, which is really the sitting government's agenda for the legislative agenda, read by His Excellency the Governor, whoever is in the post, that that action also formed part or forms part of our speech from the throne. And Mr. Speaker, it is important for us to recognize that there were some delays in agriculture and fisheries even when we took office because there are those, Mr. Speaker, who want the whole of the Virgin Islands to believe and to feel that COVID-19 should not be used as any form of why anything was delayed. Mr. Speaker, if you go through anywhere in the world and they, you say that, they'll have to ask if that person is for real or being malicious. Mr. Speaker, we have seen where COVID-19 have delayed and in some way have basically caused uh, certain initiatives to be deferred and even have caused some of them right now to be put far, far in the back burner because of the millions that were needed. That is accounted for over and over for the fight to mitigate against COVID-19. But Mr. Speaker, even with that, let's turn back the clock's hands for a minute. Because we speak as if agriculture, nothing has been done since we have taken office and that sometimes when I listen, it seems like the, f the reason is this government's fault. But I remember correct, clearly, and the people of Caribbean in the first district remember right after the hurricanes, and we were, a, we were craving and, 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 and really beckoning for someone to, to, from government to come and help us in that area, and we, we had to help ourselves after Omar. And finally, when we had meetings of the ministers, I remember well, only two ministers of the last administration came down, and I thank them so much. Honorable Mark Vanderpool and um, the uh, uh, Honorable Pickering for Agriculture. And we were going through what we needed to have done for, uh, for the future development and the future repairs of the territory, given all the damages. And when we were told that we needed funding for agriculture, we, we were flat out told that agriculture basically is not on the table right now, it's dead. Flat out told. Anyone who was there meeting can remember that. Flat out told that. And so, Mr. Speaker, I need to say these things and, and to get to the crux of it because that was a tenure of the last administration which the opposition was a part of and still a part of. So clearly when we took office, agriculture was already pronounced dead. Stone dead. 
Now when you say these things, Mr. Speaker, persons ask, why do we have to go there? But then, Mr. Speaker, we are, we are speaking now with persons who seem to only have a memory of what's happening now and forget that not only we had to, to deal with reviving ourselves even through this pandemic right now, reviving ourselves even with what's happening out of Ukraine, but we could have been further along, but the problem was we also had to go back and shock agriculture to get a pulse beat. Mr. Speaker, let's look and see what has happened to our farmlands. And tell me, Mr. Speaker, if I'm not correct when I say we had to shock our farmlands to get agriculture going and to walk around years of neglect. At Parikita Bay right now, Mr. Speaker, the designated farmlands, we have seen when we took office and have to deal with it now that the infrastructure was allowed to be destroyed. Mr. Speaker, as a matter of fact, some of the pipes were so mashed up that they even weren't in place. And when we did it, put some water in the pipes, they cracked up because the pipes were already rotten. They break. They because it were years before they didn't have water in them. According to one of my Bajan friends, years they didn't have water in them. We need to go back and remind us of these things. Because, Mr. Speaker, they are not make up things or fairy tale things. These are real. In our designated farmlands, we've seen where when we took office, Residential homes are allowed to be built on the farmlands. We met that, they're still there. If you're serious about agriculture and you're with a group that is serious with agriculture, how could residential homes be built on farmlands and no one did anything about it? They're still there. And two story after that, I guess they were going high to see if they could have seen the college. When we took our office, Mr. Speaker, in the designated farmlands, not only residential homes were built on the farmlands, but apartments. These exist as is. I need to point these things out, Mr. Speaker, because there's a lot that we had to maneuver before we could even get started. But, but since persons, some person's memory only gonna go a certain way, I have to go back a little bit more and a little further. And that parakeet there. We saw that persons were allowed to be squatting on the designated farmlands. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Transportation and the Minister of Agriculture went together a couple times trying to get the water there. And every time they were successful, something else would happen because they would have to go and put in new pipes or different things, and they're still at it. Now and again, they were successful, and then it relapsed and they go back. But it has not been for the water not trying. And some of them did get water in that time. And yes, we, some of them had to rush and come while the water was on to get water, but at least it was on. Compared to when we came to office, those who were in the government at that time made sure not only the water was on, but the pipes were on there. I have to say these things, Mr. Speaker, because we have been branded as if we do not care about agriculture, we don't care about fisheries, but I have to go into these areas, Mr. Speaker because we have to say what we met and what we're trying to build up now. Mr. Speaker, we have seen where the spare gun fishing act was made illegal in 1997, clearly. But we have seen that governments have come together and said, because it was made illegal in the, in the 1997 Fisheries Act, yes, I think it was 1997, but we have seen governments after governments decided, well, all right, let us relax that for, so that there's no penalty, there's no enforcement of it because our people are involved in spare gun fishing. But I want the public to know that the most intense violation of that agreement came, Mr. Speaker, in 2012 to 2019. That is when it seems like some kind of decree was, was declared to enforce it. 
which again lends itself in the administration right before this government. But Mr. Speaker, we're talking about eight years in office to change that spare gun fishing, of which our leader of opposition was part of the government, it was his government. I just want to help us remember these things didn't just come. It's not an indictment of anyone, but history is something that that is history. And Mr. Speaker, the people's concerns weren't listened to then. The people's voices weren't listened to then. The people's ideas weren't listened to then. But Mr. Speaker, we even during the pandemic went and helped our officials and farmers and I'm hearing persons and to be blunt, including the leader of opposition, saying that we squander the Social Security money and telling the public that we, we give it to cronies, which happens to be the same language that you heard from the last governor in the CY, which tells me uh, where the impetus of all of this seems to have been stemming from. Because you have to make it clear that the Social Security Board grant was $40 million. That's what we wanted to make clear, but a portion went to paying NHI, which the same leader of opposition in this government did not pay. And a portion to set up the unemployment fund, which was never set up. So out of the $40 million, Mr. Speaker, the, I said this in here already, but it seems to be a recitation so that that sticks in people's mind that we squander their Social Security money. And I'm not going to sit and let that be said, Mr. Speaker, without addressing it. $40 million, $1 million went to the unemployment program that the Minister of, of, of Labor is working on. Never was there unemployment benefit for our people. Even with Omar and Maria, we decided to go and get that with the four, 1 million out of the 40. $7.5 million, Mr. Speaker, went towards NHI to ensure that the monies, Mr. Speaker, that NHI should have received to help when it started was never, that was supposed to be placed was never there. So out of the 40 million dollars, Mr. Speaker, we are seeing that already 8.5, 8.5 out of the 40 million dollars went towards things that should have been taken care of a long time ago. Then, Mr. Speaker, we see about $9 million, Mr. Speaker, went straight over to the housing development, the housing recovery. Mr. Speaker, that's $17.5 million, Mr. Speaker, went towards the recovery. And, Mr. Speaker, we saw the breakdown, and we give the breakdown of this $40 million to say that by the time it reached into grants, there were only about $22 million or $22.5 million left for grants. All taking care of problems that we met when we took office from the farm, from the, from the NHI to the, to the unemployment benefit, to people who are still without homes and, and had to find how to help them. So really and truly, and I said it when I went to the CI, this is a myth that we had $40 million to squander between cronies and friends. That's not true. And to be blunt, is a lie. And Mr. Speaker, that's called inflating the amount spent, and that's being deliberately dishonest. So with the $22.5 million, Mr. Speaker, fishermen and farmers got their help. And Mr. Speaker, yes, it'll come back that they're saying some even didn't have a piece. Well, each of them got their money, and on the back end, they were told that they'll be monitored, and the monitoring committee has already started. So if anybody got the government's money in the grant for fishing and farming, which they were told they have to account for it, and they have not done what they're supposed to do with it, when they go out and they're monitoring, they'll have to answer. But it wasn't nobody give it to them as no cronies. It wasn't anyone give it to them looking for anything. People were hurting. You didn't want to be where the premier's office during that time. 
the number of persons flocking around the door, meeting our families, all the ministers outside, we need help. Meeting our wives and our other halves, we need help. People could judge us now with hindsight because it's 2020, and 2020 hindsight is always perfect. But during those times, and we tried to help as many people as could be. Let me ask you this, Mr. Speaker. How much help did the fish and farmers get after all my Maria? And yes, there was a business loan that gave out, but we never paid back. And we, the government, paying for it. That didn't make the COI because who was carrying the news won't carry news on themselves. Got a lot of things that make the COI wait until when the report come out. I got a lot of things to make it. And I, I, and I know why. Because they were trying to bond on the whole farm to get one foul. But I, my ministers or me don't have a dime of the public's money or the Social Security board money. Every dime was putting a check to somebody and you could trace it. So those who having the fun out there talking those things could have their fun for now. But the truth will float and the lie will sink. It's not going to be those days when I sat down in the early days of my political career and let people destroy my name and character and get away with it. And I just sit down singing Kumbaya, my Lord, forgetting I had to participate in my purpose. Some of these things I have to say because, Mr. Speaker, loose lips sinks ships. And Mr. Speaker, I will move on to say that enough of that for now because I know that they, 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 um, those distractors are going to come with certain things. Most of it I don't study, but some of it I will answer. And we right now, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Education just come back from a CARICOM meeting. Well, one of the areas that we're exploring and discussing with CARICOM, not just now, but even before, are bilateral agreements with the Caribbean for food and other resources. We even had a meeting yesterday with our technical persons to discuss that and other ongoing meetings. We're not sitting on our laurels. Don't mistake the absence of noise for the lack of activity. Because, Mr. Speaker, we know for sure that these things have to be said. Because if not some of these things being said will become gospel. And those are the same kinds of dishonest remarks that he and his conspirators were making, which is reflected in a narrative from, from, from the, the, the past governor when the CI was announced and believed it. And section 56 or 59 of the Constitution said that if a governor hears something that he needs the information for, I want to read it accurately. I don't want to be saying anything out of turn. I want to read it accurately, Mr. Speaker, because I know it's section 59 or, or, or something about that. Section 60. Section 60. Section 65. And the, section 60 talks about governor's special responsibility. And F says that the premier and or other minister shall provide to the governor and request all papers and information including the test of any instrument under negotiation available to the premier or other minister with respect to any activities in pursuance of subsection 4. Which says that one of the first option, if you hear things that sounds out of place as a governor, is to ask the Premier and the Ministers, and they must turn over the information to the Governor. But that, that wasn't done, because they, they thought that they, what they heard was solid, very solid. And I want to say that these are the things that you have to fight against, and to fight to make sure that you keep your name cleared. And Mr. Speaker, as I move on from that, because I want to make sure that that is clear. And may I add that since then, we had many other layers. The Contractor General, the Whistleblower Legislation, the Integrity in Public Life Legislation, 
the, the new procurement act, and we're implementing all of them. As a matter of fact, another leader of opposition has already been written for his, his name to be to, to our nominee for the Integrity in Public Life Commission, like the act says. So we, we, we were not sitting on our laurels, Mr. Speaker. We were making sure that we do the work of the people and do it as accountable as possible. But Mr. Speaker, the, the, we must admit, and I said this, and I'll say this before, after, and during the report, that any government who has given a report with such a broad, broad terms of reference, given an inquiry to do, or any commissioner, given an inquiry to do such a broad terms of reference for any country, whether it be UK, America, or wire, will notice and will know that no government can come out unscathed, none can come out unscathed without some area being highlighted that needs to be improved. Because there's no perfect government. And with such a broad terms of reference, we recognize that. And we recognize the areas for improvement. And we welcome the same CI, no matter the reason those who were fewer than it started it. Because a, a transparent and independent Commission of Inquiry that yields a just outcome can only help our country, not give us any retrograde steps, but it can help our country. But Mr. Speaker, it shows some of these narratives that are being said now by the members on opposite on the public region, knowing that they're not so, but believing them and making sure, trying to make people believe them, tells me how these things started. Could things be done in some areas better? The answer is yes. But you tell me you want to run a pandemic, which is the worst pandemic in the last 100 years, and don't have areas for improvement. But they were able to get help. That's the point. All my memory came, the fishermen got nothing. But Mr. Speaker, I want to, to state those things because I want to move on to these bilateral agreements that the minister is looking into and me as, as, as Premier Minister of Finance. Because we're exploring with CARICOM, OECS, and other Caribbean countries, those bilateral agreements, what we can ship to them, what they can ship to us. It's been on the table for a while with CARICOM and others, but we, we were one of those who saying, well, this is the time to push it the most, especially with what's happening in Ukraine. And the minister has come back with some ideas and some ways forward on how we're going to do it. And we'll be telling the public very soon how they'll be implemented. Because we must develop greater trade relations. And Mr. Speaker, I also heard that in terms of the, the, um, the fishing and farming, I, I heard that, which is true, if you look in the budget, the raw part of the budget, you probably only see about 50,000 or, or something like that. And so if persons don't know how to to read the budget or, or they were absent from budget sessions, they would say only $50,000 is in the budget for fishing and farming. But during the budget, it was clearly articulated by the Ministry of Finance to inform everyone who was present that there's a million dollars available for the fishing and a million dollars available for the farming through the very services that we were ridiculed from by the earnings from the Money Services uh, Act that we passed, generated now for their percentage of it now to be a million dollars each. That was in the standing finance. So that is why I could stand and tell the country emphatically that it, it is not true that only $50,000 is available for agriculture. I can say that without fear of being contradicted with proof. Uh, anyone could try to contradict you. Inside of the money services, the financial secretary and his team confirmed, and it's in the minutes of standing finance, once, once, once it um, wasn't one of those edited out, that a million dollars is there for fishing. 
A million dollars is there for farming. And to get those projects in ignited, they have to be brought in form of a project and developed by the Minister of Agriculture and brought the cabinet for approval. It exists. There's a commercial during Christmas I like when Santa Claus comes. It's an English commercial with the M&M &M and one said, um, he, he do exist. The other one dropped down, he said he does exist. It's an English lesson. Well, it do exist. And for those who have been listening to the $50,000, it does exist. One million dollars. And I challenge the leader of the opposition to go and search for it and tell me if he doesn't find it, and I will come back and apologize to the people of the Virgin Islands if he doesn't find it. That is how sure I am. I will come back and say, people of the Virgin Islands, I mislead you. So the leader of the opposition doesn't have to sit over there saying that that's not true. Go and research. And if you find it, if you don't find it, then come back and tell me. Put out one of your bodies that you have in the public service and tell them go and check. But you don't have to go around any bend. You could come here and ask a question, I'll answer it. Or you could get one of them to tell you that the money is there from an initiative that we did to help the people of the Virgin Islands. And the minister right now and his team is working when this bill is passed and even before on the initiatives that they'll be bringing forward for, for, the, for the money, from those money services to bring the cabinet to be approved. That's a government working for its people. Those are factual things. That's what you call not only shocking agriculture to try to wake it back up, but giving it a pulse. And the fishery is the same thing. Let's not forget that the fishing complex was destroyed in 2017. And Mr. Speaker, yes, it was knocked down now by us so that we can get a proper fishing complex, but no one should be telling the people that we knock it down and this is the case. It was left for dead. Nothing was happening. Everything there was left for dead. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, nobody have to tell me this. Even when Omar came and there were fish inside there before they get them out to the people that left them there to spoil. I know because I was there trying to get some of the fish. I was in opposition trying to feed my people. They even then look back the administration then and say, well, all right, we have some fish in there still. Let's give out to the people to eat the fish. So the, the clothes spoil, the concrete spoil, the wood spoil, the cement spoil, and by God, the fish spoil. Left to dead. Come to all street people, left to dead. But now we hear those who are part, a participant to, 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 to this, telling us that the government is not doing enough and the government is not putting any money into agriculture and the government is not serious about agriculture. Well, if you are serious, how come you let them house bill on the agriculture land where we got to go around them? Where was the voice then? Where was the voice when the, when the fisheries building destroyed and it was never even touched to be repaired? Where was the voice then? So Mr. Speaker, there's money. And when this bill is passed, they'll move right into pushing those initiatives much faster. And those bilateral agreements, Mr. Speaker, is going to come in very handy, especially with what's happening in the Ukraine. And Mr. Speaker, tomorrow, like I said, I'll be making some more statements on some of the initiatives that we'll be doing while we're monitoring what's happening in this war against the Ukraine, because we, we support Ukraine in their, in their bid to be left alone and to be free and the people to be safe. So the Virgin Islands do support freedom in every shape and form. We really do. And we want to say that we're now moving towards repairing the Fisherman Wharf in East End. I think the contract is signed. The sign is yet? I don't remember, I think it's signed. It's signed for oh, a long time. The, the Minister of Natural Resources said it's signed in a long time. In East End, the Fisherman Wharf. 
That wharf has been spoke about, about from the time a boat was a dinghy. And Mr. Speaker, if we were serious about fishing even in the East End all those years back, that wharf would have done be built. But there was no dedication to fishing to anywhere even in the East End. So, oh, 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 fellow Gary, you wouldn't have to be pulling the boat away if he had a wharf. But we now have signed it and it's going to be built. So I want to thank the minister and his team because how could we don't thank the public officers? But if the minister did not bring it to the house and added his touch from our government to it, how would it get here? If it was out there all the time, why didn't it come? Why couldn't it get here? Why? And not only that, the Minister of Education, what I, I sent this, this gentleman, what energy these ministers and, and, and junior ministers, my team have when I see them going, 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 they will burn you out just watching them. The Minister of Agriculture held a series of public meetings so many of them that sometimes they were clashing with other meetings that I had, but they were in other areas of the BVI, so it wasn't a real clash, just clash with my schedule. And whenever I look, he's any gather, smiling up. He went to church, he read a scripture reading, then he went to hold a public meeting. Then he went to Joss Van Dyke, Virgin Gala, Tortola. He just went and went everywhere that you could possibly go. And he has gathered together a plethora of information from all these meetings that he has there to make some amendments, along with whatever else is brought here. And the leader of the opposition, I must say, brought some, some good thoughts. Some of them are already um, documented from the public meetings. And we welcome the leader of the opposition's input into the bill. So I don't want the leader of opposition to think that I'm not saying that his input is not needed. What I'm saying is that while he was doing his input, there were some subtle shots that he gave, and even on his radio program that, that I understand, and even on the street, that gives the impression that this government is not serious about agriculture. So I know he didn't say that today because that wouldn't have been for him to say. So since he missed it, I brought it up for him so that I can clear it up for the people of the Virgin Islands. And don't take my word for it. I know we have to improve in many areas. I know that we have to improve in many areas. And I know that the leader of the opposition is saying to himself that some of these things, when I was in government, I really wanted them to come forward, but my colleagues just would not bring them forward. I know in his heart he said that when he lies down in his bed, data protection, he worked hard on that. He couldn't even get it to cabinet. But we got it to cabinet with the amendments and brought it here. That's why I was glad when he voted with us to say, that to say, um, you know, thank you. And he said he agrees. And when he sees this fishing bill, because it's been a wrong knocking around for years, and when he sees it come forward, I know he says to himself, oh, if I could only get my fellows that bring these things forward. But I notice only what probably was worked on before, he seems to think is good, and if it's not, and it's new by us, it's not. But, you know, we have to give Jack his jacket and Jane her skirt. So I thank the leader of opposition for his, his, his input and all the other members. I listened to my junior ministers speak when I was there outside and those ladies give a good punch. Listen to the, the, deputy, the deputy speaker, I think it was. I'll give it a good punch. I listened to the 
Minister of Health, he, he was fishing, so the leader of opposition said he was trying to bait him. But you don't, I don't need to bait you. I come in straight, straight down the middle with these things because we're not going to stay quiet and let history record one side and forget the other. All must come together so that the people could have the information and make the decisions on their own. So we're now even in the, the path with the General Minister of, of Tourism working on the cultural village, which includes certain things with fisheries and farming in the Caribbean, for the Caribbean Reclamation. Going to have a public meeting with that very soon. Eastern on and other areas. Mr. Speaker, I know we couldn't help everyone during that time of the pandemic. It's impossible, but what we didn't do is fold up and didn't help anyone. We helped as many as we could. When you look at this bill here, Mr. Speaker, even I agree with the spare fishing, and we're going to take care of that once and for all. And with the, when we come to the, to the pot fishing, or fish traps, I don't wash your mouth on the fish trap. That's why, that's why help raised me. Most of the problem with the fish trap has been careless boaters and some careless fishermen who put now, now the fish trap all in the areas where the boats pass and all the time. But in the early parts of this territory, the fish trap is what fed us. So yes, the, the, the um, environmentalists saying that it's not good. And yes, so I can say that certain parts about it is good, but we're going to modernize it. Put on some tracker system on them, like you said. We don't kill the baby with the bad water now that we have so much knowledge now that what help us to feed us, to get us where we are, all of a sudden is no good. And they go to college and try to explain to them why it's no good. No, 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 that help us get somewhere. So let's modernize it. Modernize it to see what's happening. If some parents are putting on, no, well, I don't agree with it, putting on a, a, a brace on their children, so when they go to the mall, they get away, they could find them. We could put on one on the fish trap, so if you get away, we could find that too. That fish trap feed a lot of fam family. Fish trap help a lot of people. I got an old fisherman down by me, near Fredo, he mastered making fish trap, and he catches his fish, and think he, that's all he knows. If we modernize him with a little GPS, I could see him down there now using his GPS, finding them fish trap. So I'm going to get rid of Fredo there. It's so easy with me here. Put on some GPS on these things and a lot of other older fishermen, that's all they know. The spare gun fishing, if we need to do something in the bill, let's look at it and see how we could give certain persons licenses to make sure they go through certain training and they're responsible fish gun operators and give it to specific light for persons with specific licenses. Let's stop going and killing everything, killing everything or, or, or um, just, just slashing everything out of our people's way that got us to where we are because a few things went wrong. Let's find how to adjust them. And the minister is doing the same. The minister will give his policy direction, but at the same time too, it has to be able to be checked in now and again. Because sometimes you turn these things over to the boards and, and turn these things over to technical persons and because it wasn't their vision they don't see through and it dies a quick death. But we have to put monitoring mechanisms in them so that we can make sure, make sure that when we go and, and go to, to these persons that they're still making it in the industry with the modern me methods. As I listen to the other fishermen I, um, during some of the public meetings and I played them back because they were live, I was very impressed with some of our young fishermen with some of the, the um, input they give in terms of any master plan for agriculture and fisheries production, especially on the Crown land. You know, I was very impressed with it. I thought they had some very innovative ideas and during the, during the committee stage, we will be able to get to those areas so that we can make sure that we help our people. What this does now is make sure that this industry is not existing but is thriving. 
with this legislation. And Mr. Speaker, why I admire the minister and his team with this, and I go to the minister specifically, is that he has been passionate about this food production bill. Is one of, he, is, is, he is one of many things that I've seen with him that he's passionate about, but this one, he has been behind this for the past three years. And he has not stopped until he got it to the House of Assembly. Many amendments he had to do, many meetings he had to attend, even some on his own, until he gets them finalized. And I give the minister a really high note of, of word, note worthiness for what he has done with this. This is going to put us into a new paradigm in the industry of agriculture and fisheries. And I'm asking those who are going to bring this to life from being on paper and coming to life to please take this seriously and please be fair, be firm, but also be friendly and continue to be innovative. One of the things we have to make sure that we continue to do in the positions that we have is be innovative and stop becoming complacent and satisfied because we want to make sure that we put our people on the next level. So, Mr. Speaker, in a time like when we have the Ukraine situation, I'm glad to know that the same Minister of Agriculture was able to walk out with, with local entrepreneurs to give some crown land in agriculture to do poultry and to do other food production. And even over in Virgin Gorda, with that production that's happening. So Mr. Speaker, when you, uh, a few of our people don't realize what persons are doing with farmlands with the assistance of the same government, because there are those who want to make the, that assistance seem as if it was not a multiplier effect to help with food production, and that it was just a giveaway money to cronies, as, as some will state, and we'll always have to, to, to bring it back to what really we need to bring it back to, which is to help with the food production. I have a young man in Caribbean, Mali, Donovan, when you see what he's doing with the, with, the, with the grant that he received and how he's going with fishing, uh, with farming, sorry, you'll be amazed in the hills of Caribbean. We have another fellow, Jordan Romney, who, who has gone and take his, his grant and help him to get the fish aboard and go on into deep sea uh, fishing and, and to pot fishing in different areas and making some significant max with these things. That's where the way they're making their living. I've had some other fellows carry me into what they're doing in East End, and some who have invited me to different parts of the Sister Islands to go, and I'm going to be going very soon to show what it is they did on their own, yes, and also with the, with the grant that government was able to give them. So I'm not going to sit idly by and make, and let people think that those are just give away money. If persons got the money and they did not do what they were supposed to do it, well, they have to answer. They'll have to say, well, what, what, what happened with the, with the grant money? But one thing I'm 100% sure of, that nobody can say with proof, because this country people can say a lot of things without proof. One thing I can say for sure is that not one of them can say that they got money. And any one of this gov these government members told them, look, that money for us in you. Not one, not me. That's why when the melee has sung sweet with it, they turn off in a rush. Try to burn down the whole farm to get one fall. And when they were finished, they realized, wait, <laughs> nine are fall without a rooster. So Mr. Speaker, I put this here to you today with this bill that this is an innovative move by the Minister of Agriculture. I thank his staff. Um, Brother James at Agriculture, the PS, everybody that had a hand in it and brought it to where it is, Tessa and everyone, I give them the credit. We couldn't do it without their help. God is the ultimate help, of course. But I put it to you, Mr. Speaker, that if it wasn't for the tenacity of the minister, if it wasn't for the determination in the, 
the aspiration of the minister to see food security not just as a plus but as a must. That bill won't be here today. So I thank all of them. And I thank my colleagues for their patience. Because many times we go in caucus and we ask the minister, you're talking about this bill all the time, where is it? And he would tell us all the time, it's coming soon. Coming soon. Minister, where is it? Coming soon. Coming soon. Well, it is here. And minister, you have my full support on this bill. And when this bill is assented to, and we start to implement it to help put food security into a new paradigm, we will be able to tell many persons who were thirsty and hungry for things that were not so, that we can now feed them with the fruits of our labor, which will be the apples, the oranges, the, the poultry, and some juices, fish, and feed them with substance so that from here on in, they won't be able to tell the people with their counterparts things that are not so. And I realize why they have told the public things that are not so, because they are yearning for the truth. They are yearning for information. So tonight that the, the opposition has received this information, which is factual, I expect them to digest it and to make sure that when they do regurgitate anything according to again, according to, to anything with this bill in fisheries and agriculture, it will be to tell the people that I have learned that through the money services, there is a million dollars for agriculture. I have learned that through the money services that there's a million dollars for fisheries. I've learned through the money service, through, through the House of Assembly, through this bill, that there's bilateral agreement talks going about how to help with food production. I've learned that they're working on how to soften, you can't stop, but soften the blow that's coming from this war with the Ukraine, with a war on the Ukraine, with us here that will feel the effects with food and food security in other areas that they're doing their best to get these things dealt with. So Mr. Speaker, on that note, I thank you, and it has my full support. I thank the Honorable Premier and Member for the First District for his contribution. Honorable Members, the hands-on officer is requesting a break. So I think we will take 15 minutes break and then we'll return and ask the Honorable Sponsor of the Bill to wrap up. This Honorable House stands in 15 minutes recess.
Please be seated. This Honorable House resumes its sitting. I now call on the Minister for Fisheries and Agriculture to wrap up the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have to say that I truly appreciate the support that I have gotten with this bill. We've had so many persons who have expressed support and given lots of positive feedback. We've even had, we've even had bipartisan support, Mr. Speaker. And I want to express my gratitude to the leader of the opposition for, first of all, staying here throughout the course of the debate. I would have been really disappointed if this bill had come to the House of Assembly and had not received any contribution from any opposition member. Um, because I think it's a very important bill. It's a bill that deserves to be scrutinized. Um, it deserves for both sides of the House to take a very close look at the bill and to give the public the benefit of their views on the bill. So thank you to the Leader of the Opposition for representing the entire opposition. Um, but I would have liked if, if more members of the opposition would have given their contributions to such an important part of the bill. But I fully expect for those members to be in committee stage because in all our districts we have fishers and farmers and we want to make sure that in the committee stage we secure the interests of those fishers and farmers and ensure that we have the best bill possible. Mr. Speaker, we had some studies, and yes, those studies happened, uh, most of them under the last administration, and we're grateful for that. But the studies identified what most of us in the Virgin Islands already know that the agriculture and fisheries sector was largely dysfunctional. It identified that it was largely dysfunctional. It said that there was no policy direction, a lack of investment, a lack of technical expertise, a lack of resources, lack of properly, uh, uh, proper use of our land assets, um, made several suggestions as it pertains to how to make the fisheries complex work better. We started basically from, from scratch. We started basically from scratch. We, we had um, Omar Wallace Hodge of blessed memory who understood that we needed technology to be able to move the sector forward. And for whatever reason, I know that there were legal reasons, other types of reasons, um, those greenhouses sat, uh, on a, uh, the late great Omar Hodge got them up before the Virgin Islands Party administration was voted out of office. And those greenhouses just sat there and very little outside of those greenhouses happened um, between 2011 and 2017. 
And as we know, the hurricanes came and they took out those greenhouses. And of course, you know, the hurricanes destroyed Parsons' boats, they destroyed Parsons' farms, and we're essentially at ground zero. I mean, if we are completely honest about it, but we have to recognize those fishers and farmers who have held the strain in the industry. Uh, many of them um, did not get adequate assistance after Hurricanes Irma and Maria. And it was true that they were not, it was said that they were not a priority as it pertains to providing assistance after the storms. But we, we have to recognize those persons out that by their own grit, by their own determination, by their own willpower, they've been able to keep their farming businesses going. But despite that grit, that will, that determination, and a lot of our farmers are getting older, a lot of our fishermen are getting older, we have to recognize we are at a point where something has to be done, something significant has to be done. And that starts with having the proper legislative framework in place. And it's important to note that this, the, what is in this bill has been recommended, recommended by persons who have studied it. And I feel good about it because the Virgin Islands Party administration placed a lot of these things in our manifesto even before reading these reports. If you look at the section of the manifesto on agriculture and fisheries, you're going to see that the Virgin Islands Party promised to create an agriculture and fisheries authority. And a lot of the other things in the bill, the Virgin Islands Party campaigned on, and, and the people gave us a mandate to take these things uh, forward. Many of my colleagues made some very good observations. I'll summarize some of the observations now. Um, Parsons, of course, acknowledge that this is a big deal. And I have to, do, I have to say yes, it is a big deal and it took a lot of work. We started from December 2019 was the first time I had a discussion with the consultant about what we wanted to do moving forward. And we started working and we had lots of consultations um, to many different sectors, tourism, restaurant, um, health, fishers, farmers, we had consultations up and down the Virgin Islands. And it's a lot of work that went into the bill. I thank the Attorney General's office as well for the role they played. We had discussions with the Governor's office, at a caucus with my colleagues. We, 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 we really, really, really went above and beyond as it pertained to getting this bill done. It's a big bill. It's a lot of massive work. And again, I show appreciation to the team, the PS. And I should say, Mr. Speaker, um, we did something innovative. I'm not sure if in the history of the Virgin Islands, a ministry has had two PSs. This is how serious we are about agriculture and fisheries. Because with as big as the ministry is, with just one permanent secretary, Agriculture and fisheries won't get the attention it deserves. So we decided we're going to put a, a, a PS on agriculture and fisheries alone. We also um, gave that PS ecclesiastical affairs because that's another area that has been neglected over the years. So we put a PS on agriculture and fisheries, and that's made a tremendous difference. And I want to acknowledge the PS, um, Mrs. Carolyn Stout-Igwe, 
who's she has the energy and the push and the drive to get these things done. And I want to acknowledge the Assistant Secretary, Mrs. Tetsa Smith Claxton, who really, really solid on the policy, on the policy side. And the Director of Agriculture and Fisheries, uh, Mr. Theodore James, who is trained, he went to school for agriculture, of course, a public servant. He was, uh, I believe, the um, protocol officer before. Um, uh, ambitious young man, intelligent, and I, I believe the right person to lead this now agricultural and fisheries authority. And I want to thank them and the rest of the ministry, Ms. Janelle Hodge and others who have done lots of work on this bill. Minister Vincent Wheatley said, complex problems deserve complex solutions. Some persons say, man, just get the, the, the farmers water, and that's it. You'll fix everything if you just give them some water. And we have to be a little bit more sophisticated than that, Mr. Speaker. I have a plot of land in Parakeeta Bay. And after returning from, from um, England, where I was doing my PhD, I came back and I decided I wanted to do some farming. I had a group of farmers farming with me down in Parakeeta Bay. And I quickly realized water was a problem, but it's much more problems than just water. Much more problems than just water. Um, here we really need a, a body that will be the driver of development for agriculture and fisheries, a larger body. Persons on their own will only be able to satisfy a certain amount of production. So we have an agriculture and fisheries authority that will be the unifying force for the industry and will be able to drive growth and production by making more land available. You need land to be able to farm. You need land. And even though we don't have lots of flat land, if you're creative enough and we have enough will, we'll create areas to farm. And, and the areas where we do have flat land, we have to better utilize. Places like Parakeeta Bay, but we have to uh, um, identify land Elsewhere, like in Anigara, I was in Anigara over the weekend, and Anigara is really a gem. And so much can happen in Anigara. We identified how many acres was it, Minister? About 10 acres, right? Well, it's 40 acres, but we started with a, 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 a certain amount. But we have 40 acres um, that we're about to really get moving with some. Um, production. Um, in Virgin Gorda, uh, we have our substation. We just um, built basically the foundation uh, for the trailers. We lifted the trailers up on the little columns. And um, by the time we have the agricultural exhibition, the Virgin Gorda substation will be ready to go. But we working with the Minister for Lands, we're going to be identifying land on all the different islands for agricultural purposes because we need, we need land. And we need to ensure that we have legal instruments, leases, to ensure that the land is being properly utilized because th those are one of the, the things that we notice. You give persons land and they're misusing the land. So, so how, how do you control that? And we need better regulation. And we spoke about persons mentioned Parakeeta Bay, where you have persons just occupying the land. So that's why we, we came up with a, a management committee led by Dr. Hal and Vanterpool, who is excellent, by the way. And we have some excellent persons on that committee to help sort out some of the land issues in places like Parakeeta Bay. And that will be replicated in other places in fact, I should say about the bill that we have here, we got some good feedback from the public to say that in this bill, you need to be able to create committees to be able to assist with the functions of the management unit. Uh, we got that good feedback from very passionate young man in Virgin Gorda. 
uh, Mr. Janai Koff, who gave excellent feedback on the bill. I want to thank Janai for that input. And not to say no one else gave good, good input. We got good input from Annie Garda, Jasmine Dyke, right in into Atola. But we need to be able to better manage our lands. And I, I wasn't going to address this here, but since I'm on this particular topic of Crown lands, um, just to answer um, the query by the leader of the opposition, this authority, um, the, the government or the Crown, will turn over lands to the authority in a similar way where you turn over lands to the college or turn over lands to the port authority. Those lands will be turned over to the authority um, for, for the authority's management. And, um, and of course, I, I have to acknowledge the Minister of Transportation, who has done a lot of, of work with us trying to get uh, water to the farmers, particularly at Parakita Bay, but we are coming with a, a, a water policy so we can have something that will guide us in terms of how we deal with farmers across the Virgin Islands, not just in Parakita Bay. Whether we're going to have subsidized water or whether water is going to be free, we're going to come up with a policy and see what's really something that's sustainable, something that's fair. And of course, being able to establish authority that is agile enough and nimble enough and has a certain level of autonomy from central government to be able to make quick transactions. You know, they'll have their own accounting system. They'll be able to receive, um, they'll be able to receive the monies from the licenses as opposed to go, those going into the consolidated fund. You'll get the money from the licenses, from the leases. You know, if, if the, the authority is managing any complexes, you get the money from those complexes. And of course, the authority will not be able to survive without a subvention from government. Um, the leader of the opposition spoke about uh, it's a regulatory authority. Well, regulatory authorities can make money because, of course, they you know, through licenses, through fines, through things like that. Those regulatory in instruments, a lot of times, are, cost money. Um, but that won't be enough to run the authority. So we'll need the government's subvention. Right now, the government gives the department probably about $2 million. Uh, that will pay staff, that will operate the department. And of course, we're relying on um, the money that we're going to be getting from these licenses and these leases. As well as uh, Minister of Transportation mentioned it, the money we have from this money services fund. And this money services fund, by my estimation, I don't want to give any wrong information. I didn't get the updated information. But this money services money, I think for, for about a year, it probably makes about $2 million for the 7% um, on the, on the um, money services. Yeah, on the money services transaction, it probably makes about, about $2 million. So that means for each of the five areas, every year is probably about $400,000. You know, and, and, and we did this in 2020. We did this in 2020. So by my estimation, we should have well over $2 million or close to $3 million if you combine agriculture and fisheries. You should have about close to $3 million, $3 million if you combine agriculture and fisheries. And that's significant. That can help us do some of the things that we need to do. We're going to be building this complex in Parakeeta Bay that will allow us to store the produce that we buy from farmers and buy from the fishers. We're doing something um, creative, innovative. In the same way, the fisheries complex bought fish from the fishermen. We're going to extend that to agricultural produce and livestock. We'll buy them from the farmers once 
they abide by our, our standards. And we'll use money as well to build a fish landing site, a little fish house there in Bargas Bay in the 6th District, where so many fantastic things are happening with the greener pastures. But the, um, the Omaha Fisherman's Wharf, uh, we'll put up a fish house there where they'll be able to have their ice. You'll be able to get ice. The fishermen will be able to get ice and they'll be able to land their catch. And they'll be able to get a little voucher and go to the accounts department and get paid. Those are the type of things that you can do with a statutory authority as opposed to with central government. My colleagues also spoke about the use of technology, um, hydroponics, etc. All the different technologies we can use, container farming, etc. Um, the authority will fully utilize those um, to assist with projects and also to bring in materials and provide to farmers and fishers at cost. We also spoke about the need for conservation and the protection of marine resources. And as I said, when you read the bill, you'll, you'll notice it says a lot, the Minister for the Environment or the Minister for Natural Resources. That's mentioned in the bill quite a bit because this bill is very heavy on, as, as, as the leader of opposition said, regulating, regulating for conservation purposes. And the leader of opposition spoke about quotas. That's in the bill. The bill gives you the ability to, to have closed seasons, um, to put moratoriums on any species, to limit any species. Um, the minister has all the authority to, to do all of those things. Um, as it pertains to the protection of marine resources. We spoke a lot about the fish traps. Um, we gave a very good suggestion about making sure you have some kind of GPS uh, system to track the fish traps. That's not in the legislation right now. And I think we can look to that in the committee stage. And that may be something that you put in the regulations as opposed to the principal act. And you have um, we had comments about the ghost traps um, that get away and damage the coral reefs and become almost killing machines for the marine life. And just so persons know, currently in our fisheries regulations, the panels for the fish traps um, um, is mandated that they be made from biodegradable material. Okay, currently that's what the law says. Now, whether that's being enforced or not is the question. Yeah, but it's supposed, the panels for the fish traps are supposed to be made from biodegradable so that the fish will be able to escape after some time. And the need to manage the fishery. Uh, different persons mentioned the need to manage the fishery for sustainability, of course, so that the fishery can be available for generations to come. Um, the data that's needed, uh, when fishermen or fisher folk fish, they're supposed to submit the data of their catch. Um, of course, the fishing licenses are supposed to be able to dictate um, what they can catch from what they can't catch. And it's interesting the leader of opposition spoke about establishing data management because presently um, the United Kingdom Center for the Environment, uh, Fisheries and Aquaculture, is that the name of it, Minister Wheatley? CFAS, Center for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science, I believe it is. Um, they are presently in the Virgin Islands doing a study on data management of the fishery. And that's something that we have a keen interest in because, of course, this bill, when you look at the principles as it pertains to the fisheries, they have principles in the bill. 
And the, and the bill says that when you don't have data, you have to take a precautionary approach um, to the fishing industry, to the exploitation of fisheries resources. You have to take a precautionary approach when you don't have the data. When you do have the data, then you can, without a shadow of a doubt, say, well, this particular species we don't have a problem with, so there's no need to limit this particular species. But this particular species, we need to have a morator moratorium on. In terms of security, um, a number of different persons spoke about the problem of illegal fishing and securing our marine borders. That's a challenge um, that we have to solve through enforcement because the laws are there to prevent it, but we need enforcement. And um, we're we in conversations with the Virgin Islands Shipping Registry because, of course, as mandated by international marine law, we have to be able to secure our econom exclusive economic um, fishing zone or, or exclusive economic zone. And part of the way that you can do that is through some type of coast guard. And that's something, of course, that we have discussed. And of course, these discussions about securing our marine borders have even come up in the National Security Council. So it's something that's on our, our radar. And also the Territorial Security, I think it's Action Group. <laughs> Um, persons mentioned food security as a real concern, especially with the war. Um, the rising food costs, rising shipping costs, etc. So the real challenge of creating food security, I think this um, places more urgency on some of the things that the authority was formed to do, really to get um, production up and running. Persons mentioned the need for stronger programs in the schools. Quite a number of the schools, most of the schools have school gardens. Some of them doing quite well. But in addition to the school gardens, and of course on the high school level, we do have um, agriculture as a, I believe, CXC course. And persons can take agriculture at the secondary school. But I believe we still need to do more. And this is something I want to work with the management unit in the ministry as well as the authority on um, ensuring that we have stronger school programs but that's part of the reason that we brought back the agriculture and um, fisheries exhibition because that exhibition was a great time for young persons to go to Parakeeta bay and to other areas on the different sister islands and experience um, farming and fishing you go and you try to catch the grease pig. Those are all things which are creative ways of sensitizing young people to the industry of farming. And as co of course, we added fishing to it as well. And I have to say the leader of the opposition, I'm in full support of Fisherman's Day returning. Last year, I know we had great plans for the Obel Penn fishing tournament. Um, I sponsored trophies for that, but unfortunately, because of COVID, it was not able to move forward. And leader of opposition, I, I want to be a partner in making sure that that happens this year. And those type of things are important. Of, uh, um, Fisherman's Day, which is traditionally on July 1st, or, or that, that Monday, that first Monday in July. Um, it was mentioned about doing niche farming. And of course, we want to grow as much of, as what we can eat, but of course, there will be some certain things that will make more sense to grow more than others. And we should start there. We also spoke about regional partnerships. Um, I have to say that I was recently at a CARICOM Heads of Government meeting, and there was a great deal of focus on food security um, Guyana as a country was taking the lead, and, and the plan is to reduce our import, imports by 25% by the year 2025. Reduce imports by 
by the year 2025. And I think it's entirely possible, but we have to get the private sector involved. We have to get those persons who have resources, who have money. I think this is why KNK did well. You know, they had the resources to be able to invest in a large facility that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. It wasn't no small investment uh, to build in Parakeeta Bay, expanding the operation from Josiah's Bay. And we have to be able to provide more land to more persons who can do massive operations, much larger operations, who will make good use of the land and increase uh, production. And I just want to say how um, proud I am of Brother Pickering with KNK. Um, I remember when uh, we first discussed about him going into chicken farming. I was with the People's Patriotic Alliance at that time, the PPA, a leader of the opposition. Remember those days because that's uh, we had a group um, before that called the PPM, People's Progressive Movement, with a number of us: Broderick Pren, Shana Smith, Troy Christopher. Um, leader of the opposition here, lots of very progressive persons in the pro People's Progressive uh, Movement. Around that time, we formed the People's Patriotic Alliance. And I used to campaign on, on poultry. I used to campaign on the fact that we could feed ourselves with poultry. I remember at that time, Mr. Pickering and myself spoke about the possibility of going into poultry. He's, he was quite interested in it. And when I see he went forward in it, he went forward with it seriously. And I would say that he's done very well. And I think other persons should look to agriculture because some persons make it seem like you can't make money with agriculture, but yet we always have to eat. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about other people, but I can't go a day without eating. I might understand people fasting and whatnot. I understand that concept, but the whole day without food, you got to eat to survive. You have to eat to survive. So I don't know how growing food can be a bad investment, but you have to do it efficiently and you have to do it effectively. If you do it properly, you should be able to make money. And the land just gives you. The land just gives you what it has. You know, and as long as you treat the land right, you, you, you do your mixed crops so you don't exhaust the land, you know, and you make sure your land is well fertilized, that land should give you yield for generations and generations. I don't know how it can be a bad investment to plant food. And then with the rising prices, it's going to become even more competitive for us to plant food. So we've, we've discussed on a regional level about farming in a much better way. And in CARICOM, they're making land available in places that have vast tracts of land like Belize and Suriname and Guyana, they're saying they'll invite anybody from the region who wants to invest in agriculture and you'll be able to get land in these countries to be able to farm. And then of course we can encourage our shippers to go down the chain of islands and engage in trade with all the different islands because of course we have uh, islands up and down the chain and all of them you know, can benefit from some kind of importation. All of them import food from the United States, from Miami. So when we properly exploit our fisheries resource, we can send fish down on these boats and then the boats can bring back up things as well. And then you have the Dominican Republic. I went to the Dominican Republic. I never seen so much food in my life. That's the first time I see pineapples stacked to the sky. 
pineapples just up in a plant in just food. And it's more likely, it's more likely that food would leave the Dominican Republic and go to Miami and then come back to the BVI. Then coming straight across from the Dominican Republic to the BVI. And it just shows you, once you establish trade among your regional partners, it will have a, a, a much better benefit for you. The United States, they do produce food, but when you buy food from the United States, you're really buying food from Central America, Latin America. You're buying food from all over the world. The uh, United States is just a middleman in some instances. Yes, some, certain places, they, they do grow things in the United States, but they import quite a lot of food. So, Mr. Speaker, I have so much more to say, but I, I think I, I need to allow us to get into the committee stage. Just to say, Mr. Speaker, it's important to know that after we pass this act, we will have to pass regulations. Because some of what we've discussed today in terms of the suggestions we are making, those suggestions must be made in, in regulations. And I also have to acknowledge the fact that a number of members spoke about aspects of the legislation that um, we, can, we, we should consider changing. Um, spare fishing, that was mentioned. We're gonna have to take a strong look at spare fishing in the legislation as, as members have spoken about that. Members have also spoken about uh, the licensing regime the portability, as the leader of the opposition called it, uh, whether a license will allow you to be able to get on you know, other vessels besides your fishing vessel. Let's say your fishing vessel um, is down for whatever purpose and whatever reason. You still having the ability to be able to, to go out and fish without being penalized, okay? And that's something we have to take a look at because at all the meetings we had, the fishermen brought it up. And they were very passionate about it. And I, I won't be the minister to ignore the cries of the people or to consult them and then ignore their cries. So it's something that we're gonna have to look at in this legislation. And we have persons in the room intelligent enough to come up with something that works, that we can protect and conserve our fisheries resource, but we should also help to facilitate the fishermen having an easier time um, in terms of making their business work. Um, I think that's about it, Mr. Speaker. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, uh, one thing I'll address before I close, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition did make a point about the relationship with the management unit and the authority. Again, we had some good feedback while we were in Virgin Guarda about that. And that's something that we have looked at in the, in the legislation and we have some suggestions in terms of how we deal with that in the committee stage. In terms of the independence of the authority, persons should know that the authority will be governed by a board. There will be a board. And of course, with these boards, we know that these statutory authorities are semi-autonomous. You know, the authority is accountable to the board. And of course, the minister appoints some members of the board. We can look at that in the legislation in terms of who is appointed. Um, but of course, because the authority is receiving money from government, a subvention, and they're using government resources like land, there has to be some level of accountability between the authority and central government. Um, but I'm not a micromanager, uh, Mr. Speaker. I put persons, I appoint persons who I know are capable of doing their work, um, and I, I let them do their work, and of course, 
It's their job to, to implement the policy direction of the sitting government, whatever government that may be. Um, they're not an a entity unto their own selves. Um, they have to be accountable ultimately to the people of the Virgin Islands who elect persons every four years to carry out the people's mandate. So the statutory authority, while um, being very business focused and results focused, also will be guided by the policy. And, and the legislation, the legislation mandates a policy every five years. So it's not, obviously um, there will be input from the technocrats, input from the people, input from different stakeholders. So it's not just a policy determined by the sitting government, but any um, government that's responsive to the needs of the people will have to consult uh, stakeholders across the Virgin Islands. So Mr. Speaker, I think that uh, we're going to have a big job in committee stage. Uh, we're going to have to go through it very carefully uh, because, of course, we do not want to get these things wrong. It's been quite some time uh, since we made changes to our legislation. The Fisheries Act, for instance, is somewhere around 25 years old. It's no guarantee that we're going to go back and amend the legislation anytime soon. So we have to go through it carefully and make sure that we get it absolutely right. I thank my colleagues uh, for the debate. I thank my colleagues for support. And I'm looking forward to going through this bill in committee stage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honorable Deputy Premier, the move of the bill entitled Virgin Islands Food Security and Sustainability Act 2022. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled Virgin Islands Food Security and Sustainability Act 2022 be now read a second time. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. I call upon the clerk to read the bill for a second time. This act may be cited as the Virgin Islands Food Security and Sustainability Act 2022 and shall come into force on such date as the minister may by notice published in the Gazette appoint. Thank you. Pursuant to standing order 55-1 of the House of Assembly of the Virgin Islands, the bill now stands committed to a committee of the whole house to consider it clause by clause. This honorable house is now in committee. <laughs> 